How big can a person be that they cannot move around the world without the help of someone? When he stepped on the ground, the whole village thought an earthquake had started. No one could understand what was happening. But it was just Master Chu training because he had a goal to lose weight as quickly as possible as he was awaiting a great contest with the enemy. However, even a mosquito's touch was enough for him to fall. He was so clumsy and there was no talk of any fight. While walking, he dislocated his shoulder. His multi-ton body began to fall to the ground, so much so that in neighboring houses, plates on the tables shook. Clothes didn't last long on him because no master could create such a dense material that could withstand the pressure of his body. He fell to the floor and severely injured his hand. But has it always been like this? What needs to be done to bring one's body to such a state? Actually, no. It all started many years ago. When gods attacked the great village, they began to do whatever they pleased, including burning houses. No one could resist their power, so everyone had to just run, leaving their homes to save their lives. There was no other choice. It was on that day that his parents died in this unfair fight. His house was destroyed, and he became an orphan. But now he has returned to the past to confront the evil gods and deal with all this. But he has ended up in the body of this fat man and needs to deal with this problem. He has only six months to save the village and overcome all enemies who want to harm his village. He first needs to get to the great root of ginseng because if the gods capture it faster, all his training and preparation will be completely meaningless. But damn, it will take at least 16 months to get this body in shape. He simply doesn't have that much time. He needs to figure something out. The father starts yelling at the witch doctor and tells him that he promised that his son would be fine and that he isn't doing anything to save him. But then Chu stands up and says he needs to go for a walk, otherwise it will take him a long time to get in shape. The father immediately ordered the palace's strongest slaves to come and help Chu get some fresh air. But Chu refused the help. He doesn't want to be carried again, as this way he definitely won't lose the extra weight, so he decided to stand up on his own. The assistant grabbed him under the arms and began to help him walk. It was very hard for him, because Chu is not at all light. There he is, taking his first steps. His father watches and memories flood back of him, taking his own first steps as a child. And now, after many years, he's walking again. The courtiers watch in astonishment, wondering how Chu spent so many years just lying and sitting, with everything brought to him, and now he walks on his own. Training begins, and the coach shouts that if he wants to lose weight, he must cut all sugar from his diet, or it will be futile. But first, a control weighing is needed. Chu sits on the scales, and in counterweight, they load a lot of pigs. However, the rope that should withstand several tons just snaps, and Chu doesn't move an inch. Chu realizes that he can't go on like this, and that achieving the ideal body will take him a very long time, and he needs to find another way to lose weight. If he doesn't find it within six months, the gods will again wreak havoc throughout the village, but what to do? Or perhaps it's worth considering an alternative way to solve the problem. Will such an option even be possible, or will something need to be done, or is there a way out? Of course, if he reaches the great city before the gods and gets the ginseng root, they won't have enough power to burn the entire city. This thought makes Chu smile. It's the solution to his problem, the way to resolve everything quickly. His laughter begins to fill the palace rooms. The assistant doesn't understand why he's laughing and thinks he's gone mad. So he quickly runs to the palace to call the witch doctor before it's too late, as it seems the training is adversely affecting his health. The great witch doctor Ling rushes in. At 20, he began serving at court while his peers were finishing exams. And at 50, he started teaching his medicine, which was very successful. He must know a quick way to lose weight. As soon as Ling approaches Chu, he asks if there's a way for him to lose weight quickly, as he doesn't have much time to wait. Long workouts and proper nutrition aren't what he needs right now. He needs some potion that will solve his problem. The witch doctor says there isn't such a remedy, but one can harness the power of water. Of course, thought Chu. As they walked to the lake, the helpers were already exhausted. They hadn't expected Chu to want to go to the lake so quickly. Why did he even want to lose weight? Chu started entering the water. How could he have forgotten the great property of water? Buoyancy. In the water, he found it relatively easy to move, so he decided to venture further. Advancing forward, Chu suddenly stumbled. The ground dropped sharply, causing him to sink. With a splash, Chu's gigantic body submerged. He didn't even have time to blink. On the surface, only ripples marked where someone had just been. 
The servant of the young lord, thinking Chu was merely playing, smiled at Chu's playfulness. Who would have thought he'd enjoy swimming so much? Meanwhile, Chu was sinking deeper and deeper where the water's blue only darkened. Panic overcame him. Then it dawned on one of the servants. What if there was a drop-off underwater and the young master was drowning? Panic engulfed the servant who realized the gravity of the situation. Losing their lord in such a foolish manner was unthinkable. Chu was gradually losing consciousness due to a lack of oxygen. Everything before his eyes blurred and darkened. An image of a cart drawn by two horses speeding through a forest appeared before Chu's eyes. It bore marks from arrow strikes. He watched the events like a ghost. A woman holding a baby wrapped in a shroud looked at the child with sadness in her eyes. She was clearly severely wounded and fading rapidly. An unknown girl suddenly surfaced with Chu, who was unconscious. Dragging him to the shore, she dropped his body with a deafening thud. The servants immediately began to resuscitate their young lord. Two culprits knelt down and looked at Chu's father with terror. He was clearly enraged and extremely upset about what had happened. It seemed as if his aura had taken the form of fire, surrounding him in a furious flow ready to incinerate those who had provoked his wrath. Huang, unable to bear the pressure, blurted out that it was the imperial doctor's idea, betraying him entirely. Chu's father grew even more enraged and, drawing his sword, lunged at the doctor. However, he was restrained before he could exact revenge. Before the situation could escalate further, a girl entered and drew everyone's attention with her voice. Unexpectedly, she became the voice of reason and suggested the healer explain his actions and justify his viewpoint. Without hesitation, he stated that the young lord had a strong desire to lose weight, and therefore he had suggested this method. Hearing this, Chu's father regained his composure, having completely forgotten his son's feelings. In the ensuing silence, the voice of the girl who had proposed letting the young lord swim unexpectedly sounded, suggesting that swimming could be done not just in a stream. Chu lay reflecting on how he nearly drowned in the stream, which wasn't even the sea. Then two girls entered his chamber, the one who had recently saved him from drowning and the one who had suggested his training, the sister of his current body. They had come to invite him along. Looking at the girl's face, Chu couldn't understand why she was so beautiful, unable to believe she could be related to his current body. The maid of his sister approached Chu, wanting to help him get up and finally set out. Chu didn't believe she could manage and even tried to dissuade her, recalling that previously it took four strong men to lift him, and even they struggled. Surprisingly, she effortlessly helped him to his feet. As he settled into the palanquin, Chu couldn't understand why the bearers seemed in such good spirits. They didn't seem to find carrying him burdensome. He pondered and pondered. These guys clearly weren't ordinary, considering how easily and naturally they carried him. Chu was presented with a sight that greatly surprised him, people sweating as they dug a hole, lining the walls with stones. Drawing closer and inspecting the excavation site, he couldn't understand what it was. Were they digging a grave? Clarity was brought by his sister, explaining that he no longer had to go to the stream since he now had his very own pond. The workers, seeing Chu, rushed to greet him. Their faces were lit with smiles. They were very kind and friendly. The young lord couldn't comprehend why they were so joyful considering the old tyrant had exploited them. Shouldn't they be hostile towards his son? However, the people were delighted to see him, and smiles never left their faces. Huang then approached Chu, who immediately inquired about the ongoing activities. In response, Huang explained that his father was a symbol of conscientiousness, always sharing food and water with the peasants and ensuring their well-being. Chu pondered everything he had heard and seen, after all, piecing together all the facts. Observing how Sung never skimped on supplies and was always ready to help the workers, he began to understand. An epiphany struck him. If there's a wealthy person with a good reputation among the people, one whom everyone respects, and he's that man's son, then, after all, for a good life, he really doesn't need to do anything. He already has everything, and only now has he fully realized it. A smoldering splinter measured the time, indicating how long Chu had been underwater. Then Chu's massive body emerged from the water, which, thanks to the artificial pond, no longer sought to sink deep to the bottom. Huang had already prepared a massive steel ball on a chain, meant to assist with the training. After emerging from the water, a weight was fastened to Chu using a steel hoop that wrapped around his ankle. After securing the ball, Huang threw the weight into the water with all his might. 
and Chu followed right behind. The heavy iron core quickly sank to the bottom, dragging Chu with it, securely anchoring him down. Due to his size, Chu couldn't assume the lotus position, so he decided to limit himself to meditating while standing. Focusing, he began to gather spiritual energy, spiraling it and absorbing. In front of Chu, a glowing ball of golden energy formed, which grew and was absorbed with each moment, making the glow increasingly intense. Having gathered the necessary amount of energy, he opened his eyes, achieving maximum concentration, preparing for the next stage. A smile crept onto Chu's lips. He managed to absorb spiritual energy and direct it to his heart, which in turn began to distribute it throughout his body. Feeling the power of spiritual energy again, he could now determine the currents of the water surrounding him. Gradually, he began to swirl it around himself, forming small whirlpools. Confident in his strength, Chu decided to test himself in one of the techniques. Thrusting his foot forward and firmly planting it on the bottom, he prepared. The first most powerful Shaolin technique, capable of shattering rocks from a hundred meters away. Having completed his preparations, Chu swiftly extended his arm in a strike. Continuing his training, Chu moved as if dancing, smoothly transitioning from one pose to another. Sharp hand swings were like sword strikes, cutting through the water, passing through it without even noticing. Chu executed lightning-fast lunges, another technique, the celestial sword of Kalen Namgun. Huang sat on the shore, amazed at how long the young lord held his breath underwater. Did a talent awaken in him after he nearly drowned? He has already been training for a whole month. Chu emerged from the water with a smile, completely satisfied with himself. And without even catching his breath, he called for Huang. Returning home, a very important moment for Chu arrived. The moment to measure his weight. Huang prepared the scales, and after some hesitation, Chu decided to step onto the weighing platform. To his surprise, his efforts had not been in vain. The scales' pointer indicated a much lower value than during his initial weighing. Uncontrollable joy overcame both Chu and Huang, who was also happy for his young master. Unable to contain his emotions, Chu hugged Huang, thanking him. Without his support, Chu wouldn't have achieved so much in such a short time. Calming down, Huang began to talk about how wonderful it was that the servants no longer had to mend clothes that constantly tore, that the palanquin bearers would have an easier time, and that rumors had it Chu was refused marriage because he was too fat. The last point was unnecessary. That was the last straw. Chu genuinely flared up. Huang clearly couldn't sense the atmosphere and didn't know when to stop. But what Huang truly understood was that he should save himself by fleeing. So he hurriedly went about his business. Chu sat down to ponder. After all, he had gained spiritual energy and lost a lot of weight. But this was just the beginning. Spiritual energy is something people acquire through numerous trainings, but this path can be shortened by consuming spiritual plants, which, of course, will reduce potential. That's why Chu needed virgin ginseng. Chu's thoughts were interrupted by the physician, who brought a beneficial medicinal decoction meant to restore strength. Taking it in his hands, practically snatching it from the doctor, Chu immediately drank the entire decoction. As it's known, medicines usually taste bitter. Chu realized this too late and was left with no choice but to discontentedly toss away the bowl. Entering the house, he began to meditate to gather and restore spiritual energy. Taking deep breaths, Chu literally absorbed energy with the air. Drop by drop, Chu absorbed the spiritual power. Soon he would be able to confront that demon. After meditating, Chu once again consumed the medicinal decoction, greatly surprising Huang, who knew the taste of this brew. He also decided to diversify his training, so now Chu would walk up the mountain. Two months later, Chu stood underwater, continuing his grueling training, concentrating spiritual power. He moved on to more complex techniques. By gathering energy and releasing it with a sharp push of his open palm, Chu created a powerful water current. At the same time, a large wave rose on the surface from the impact. Huang, seeing this, couldn't believe his eyes. He couldn't accept that this arrogant pig could use the palm technique. He pondered this aloud, oblivious to his surroundings. Unfortunately, Huang got too carried away and didn't notice Chu's father behind him, who was clearly not pleased to hear such things about his son. Taking the chief steward's sword, he contemplated cutting the audacious man to pieces. But he was prevented from doing so when the chief steward intervened. 
Ordering the servants to drag Huang to the dungeon, he saved his skin from the family patriarch's wrath. Huang's face, dragged across the ground like a sack of potatoes, expressed immense gratitude. In his thoughts, he thanked the steward for such mercy. Chu's father, having forgotten the recent misunderstanding, was literally radiant with joy. His son had just practiced martial arts. Deciding to support his son's endeavors, he commanded the steward to bring paper, ink, and a brush, intending to write a letter. Later, when gathered at the estate, Chu was presented with a book of martial arts which would now serve his training. He was handed the technique of the divine sky. Not exactly a thick book on martial arts study. Chu's father was very pleased with himself, sharing that it was a secret technique from the imperial palace, astonishing Chu with such influence. Moreover, claiming that he only wrote to the emperor once and received an immediate response, in reality, he wrote letters every day. At some point, he even lost faith that the emperor would reply. In the courtyard, Chu was introduced to his new teacher, his sister's husband, who surprisingly turned out to be knowledgeable in martial arts. His name was Chun. He had a rather handsome face and did not give the impression of an experienced fighter. Chu's father began to praise Chun, as he belonged to one of the best combat clans, thereby flattery his ego. It seemed his pride would soon pierce the heavens. Chu only thought about how the former head of this clan would have begged him for training on his knees. Maybe it was worth telling them the truth. But imagining what would happen to his new father, he decided to wait. Then an idea struck him. To legitimize his skills, if he claims he trained under the head of the Dan clan, there shouldn't be any problems. And he would attribute all his techniques to the Divine Sky book gifted by the Emperor. It would be difficult to verify. Having made up his mind, Chu fell to his knees before Chun, asking to be accepted as a disciple before the master. This deeply moved his father, who in his mind praised his son for becoming so respectful. Training went on, and Chu tried to meet all the demands of his new teacher, which was still quite challenging given the state of his body. Taking the first stance as demanded by Chun, he tried to focus but once again lost his balance, barely staying upright. Chun vented tons of frustration on him. How could he not achieve the simplest of tasks? He berated Chu to the point of boiling anger. When Chu suggested trying a different stance, he received even more negativity, words about his incompetence and immaturity. This was the last straw for Chu. He wasn't going to tolerate such treatment, especially since he was just playing along, not showing clear progress to avoid suspicion. Standing straight and looking at the flustered Chun, he decided to set things straight, proposing to test his skills in a duel. Chu's laughter even shocked the birds flying over the estate. How could some novice challenge him? Chu, clearly mocking and picking his nose, suggested that Chun was scared and simply afraid to fight him. This hit a nerve in Chun. Responding to Chu's dare, he started threatening that he used to be part of the dragon family. But Chu's further provocations forced him to agree to a sparring match. In his anger, he no longer cared who was challenging him. However, Chun stated he didn't intend to fight at full strength, as it wouldn't be fair. So he blocked his spiritual channels with a thumb strike at the base of his neck, also tying his right arm to his torso. Once prepared, Chun shouted that he was ready and even gave Chu the right to strike first. Chu didn't mind and began concentrating energy for his strike. With a swift move, he lunged at Chun, gaining speed with every step which greatly surprised his overconfident opponent. Reaching striking distance, Chu swung his right hand, preparing a devastating uppercut. Shooting upwards like a spring, he directed his fist towards the opponent's chin, but Chun dodged, amazed by such agility. Despite his agility issues due to his body's condition, Chu continued his attacking combination, approaching from the right side, precisely where Chun's arm was immobilized. He delivered a powerful blow to the side, which Chun couldn't evade. But Chu didn't stop there, concluding his attack with a swift backhand strike. Having knocked Chun to the ground, Chu thought he hadn't taught the braggart enough of a lesson. So, looming over him, he prepared to pound him into the dirt. Chun couldn't believe his eyes, exclaiming it was impossible, to which Chu merely squinted and retorted that, after all, he was his student. Meanwhile, Huan was guarding the gates, nose in the air. This was both a command and a punishment for him, to stand there without proper rest. Chu approached and, calling out to Huan, asked if he was satisfied with his demotion and if it wasn't too easy for him to serve. 
given that he managed to doze off while on post. Juan was at a loss for words, merely inquiring why the young master wasn't training. To which the obvious answer was given. The teacher was currently not in a condition to train. The teacher himself was lying down, all bandaged up, with his wife and Chu's sister beside him. He complained about the pain and itching, but she was delighted to find that her brother was so talented. Telling Chun to rest and that he'd certainly feel better, she decided to leave him alone. A carriage pulled by horses approached the city entrance. Inside, in a dim setting, sat a man who made no sound. But it turned out he wasn't alone. His companion, upon the carriage's arrival at the destination, mentioned seeing no point in personal participation. However, the other was resolute in his desire to visit the clan. He instructed the carriage drivers to take them to the designated address. Meanwhile, Chu was strolling around the city, observing the surroundings. He was interested in the world before the arrival of chaos. Suddenly, he noticed a group of men discussing something around one of the market stalls. Witnessing such a peaceful and quiet life, Chu was lost in memories of when the agents of chaos descended upon the world. His gaze became distant, seeing nothing in front of him but those events. When they appeared and conquered the whole world, darkness engulfed light and joy, leaving no place for rest on earth. However, his reflections were interrupted by the townspeople who saw the young master. Joy was evident on their faces. He was surrounded and examined from all angles, as if he were some exotic animal. People were amazed that he could walk on his own. Some didn't even know he was capable of it. A young woman decided to offer him spit-roasted meat as a gift. Considering Chu's recent weight loss and diet, the offer was very tempting. Seeing this, all the villagers decided to present gifts to the young master, each bringing whatever they could. Witnessing such treatment, a pang of guilt hit Chu, feeling he shouldn't just accept everything and live this way. Suddenly, he felt a piercing gaze on him, but after scanning the surroundings, he noticed no one. Perhaps it was just his imagination, he thought. However, lurking around the corner was a man dressed in dark clothes and a broad-brimmed straw hat. He couldn't have noticed me, the man thought, preparing to leave. But Chu's hand landed on his shoulder, wanting to inquire about his business there. The stranger reacted swiftly and aggressively, taking a swing at Chu. The strike was powerful and fast. Chu, unprepared, didn't have time to react. Chu's body was flung across the street as if shot from a cannon, only stopping when it crashed into a house's wall. As the dust settled, the townspeople saw their young master lying unconscious amidst the rubble. The assailant made a hasty escape, leaping onto rooftops and running away, with shouts from the crowd urging his capture. When Chu regained consciousness, he was furious, ready to tear his attacker apart with his bare hands. The townspeople were bewildered unsure how to respond to the assault and their lord's behavior. Composing himself and noticing the concerned looks, Chu reassured them he was all right and decided to leave the scene, contemplating the need to enhance his combat skills. Back at Chu's residence, his father was conversing with Chu's sister. He was very pleased with his son's progress, envisioning a grand future for him and already considering where to place him. However, Chu's sister was more reserved requesting their father not to be too loud, as it was too early for such discussions. Words about the Namugan clan, whose heiress Chu was supposed to marry, disheartened him. Hai Namugan had no desire to marry since childhood, aspiring to become a martial arts master, owing nothing to anyone. Noticing the man's state, she understood that it wasn't because of Hai. It was about the cause of his wife's death. Enemies had pursued him, but they killed her instead, and he had been blaming himself ever since. After all, it should have been him who died in her place. A horse-drawn carriage with four horses maintained its course, and inside, two continued their conversation. The Namagon clan members suspected the discussion would again revolve around marriage. There were unpleasant rumors about Chu regarding his laziness, weight, and lack of character. Yet they continued on their path. One of the men pointed somewhere. They had to find out everything about Chu. Only then could they rid themselves of him forever. Chu sneezed. Someone must be talking about him. He assumed someone was admiring him behind his back. Stepping into an alley, Chu couldn't find anyone. The street was eerily empty, which was strange for this place. He decided to check everywhere, even peering onto rooftops, but it was vacant everywhere. Chu couldn't understand where everyone had vanished. Suddenly, a man with a broom peeked around the corner, immediately asking what the young lord was doing here. 
Chu inquired about the whereabouts of the poor, since they were always abundant here. The baffled man replied that Chu's father had built houses and provided lands for cultivation for the poor twenty years ago. Then Chu recalled someone once mentioning that walls have ears, or more precisely, the poor. Those who are often overlooked and from whom one can learn a lot, the destitute hide in the shadows of walls, in every alley and nook. Those who have their network of informers, those who have filled the world, are called the clan of the poor. And then Chu realized that if there were no beggars around now, there might not be a clan as such either. And there's no one to gather information from. At a table sat a man, one of those who had come here in the carriage. He was the head of the Namugan clan. Opposite him, sipping tea, was a man of unimpressive appearance, starkly contrasting with him. Instead of the clan patriarch, the shabby-looking man began to speak. He assumed they needed information about Chu to end the marriage attempts and get rid of him once and for all. Just as one would expect from the clan of the poor, the patriarch thought. However, the member of the clan of the poor said he couldn't provide such information, clearly haggling, though he didn't admit it. The second man couldn't understand why one would hide information about an educated man's son, and furthermore, a chief. But he was silenced with a wave of the patriarch's hand. It's about the Yu family, the informant confessed. Their elders' rage could harm not just the local branch, but the entire organization. After some thought, the patriarch threw a bag full of silver onto the table, hinting at the seriousness of his intentions. But the informant stood his ground. They needed the chief's permission, otherwise they would refuse to cooperate. Without changing his expression, the patriarch removed a valuable-looking ring from his finger and placed it on the table. The patriarch's son was stunned. Whoever possesses that ring receives full protection from the Namugan clan. Such items aren't just given away. Chu approached a house that looked affluent, finding it amusing that this was a branch of the clan of the poor. Its appearance didn't match the name at all. No wonder he had taken so long to find it. Just as Chu was about to enter, a sheathed sword was pointed at his neck. The guard, calling him a fatso, refused to let Chu in, saying there were important guests inside. Deciding to ignore the insolent guard, after all, he was now not just any commoner, but the sole heir of the Yu family, Chu moved forward. But after taking just one step, he was hit on the back of the head with the sheath. The guard had clearly crossed a line, and Chu was not going to let such behavior slide. With a bloodthirsty grin, he beckoned the man closer, intending to teach him a lesson. In an unknown room, two men in dark clothes and straw hats reported to their leader. Their attire was reminiscent of the man who had attacked Chu. After hearing the report, the unknown individual made some inferences clear only to him and mused, Siung, I wonder how that old tiger is doing. The informant handed the clan chief the requested information on Chu, everything they could find from the moment of his birth until yesterday. Handing over the notebook, he warned that no one should know about this. Snatching the records from his hands, the man swore on the clan's name that no one would find out. This entire story would remain a secret. The informant, after saying goodbye, hurried away. The patriarch, opening the records and immersing himself in reading, was soon interrupted by shouts from the street. Asking his son to check what was happening, he continued reading. Peering out of the window, the patriarch's son saw Chu standing opposite the guard who had hit him on the head with the sheath, and there was clear tension between them. A bruise was forming on the guard's cheek from a hit, and it wasn't hard to guess that Chu had put in some effort. Despite this, the guard comforted himself with the thought that he hadn't been ready, which is why he missed the hit. Chu continued to agitate him, criticizing every move and technique the man used. His kung fu was clearly inferior to Chu's. The attacker grew angry from the criticism, thinking it was directed at his clan's style. This wasn't the case. He was just clearly undertrained, which Chu promptly pointed out. Chu also suggested that the man simply apologize and he would forgive him. He didn't want to waste his time on such riffraff. This was the last straw for the young man. Breaking from his spot, he lunged in attack, thrusting with his now-drawn blade, furious at the insult to the Namugan clan. Chu effortlessly dodged, somewhat lazily for such a situation, and noting that his opponent had drawn his sword first, 
Chu prepared for a serious skirmish. Dodging below the line of attack and winding up, Chu surged upward, surprising his opponent who wasn't expecting such agility from a chubby guy. A powerful blow hit the young man's torso, lifting him half a meter off the ground and knocking the wind out of him, which certainly didn't enhance his agility. Not stopping there, Chu grabbed the man by the hair and delivered a powerful right hook to his face, further knocking him off balance. This was followed by another kick, this time driving the stranger into the ground and raising a cloud of dust. Lifting him by the collar and clenching his fist, Chu intended to teach the young man some manners, since his clan apparently failed in that task. Meanwhile, a crowd began to gather around. Chu dealt one blow after another to the already battered face of the young man, each punch seemingly instilling manners into the boar. But then he was interrupted by a shout from above, urging him to stop. Glancing up, Chu caught a glimpse of a silhouette rapidly approaching him. After a hard landing, a new figure stood before Chu. Backing away and taking a few steps, Chu created distance from this new opponent. But the man didn't wait and charged after him, swiftly closing the gap and accumulating spiritual energy in his hand. Chu recognized the technique used by the patriarch's son. It was the explosive, lightning-fast, mystical palm. The realization came quickly. In his current state, Chu couldn't beat him. The only option was not to lose. Or there was one other option. Preparing himself, Chu also began concentrating energy into his hand, ready to meet the blow. The opponents were rapidly closing in on each other. Such a strike is hard to block. So Chu planned to redirect the energy and neutralize the impulse. Finally, they clashed in confrontation. Chu, using both hands, grabbed his opponent's fist, trying to dissipate the blow. At that moment, the patriarch decided to step out onto the street to inquire about the noise and happened to witness the moment of the clash. Chu was gradually losing the leading position and was retreating. Flashback. Muscular hands covered in scars held a sword, while the owner of those hands counted the number of strikes he made during training. 29,996. 29,997. The past version of Chu stood balancing on a plank placed on the peak of a sharp stone. With each swing of his sword, water splashed in all directions due to the strong gusts of wind he created. Losing his balance, Chu fell forward and plunged into the water. The structure underneath him was highly unstable. His teacher was displeased. Chu hadn't held his sword long enough, so as punishment, he was assigned an additional 10,000 swings. Night. Two individuals duel in the middle of a field, their sword clanging echoing for tens of meters around. At some point, the battle pauses. The swords clashed again and both opponents tried to overpower each other to gain an advantage. Chu couldn't withstand the pressure and bent under the onslaught, immediately receiving a powerful knee strike to his solar plexus. Falling to the ground and gasping for air, Chu dropped his sword and looked up at his teacher. His mentor was displeased with him. Chu immediately pleaded for mercy, asking his teacher to stop beating him, to spare him, and to allow him a brief respite. His teacher's smile was the only response, but it didn't reflect the true feelings of the mentor. Enraged by his student's attitude towards the weapon in training, the teacher lectured Chu on the fact that a real enemy wouldn't show mercy, and anyone who drops their weapon is unworthy of life. He then wound up his fist to impart this lesson in a more tangible manner. Present day, Chu took the blow and was lifted off the ground, flying backward. The attack was truly powerful, and he couldn't handle it. Chu couldn't understand what had disrupted his concentration. Up until that point, everything had gone according to plan, and he could have stopped the attack, but he failed. The servants immediately rushed to him, recognizing him. His opponent stood pondering. While he couldn't completely neutralize the explosive force of the strike, Chu had managed to significantly dissipate it, and he was unsure how Chu accomplished it. Chu, having taken damage from the strike but not enough to knock him out, began to boil with rage. His veins bulged at his temples and his fury surged. Finally, regaining his composure, Chu became the embodiment of fury, intending to lift and slam the bastard who dared attack him. As he stood surrounded by servants, he tried to bore a hole through his opponent with his gaze, but he suddenly fell backward. By that time, others, including the fair-haired informant, had come out of the building. 
First addressing the patriarch of the clan, the informant quickly noticed someone lying on the ground. It was Chu, who even while lying down radiated streams of fury. The blow clearly hadn't benefited him, so he was recovering in a horizontal position. Upon closer inspection of the one lying on the ground, the informant from the clan of beggars recognized the young lord and immediately rushed to check on him. Asking who dared do such a thing to the young lord, all attention turned to the son of the patriarch and fury was evident in the eyes of the onlookers. The young man realized that all eyes were on him and moreover were not friendly. He looked to his father for support, but found none. Realizing the situation, the patriarch decided that the gathered information on Chu was unnecessary, as it clearly did not reflect the true state of affairs. Taking the records, he decisively tore them up. By that time, Chu's father had arrived and immediately launched a verbal assault on those who had wronged his son. He always knew something like this could happen, and the clan of beggars was involved. Terrifying the fair-haired man, who immediately began to make excuses, he inadvertently implicated the Namgun clan. The head of the Namgun clan tried to defend himself, saying the attack was out of ignorance and his son wasn't to blame, but such arguments didn't sway opinion. Why attack people at all? Chu's father was furious. If it weren't for the fact that the man opposite him was quite influential and could become Chu's brother-in-law in the future, his head would have been taken off long ago. A member of the beggar clan whispered for the man to kneel and apologize, as Chu's father was a highly respected individual, even heeded by the emperor. As Chu's father considered heading to the emperor and informing his future son-in-law about it, it dawned on Namgun that things were dire. This was no joke. Falling to their knees, the two began to apologize over one another, trying to downplay the incident and not exacerbate the situation they found themselves in. Chu's father flared up with anger time and again. His son was nearly dead, and these two kept clinging to his feet. His only son. Suddenly, a door opened and out flew Chu, curious about the commotion outside. He sported a perplexingly new hairstyle. Girls passing by were quite charmed by such a hairstyle. Apparently, one of the maids at the house had taken the opportunity to style it this way while Chu was unconscious. His father, seeing that his son had come to, rushed to ask if he was all right. Meanwhile, the informant from the beggar's clan immediately rushed to Chu with unclear intentions. Upon reaching him, the man started hopping around Chu, overjoyed that the young lord was all right. While simultaneously expressing astonishment at Chu's strength and showering him with compliments, he only irritated Chu. Unexpectedly, Chu bowed deeply to the black-haired man, showing respect as if to an elder brother. After all, they were related, and Chu clearly had something in mind. As he bowed, a sly smile crept across Chu's face. He wouldn't let this go just like that, but everything in due time. Gathering himself, Chu decided to inquire about what they had been discussing in his absence. Chu's father said he wanted to go to the emperor to punish the scoundrel who attacked Chu. He could not forgive him. But for now, Chu decided to defuse the situation. Amiably greeting his opponent named Sun, Technically, Chu was his uncle, even though he was younger. With a darkening face, Chu pinched Sun's cheek, starting to chide him for the disrespect he showed. As it turned out, this was his young teacher who was supposed to teach him in the future. Though, to Chu, he seemed more like a tormentor. Retaliation for such treatment was a sacred duty. The past. Chu was again fighting with Teacher Sun, one of the six saints who was a real training-obsessed maniac. Whenever Chu got distracted, Sun never missed the opportunity to strike him hard with the flat side of the sword, showing no mercy. Chu, lying on the ground and clinging to Sun's legs, begged for mercy. He no longer had the strength to endure these beatings. But seeing Chu once again drop his sword and beg for mercy, Sun became furious and swung his sword as if it were some kind of club, preparing to continue his strike therapy. In a real battle, you can't beg an enemy for mercy, Sun said, preparing another lesson for Chu, the present. Now, Chu understood the hesitation that had prevented him from taking Sun's blow. The body had reacted on its own to that strike. Having finished the introductions, everyone decided to gather around a table at the Chu family estate. There was an evident awkwardness, but the conversation began. Chu was curious about what his elder brother was doing there. Chu assumed it was about the wedding 
but he didn't have time for that, which he promptly communicated to the group, much to their surprise. Chu declined by saying that he still had much to learn and many things to understand. He needed to meet many people and even share work with them to understand the world, even beyond Murum. Chu's father was quite surprised by this statement, asserting that the world beyond Murim is very dangerous, filled with killers, bandits, and other vagabonds. To this, Chu retorted, asking if Nam Gun was a murderer, again surprising his father, who hadn't considered this point. Chu continued to speak about how martial artists have their own path. He tried to steer the conversation away, but Nam Gun was not reading the room and didn't grasp what was happening. Chu decided to just end the conversation. After politely bidding everyone farewell, he turned to leave. Noticing the blonde man named Hyun, Chu beckoned him over and Hyun eagerly ran to him. Smiling wickedly and leaning closer to Hyun, Chu suggested they talk outside. Those left inside exchanged confused looks, clearly feeling a bit uneasy about what had just transpired. Hyun began the conversation by mentioning Chu's hairstyle, which clearly didn't suit him. However, instead of pointing it out, he decided to compliment the young lord's hair. Only then noticing his hairdo, Chu grew slightly irritated, starting to adjust and untangle his hair. They continued their conversation on the move. Hyun tried to flatter Chu, expressing astonishment at his knowledge of Murim. Chu, on the other hand, recalled his cursed teachers who had tormented, trained him for a long time. Chu's aura flared with negativity from such memories, while Hyun kept trying to appease him. Reflecting on the situation and his future actions, Chu decided to take Sun as his first disciple, already imagining how he would torment him. It would be a perfect revenge. Chu stood by the shore continuing his training, while Huan stood beside him, asking him to rest for a bit. But Chu had other concerns. He was resolutely moving towards his goals, regardless of the obstacles. His relationship with Huang had deteriorated. Just then, Chu's sister arrived, also advising him, speaking about rest and paying attention to oneself and one's body. With her was her handmade guardian. Upon seeing the second person, Huang immediately bristled and straightened up as if he had swallowed a rod. He obviously had feelings for the handmaid, but no one was surprised by his reaction. Approaching Chu, his sister began to warn him about the dangers of Murim, mentioning that their mother too had perished. At these words, Chu's sister lost her composure, overcome by fear for her family and for Chu in particular. Seeing his sister's behavior, Chu asked what was wrong with her, as it was so unlike her. Deciding to reassure his sister, Chu promised that nothing bad would happen to their Yu clan anymore. He would take care of it. He ended his statement with a radiant smile. His sister was pleasantly surprised by his words. She too smiled, realizing her brother had grown up and was no longer a child, ready to take responsibility. She had always seen a little boy before her, but now she realized her brother had grown and it was time for her to acknowledge it. Chu was surprised by her words. From the pond, a blurry human silhouette sprang out, shooting towards the shore like a bullet. It was a sturdy young man with broad shoulders and a muscular physique visible even through his clothes. As it was easy to discern, it was Chu. Although he had lost weight, the skin, which had been stretched for a long time, had not tightened up and hung in flaps. Chu's father was alarmed. His son had become extremely thin, just skin and bones. He looked so fragile that he might break at the slightest fall. Chu planned to embark on a journey, stating that he intended to stay at the Nam Gun clan. Chu justified his trip with the desire to meet Sun, as he was, in a way, part of their family. But in reality, he was preparing to start training. Despite his father's objections, Chu had already made up his mind. Promising to return safe and sound, he stood up from the table ready to pack his things. Sitting in his room, he sifted through the items he might need on his journey. He couldn't travel under his real name, so he decided to take a name from the past, Jin. Packing everything into a bundle and slinging it over his back, he flung open the door, ready for the new adventures and journey ahead. But as soon as he stepped out, he bumped into a crowd of people waiting for him at the exit. Huang approached him, introducing the delegation that would accompany him to his destination. Clearly, Chu's father had made arrangements, deciding to protect his son in this manner. But this was certainly not part of Chu's plans. Chu's plans included obtaining virgin ginseng and killing the servant of chaos. But with such a crowd, it would be impossible. No one should know about this, for then his father would raise an alarm and Chu wouldn't be able to justify his actions. 
he must not get caught. But then Chu came up with a plan. First, he needed to get rid of Huang. For this, he suggested they have a drink together. Chu mentioned that Huang had always helped and protected him, yet they had never shared a drink. Beneath the bandages hiding his face, Chu smirked. Night descended on the Yu clan's estate, just in time for Chu's escape. Under the night sky, Chu's sister strolled with her maid, engaged in a leisurely conversation. She decided to visit Chu. The maid always dressed Chu in funny outfits and gave him quirky hairstyles when he was still chubby. Suddenly, Chu's sister asked the maid who he reminded her of, to which she replied that of course he reminded her of her young mistress. Finishing the conversation and dismissing her maid, the young woman decided to proceed alone. Chu, donning a wide-brimmed hat, quietly opened the door intending to leave without disturbing anyone. Huang lay on the floor, having consumed a hefty dose of alcohol and a touch of special poison deeply asleep. Suddenly, he yelled out, raising his hand and mumbling unintelligibly. He was merely talking in his sleep. The poison in Chu's possession dispersed internal energy, ensuring Huang would be incapacitated until morning. Suddenly, Chu noticed his approaching sister. She spoke first, asking if Chu wouldn't even say goodbye. She looked quite sad, her sorrow evident. After all, her beloved brother was leaving home. Chu was surprised to find her there. But she suddenly hugged her brother, not trying to dissuade him from his venture, but only asking him to return sooner. She said that if things became too difficult, he could return at any time. She and their father would always wait for him. Chu was again taken aback, having never had someone care and worry for him like this in the past. Having prepared a horse and loaded his belongings onto it, Chu was ready to depart. His sister had suggested taking this horse, a gift from the emperor. Mounting the saddle and taking one last look at his home, Chu set off, etching the familiar place into his memory. He was sad to leave home, but no one other than him knew about the looming danger. Chu traveled through a snow-covered forest throughout the night, approaching his journey's goal. By dawn, he reached the first destination on his list. Patting the horse's neck and guiding it towards the village, Chu pondered his next move. First and foremost, he entered a tavern to have a hearty meal after his long journey. Food disappeared in Chu's mouth at an incredible speed. Now that he had lost weight, he didn't need to stick to a strict diet. Throwing a silver coin on the table and finishing his meal, Chu asked the tavern owner to gather all the ginseng gatherers and hunters familiar with the area. In the dimly lit room, a group of people stood in neat rows before the man. One of them reported that they had located virgin ginseng in the Hoi province. Delighted, the leader of the unknowns ordered them to move out. Chu stood before the people brought by the tavern owner. They were the ones familiar with the locality. One of them asked Chu's purpose for visiting, noting that he looked quite suspicious. Could he be a bandit? Realizing the misunderstanding, Chu quickly explained that he was not a thief, and the bandages on his face were for healing. He had come from a neighboring province. He also mentioned that his name was Jin, and he had previously worked for the Yu clan. Now he was looking for something in this region for a former military advisor. After explaining that he was searching for a stone emitting a crimson light, the locals were somewhat surprised and pondered. One of the gathered individuals, despite the peculiarity of the described stone, recalled something. When he was young, he had gotten lost in the mountains and stumbled upon a strange stone. From the description, it sounded like what Chu was looking for. Becoming more serious, he quickly inquired about its location. The man paused for a moment, but eventually spoke of it being at the Pagoda Peak. However, one should definitely not venture there. That location housed the Fortress of Nine Dragons, or in other words, the stronghold of mountain bandits who had settled there. This didn't deter Chu at all. Now it was clear why no one could find the ginseng. Who would have thought to look for it in a bandit's lair? Taking the hands of the man who knew the way, Chu very politely began to implore him to guide him, as it was of utmost importance. He needed to get there at any cost. Seeing the honest eyes of Chu, the man quickly agreed to lead Chu to the desired location. The others were surprised by the positive response. The journey there was not safe. Chu was glad that the man agreed, and he sincerely thanked him, understanding the dangers of such a journey for both himself and the guide. They walked for quite a long time, navigating mountain paths that were least covered in snow. Finally, they reached their destination. In front of them lay a chasm, 
at the bottom of which a raging river flowed so deep that its bed was invisible. Once again thanking the guide, Chu asked where exactly he had seen the stone. The man pointed in a direction, saying the stone should be visible at sunset. They waited for the sun to approach the horizon and paint the surroundings in red-orange hues. As the sun began to set, the entire area turned crimson, and the snow reflected even more of the sunset's glow. As the sun almost set behind the mountain peak, Chu was able to see something. One of the stones in front of them began to emit a crimson glow. It was precisely what Chu had been searching for, now he was certain. Heartily thanking the guide, Chu decided to reward him with a gold pendant and send him back before they ran into the mountain bandits. The man was grateful, surprised, and simultaneously embarrassed by the value of the payment. Saying goodbye, Chu approached the edge of the cliff. The next moment he leaped off the cliff, diving straight into the turbulent river. Falling down and avoiding sharp protrusions, Chu approached the water's surface. Successfully entering the icy water, Chu surfaced, looking around and searching for a way forward. Assuming that no one would guess someone would swim across the river in winter, Chu headed towards the fortress. After all, no one was his equal in the water. Quietly infiltrating the territory, Chu overheard a conversation between bandits on a tower. They were discussing captives and their sale into slavery. Deciding not to pay attention to it while he searched for the ginseng, Chu began to concentrate energy to find the desired item, but instead he discovered something else. A bandit emerged from a house, dragging a woman by her hair. His intentions were clearly not peaceful. Throwing the woman to the ground, the thug began to kick and torment her, indulging his sadistic nature. Chu watched the scene indecisively. He couldn't abandon everything and intervene, but standing by idly felt wrong. Then from the same house, a little girl appeared, crying loudly. The bandit noticed her immediately. The woman clung to the man's leg, begging him not to harm her daughter. How could he call himself a man after doing such a thing? But the villain didn't care. He was about to stomp on the woman's head. Chu couldn't stand it any longer. Every fiber of his being demanded that he punish this brute who could no longer be called a man. The woman was pummeled with kicks, miraculously still alive. Chu was shaking with anger. He couldn't just stand by and watch any longer, regardless of his original intention to sneak in quietly. Yet Chu still hesitated, disgusted with himself and the man who seemed oblivious, continuing to beat the woman. The little girl kept crying, devastated and helpless, feeling sorry for her mother. Unable to bear it anymore, Chu made a few swift moves and was close to the bandit, who was about to feel the wrath of Chu's fists. Channeling spiritual energy into his body, Chu prepared a powerful punch. Both the mother and the daughter, like the bandit, were too engrossed in the horror of the situation to notice him. But with one swift arc of motion, the bandit fell to the ground with a smashed face. Chu was upset that he got the thug's blood on him, considering his clothing was rather expensive. The little girl was impressed by how Chu handled the bandit. She wasn't crying anymore. Instead, admiration for her savior was evident in her eyes. The girl asked if Chu had come to save them, to which he responded, somewhat irritably, that he was just passing by. But the girl's mother didn't share her optimism. Shielding her daughter, she asked in a trembling voice who he was. Extending his hand, which seemed to the woman like the hand of a giant who came only to cause pain, Chu simply covered them with his cloak, considering the cold, especially since they were in the mountains. Realizing that Chu posed no threat, the woman became more open to conversation. Chu was able to learn from her where the other captives were. She pointed to a building nearby guarded by another bandit. The bandit noticed them, but Chu quickly knocked him out and began dragging the bodies inside to hide them. After tossing them inside as if they were sacks of potatoes, Chu noticed there were more people in the room. It was a crowd of captives from infants to the elderly, all of whom looked terrified. Informing them that despite his appearance, he had come to rescue them, Chu gestured behind him and promised to lead them out. After learning from the captives that there were approximately 50 bandits in the fortress, Chu realized it would be difficult to handle them all alone, but he could buy some time for the captives to escape. Chu internally berated himself for getting involved in all this. Now, the task seemed much more complicated. His thoughts were interrupted by the first woman he saved. She asked what they should do next and where they should go. Great, at least one decisive person. Chu told her she would lead the others. 
A bandit entered the building looking for his lazy, as he thought, colleagues by their cloaks and axes. The streets outside were empty. As his gaze lowered, he saw the unconscious bodies of his accomplices. Glaring threateningly at the group of captives, he asked what had happened and who was responsible. The people just huddled in the corner. Suddenly, a sharp blow struck the bandit's neck, sending the clueless thug to the ground. Behind him stood Chu. After dealing with the bandit, he peeked outside to assess the situation and plan the next move. Outside, Chu noticed a watchtower at the edge of a cliff. There was a guard on the tower who was supposed to be monitoring the area. The guard wasn't paying much attention to his surroundings, but at the last moment, he caught a glimpse of something. A blurry human silhouette, blurred by speed, was approaching the tower and was almost at its base. Chu stopped under the tower, holding a torch in one hand and gathering energy for a strike in the other. Once he had gathered enough, Chu took a swing at the tower. A wave of spiritual energy radiated outwards, and the tower's foundation started to crack, resembling a spider's web. The tower was blown away as if hit by a siege weapon, and along with it, the sentry, who hadn't managed to react in time, was sent flying. A scream escaped the sentry's mouth. The realization of falling into a chasm, the bottom of which he couldn't even see, filled his mind. The captives, who now hardly seemed captive at all, stepped out into the street and noticed the missing tower, as if it had been uprooted by a storm. The tower's destruction was the planned signal for the escape to begin. The first woman Chu had saved led the others along the previously agreed-upon route out of the fortress. Meanwhile, Chu was causing a diversion, kicking down doors and setting the interiors on fire with the help of his torch, causing a massive blaze. Tossing torches, Chu set house after house alight. They lit up like matchsticks. After all, wood burns well, and everything in the fort was made of wood, from the walls to the living quarters. Chu stood against the backdrop of a burning house, ready to cause a commotion to ensure the bandits didn't detect the escape. Meanwhile, the bandits were peacefully sleeping in one of the barracks, dreaming and suspecting nothing. Suddenly, one of them jolted awake his eyes catching the chaos outside, and the scent of burning reached him. Shouting about the fire, he started waking the other bandits. They were slow to rouse until the gravity of the situation sunk in. The first awakened bandit hadn't even reached the door to step outside when he was abruptly thrown back into the depths of the barracks. When the bandits looked towards the entrance, they saw a man, his face wrapped in bandages holding a torch in his hand. It was Chu, of course. The bandits demanded to know who the hell he was, to which Chu calmly replied, What do you think? Obviously, an arsonist. Having done his work, Chu began to run. The entire fort was alerted, and the very disgruntled bandits, unhappy with their abrupt awakening, began chasing him. Chu dashed around a corner hoping to lose them, but was quickly spotted by one of the bandits, who signaled the direction to the rest. Chu ran, the bandits pursued, if only he had the ability to fortify and absorb energy, he wouldn't have had to run. Suddenly, from around another corner, a bandit with a spear lunged at Chu, intending to seriously injure our arsonist. Chu, reacting quickly, managed to dodge the initial attack and readied himself to counter. Without slowing down, he charged into the attacker with his elbow, striking directly into the solar plexus and taking him out of the chase. Chu decided he had run enough. It was time to set a trap for the bandits. He planned to channel energy into his legs to increase his speed. Breaking the spear of the attacker, he lit it on fire. Now he had two torches. The bandits' guards stood at the fortress entrance, oblivious to the ongoing events, as their perspective didn't allow them to see it. Then a small rock, perhaps chipped off from somewhere, landed near one of the guards. Turning his attention to the stone, the burning fort came into the guards' view. Had they been attacked, or had the fire started for some other reason? Either way, realizing the situation, the bald and ragged guards started running into the heart of the fortress to assist their comrades. At the same time as the path cleared, the prisoners, seizing their chance, also began to run, but out of the fortress. They successfully made it out and continued away from the blazing bandit camp. They fled without looking back. Inside the fort, a hefty, bald, and dark-skinned man wielding a cudgel ambushed Chu from behind. He struck a powerful blow at Chu, but Chu managed to react in time and somewhat block the hit. Chu slid across the ground from the impact but managed to stay upright, using his hands to maintain balance. His belongings flew off somewhere. The attacker had a blind eye covered by a patch. In anger, 
The bald man asked Chu who he was and where he came from. Chu chose to remain silent and didn't respond while the bandits began surrounding him, limiting his maneuverability. The bald man asked Chu if he was alone, to which Chu first cautiously replied that he was. But after a moment's thought and with a hint of arrogance, he said that he alone was enough against the likes of them. The bald man was somewhat impressed. All this commotion over one guy? He clearly didn't buy Chu's bluff. Chu was in bad shape. The man's hit had done significant damage, and considering their numbers and his condition, things were indeed bleak. Meanwhile, the bald man addressed his subordinates. The camp continued to burn, yet no one seemed in a hurry to extinguish it. After a motivating speech, the bandits rushed to put out the fire. Only the strongest remained with Chu when all the others went to fight the fire. They were redundant here anyway. The bald man introduced himself as Sosin, and unsurprisingly, he was the head of the Nine Dragons Fortress. Chu didn't bother introducing himself in return. Unoffended by the refusal to introduce himself, the bald man continued. He said he appreciated people like Chu and wanted him to join them. After all, not everyone has the courage to sneak into a camp full of bandits. The bald man kept on persuading, after all, having Chu in his gang would be a great addition. Chu, trying to stall for time, sat straight down on the ground, questioning if he was being offered to become a mountain bandit. Chu pretended to be in deep thought, rubbing his chin, but in reality he was gathering spiritual energy. The bald man went on about how hard it is to find the right people nowadays, and that Chu's audacity should be rewarded. He offered to forget the arson incident and have Chu join his inner circle. But Chu remained silent, no matter what the bald man said. Why should he even listen? He was just buying time. The big man couldn't stand being ignored for too long, especially when Chu responded that it all sounded great. But then, getting up, Chu asked, since when is a wolf supposed to serve a mongrel? He had somewhat recovered and wanted to provoke the bandits. The bald man was enraged, veins bulging on his face, and a furious snarl crept over it. Chu assumed a fighting stance and continued to provoke the leader, suggesting a one-on-one -on -one duel, but the bald man didn't fall for the trick. Pointing at Chu, he ordered his subordinates to tear him apart. The fierce cutthroats lunged at Chu, unabashedly taking advantage of their numerical superiority. The ragged bandit launched a swift attack on Chu using a spear, but Chu managed to duck and let the attack pass overhead. Chu's body remained unscathed, but his clothing, along with the bandages covering his face, was torn. Three of the bandits ganged up on Chu. One fought hand to hand, delivering direct punches from which Chu dodged, the familiar one with the spear, and the third with a cudgel. As the bandages came off, the bandits were slightly surprised by Chu's appearance, for he looked like an old man. The bandits began to mock Chu, shouting insults about his appearance, but Chu didn't react. Unlike them, he looked human. The provocation worked, but not in the desired way, as the bandits grew angrier. Chu dodged another attack with a leap, Performing a complex pirouette in the air, Chu counterattacked using his legs. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to knock the bandit out. While Chu was mid-air, a hand-to-hand -hand combatant attacked him, shouting something about pathetic tricks. It was amusing hearing that from a bandit. Nevertheless, Chu took a powerful blow to the torso, sending him flying off his intended course. Flying backward, Chu managed to twist in mid-air, completing a backflip and landed on his feet. As soon as he touched the ground, they swarmed him again, not giving him a second to catch his breath. Attacks rained down on Chu one after another. He spun like a top, dodging everything thrown at him, but this couldn't go on forever. Then, a punch connected with Chu's face, sending him back into the air and breaking his concentration. Chu flew well, really well, but since he didn't have wings, his flight was followed by a landing. The bandits circled him like a pack of hyenas around a wounded lion, Chu had underestimated them and was now paying the price. How could he protect anyone being this weak? But Chu let go of negative thoughts. After all, he had saved those people. At least they would be alive and safe. But Chu wasn't planning on dying in such a place either. As Chu tried to catch his breath, the one-eyed bandit spoke up. At first, he thought Chu was brave, but it turned out to be foolishness. Pointing at Chu, he ordered him to be finished off. The dance with death resumed. Chu flowed like water, evading the strikes of the attacking bandits. 
The technique of the eight drunken immortals' steps greatly aided Chu, allowing him to avoid injuries, yet he was still far from his former form, taking a few hits. Deciding to end it with one blow, Chu employed the technique of light steps and lunged at the gang's leader. Delivering a slashing strike, he only managed to graze him, scratching the enemy's throat. Unbeknownst to the bandits, the fight had moved to the edge of a cliff, and as they prepared to attack Chu again, he didn't hesitate and jumped into the abyss. The last thing the bandits saw was Chu's hand, where he clenched all his fingers except the middle one in a well-known gesture. The one-eyed bandit was livid with such an ending to the battle. He was utterly dissatisfied, but there was nothing he could do. Meanwhile, Chu continued to fall into the abyss's darkness, promising himself to return for their heads once he became stronger, of course. The bandits looked down in slight bewilderment, and the one-eyed bandit ordered his subordinates to find the attacker's body. He wanted to skin him alive to vent his frustration. The leader had barely given his orders when a bandit rushed in from the fort, reporting that only three burned bodies were found in the building where the prisoners had been held. The bald man was boiling with rage. So many problems because of one person. Even skinning him alive seemed too mild a punishment in the bandit leader's mind. Sosin ordered his subordinates to comb through the entire area and locate every single escaped prisoner. Meanwhile, Chu continued to fall, first facing downward to slow his descent using the air's resistance, then tucking into a dive to enter the water feet first. Initially, Chu feared he would crash into the bottom due to his high speed, but he suddenly stopped not understanding why. Completely halted, Chu hovered underwater, and as he tried to look around and discern the cause, he began to be pulled in a certain direction. But within seconds, the situation became clear. Streams of water had halted him, forming a whirlpool that subsequently dragged him deeper. The whirlpool that for unknown reasons formed under the water continued to pull Chu to the bottom, taking him farther and farther into the impenetrable darkness of the water depths. Chu realized that if he does nothing, he will go to the bottom and will not be able to resurface. So he tried to group and equalize their position in relation to the bottom. Having caught the moment when he swam near the next ledge, he immediately pushed off from the solid support overcoming the water flow and directing his body towards the surface. The push was powerful enough that the maelstrom could no longer hold him, especially since at this depth it was already beginning to lose its power. Chu began to surface, trying to make it before he ran out of air. He popped out of the water like a cork out of a champagne bottle, finally getting a chance to enjoy the air. Taking deep breaths, Chu tried to realize where he had gotten to. He lay on his back, supported by the expulsive force of the water. He needed to catch his breath and rest from the recent events from the battle to his underwater adventures. Opening his eyes, he decided to look back at the place where he had gotten to, or rather the place where the water had brought him. Tiredly, he looked around and studied his surroundings. Suddenly his gaze was drawn to something interesting. Chu did not immediately believe what he saw. The spiritual energy began to react on its own, couldn't it be? Chu began to quickly scan his surroundings with spiritual energy, wanting to find what he felt, hoping that he was not imagining it. Virgin Jinseng. It was definitely him. Chu couldn't mistake it for anything, he was sure now. Rising out of the water, he began to look around more actively in search of the item he so desperately needed. Finally fully risen from the water and examined the cave in which he fell. Chu was surprised he fell from the waterfall, and then he was picked up by a stream of water. Is it really so far carried? And then Chu's gaze caught on something. His face expressed a look of surprise mixed with anticipation. His eyes were wide open. This is... A pristine ginseng tree was growing right on the rocky shore. A small sprout with one small inflorescence was peeking out from the ground. From the first, the plant did not stand out. Finally, Chu was literally crying with joy. He had a hard time finding this place. You could say blind luck had led him here. Remembering how the informant from the beggar clan claimed that it would be very easy to find it, Chu was angry and depressed. It was worth it to clarify the details. Getting out of the water, cursing that beggar Chu directed his footsteps towards the precious plant that he had been longing to get all this time. Finally, the moment had come. Approaching tightly and kneeling down, Chu began to quickly dig up the precious root of the plant. After all, the whole essence of ginseng was there. 
not in the above ground part. Having dug enough, he tightly grasped the stem of the plant and began to pull that out of the ground, being careful not to damage it. Chu was burning with impatience. The name was very appropriate for this plant. It looked like a baby. Chu was happy because he was able to get ahead of this cursed demonic servant. Now his plans are doomed to failure. Finished with the victory celebration, Chu prepared to eat the ginseng root before thanking him for the treat. After all, it would not be polite to just eat it. Chu was engulfed by the sensation of the ginseng flavor. He was overwhelmed with a sense of coolness, a bitter taste on the tip of his tongue, a sweet and refreshing taste, overflowing with spiritual energy. Finished savoring the taste, Chu began to literally push the root off of him. The spiritual energy was so dense, there was so much of it, he was going to absorb it all. Finished Chu sat down comfortably. Now he will show everyone what he is worth. That bald Sosan should already start to fear because soon Chu will come for his head. These pathetic bandits will no longer be able to stop him. Sitting in the lotus posture, he was busy absorbing and assimilating spiritual energy. Wait for the world, the useless guy from Huayan Prefecture to return. Several people arrived at the small village where Chu was passing through. They were looking for someone, but it seems that the target of their search was called by a different name, although she had clearly been here. Huang was one of the people who had come here in search of Chu. Huang's face looked battered, as if someone had beaten him up pretty badly. After learning from the tavern owner that a similar guy was here, but introduced himself as Jin. Rubbing his injured cheek, Huang wondered where his young master had gone. The tavern owner was a little perplexed by this visit, but did not ask any questions. The day Chu escaped, morning. Huang was lying on the floor, snoring all over the place. He was still reeling from the amount of alcohol and special poison that Chu had spiked him with. As a friend, the door suddenly opened, and in it showed a very disgruntled Father Chu, that with his loud shouting and appearance still managed to wake up Huang. Huang stared at him with a stupid, uncomprehending look. The alcoholic sleep was in no hurry to release him from its strong embrace. The string of saliva that dripped from his lips also gave him a silly look. But the saliva problem was solved by a strong kick from the evil Father Chu, which not only wiped away the saliva, but also the remnants of sleep from Huang's face. Father Chu was literally throwing lightning bolts in his rage. How dare that bastard Huang fall asleep? Threats came from him. Father Chu was going to bury Huang alive in the ground. Then he could sleep all he wanted. Huang still couldn't understand what was going on, and the others tried to stop the head of the family. And then Father Chu pointed to a large mountain of empty liquor bottles. Look how drunk he is, Father Chu continued to complain. And an realization began to form in Huang's mind. He began to remember how he had sat and drank with the young master, or rather, how Chu had systematically drunk Huang, encouraging him to drink to the bottom of one bowl after another at a truly terrible pace. Huang's vision was getting cloudier and cloudier with each drink, and the objects in front of his eyes were dancing in a drunken whirlpool of events. The last thing he remembered was his young master offering to get drunk. After that, consciousness sank into darkness and Huang became horrified at the realization of the situation. Chu's father continued to rage, wanting to tear the man who had been defamed to look after his son and not get half drunk. The two men who were with him tried to calm him down and forgive him this time. But then Father Chu had no time to finish one of his many threats against Huang and collapsed in the arms of his attendants. The imperial healer was afraid for Mr. Wang. Laying him on the floor, the physician began to feel for a pulse on his wrist. After all, he was a physician and should know about such things and could provide help if needed. Suddenly, his face turned pale and his eyes opened wide. In disbelief, he raised his gaze to the steely occupants of the room and announced with shock that Mr. Wang was dead. And at this moment, Father Chu came to his senses. He had just lost consciousness for a moment, but he wasn't dying. Only after coming to his senses did he start pounding this incomplete healer, returning to Huang, that after he was well beaten, was sent in search of the young master. He went to the courtyard in front of the tavern and noticed the boy that looked after the horses. One of them was strange, or rather its eyes. The boy was also surprised by the unusual eyes of the horse, and it does not eat everything. Even special food refuses to eat. 
he had to run through the neighboring villages in search of what this horse would eat. Huang headed for the stables. In the meantime, the boy poured a strange mixture of hay and various fruits into the feed trough that the horse at least ate somehow. Getting closer, Huang was able to identify the horse. It was one of the elite from their estate. Huang immediately ran, starting to call out to the young master as he mistook him for a boy from far away. When he got closer and realized that the young master was not here, Huang started running from side to side, panicking and asking himself why his young master had climbed into such a hole and where he had gone. He kept running around the yard looking for Chu, but could not find anyone, his actions putting the boy in a stupor. It was not clear how to react to this. Huang was a very eccentric person. Still paying attention to the boy, Huang ran up to him and with tears in his eyes began to ask him where the horse came from and whether he had seen its owner. The boy, after some thought, said that the horse's owner had gone to Pagoda Peak, just where the fortress of the Nine Dragons, the Mountain Bandits, was. When asked not to go there, he only told them that he was looking for something. When Huang heard about the Nine Bandits, he became even more hysterical. After all, they are bandits, and his young master is so gentle. Especially the master will twist off Huang's head if something happens to Chu. Having imagined the brigands and how they will first beat up and then take Chu captive, Huang fell into an even greater panic, although it seemed where more. Huang was almost tearing his hair out of his chest with worry. Having heard enough, Wang snapped out of his seat like a professional sprinter right on the run shouting something about his young master. He urgently needed to do something before it was too late. Leaving behind him the surprised boy and the clouds of dust that kicked up from under his feet, Huang ran in the only direction he knew, but he didn't even get 20 feet away before he stopped abruptly, realizing something. Huang turned around and ran back to the boy to confirm the details. But Luck Huang apparently does not smile at all, permanently interrupted to that back. And so he ran a little bit, not having reached the clinging through a small stone that protruded from the ground. Having tried his strength in flight, Huang, not thinking long, decided to make an emergency landing face down right at the feet of the boy. His fall raised a pile of dust. Having risen from the ground with a broken face and blood coming from the nose, Huang, however, was able to gather his thoughts and ask about the whereabouts of this Pai Pagoda. A group of people were running through the night forest. The first in the column was a woman carrying a small child in her arms. The people looked very frightened and seemed to be running away from someone. Suddenly, a male silhouette appeared behind one of the trees on their way, which was difficult to distinguish in the night darkness. The people were already afraid that they had been caught up. But it turned out to be the same man who showed Chu the way to the Purple Stone. Having indicated his peaceful intentions, he decided to show the fugitives a shortcut to the village. The woman who was wearing Chu's cloak briefly thanked the man and continued running. These were the very people he was able to rescue from the mountain bandit camp. The male guide asked the woman with the child if they had seen the guy in bandages, who was supposed to be heading in their direction. The woman cast a tense glance at the man but did not have time to answer. At the same time, there was a waterfall near the stream where Chu had fallen, and on one of the banks was an armed group of seven men. These were the gang members who had been sent to find Chu. One of them was kicking the ground in frustration, reporting to the deputy leader that the corpse of that guy could just be carried away by the current, and they would not find him now. But they had no choice, because then their boss would be furious. And when that happened, if they didn't find the corpse, they would be skinned, not him. The subordinates could only sigh sadly. The deputy began to give orders. He wanted to split into groups. Five of them would go down the river, and the rest would stay to search in the vicinity of the waterfall. The subordinates accepted the order and were ready to follow it. And then one of them began to point in the direction of the waterfall, attracting the influence of the deputy to the waterfall. After his shout, the eyes of those present turned to the waterfall. From the waterfall itself, behind which there was a hidden cave, a man came out. His face was hidden by the hair that stuck to his face. The man was complaining about fate, for if something had gone wrong, he would have drowned. The deputy was surprised to find a living person here. They shouldn't be here except for them. I wonder where he came from, the deputy hastened to ask. 
The man whose face was still hidden by his hair noticed that he was not alone and was surprised that someone was there to greet him. It was unexpected but pleasant because Chu, and it was him, was just going to look for them. Who she was, the bandits were in a state of confusion. They didn't have a lead on this person. They were even looking for a corpse. So what this person was doing here was decidedly unclear to them. Tossing back the hair from his face, revealing his new face, which got rid of all the wrinkles, he only further discouraged the bandits. Chu asked if they were looking for him, and the bandits didn't understand why this strange guy was bothering them in the first place. He didn't yet understand why the bandits didn't recognize him, but he didn't care. Chu only ordered them to take off their clothes as he was freezing. The bandits immediately tensed up and prepared for battle, raising their weapons and taking up positions. The deputy said that if they silently tolerated the fact that he was on fire, it did not mean that they could talk nonsense. But Chu was deaf to their threats, only repeating his question, or should it be decided by badly using force. The bandit did not understand. What can one man do to them? Is he crazy? Without letting the bandit finish his thought, Chu sharply reduced the distance between them and delivered a sharp blow to the jaw with a leg. The bandit threw up in the air from the force of the blow. But this was not the end of Chu and decided to add another kick to the bandit, this time striking from the top down, knocking the bandit into the rocky shore. This made the bandit's fists shake. Their main man was cut down in just two kicks in the blink of an eye, so they don't stand a chance. The unknown man is too strong for them. Taking the cloak from the defeated bandit, Chu was upset that it was wet. He should have been more careful. What was the point of swapping one wet garment for another? The bandits shook even more violently, clutching at their clothes as if they wanted to protect them from the creepy clothes snatcher. It was as if they were trying to cover themselves, as if to say that there was nothing remarkable about their clothes. Chu smiled a shark smile and flashing his golden eyes bloodthirsty asked the bandits who next wants to share with him so necessary dry clothes. After his words, the clothes immediately flew off the bandits, literally flew into the air from the speed with which the bandits tore off their clothes. The bandits found themselves in a very embarrassing position. They were standing in the cold in their underwear, looking fearfully at the young man who was putting on their clothes. Chu also borrowed a weapon. It was a glaive. He tested its balance on his outstretched arm, twirling it from side to side. The weapon was a little heavier than he thought, but it didn't matter. Suddenly, Chu swung his glaive, aiming it at the naked bandits. They were shaking from the cold and the fear that had overtaken them. They didn't even realize what was happening. They stood there with stupid, frightened expressions looking at their offender, but unable to do anything to him. In an instant, the head of one of the bandits separated from the body from the blow that was struck by Chu. The bandits were horrified, because just now the head of their comrade in arms was blown off in one blow. The bandits shook more than before. Chu, interrupting in a lame mood, asked if everything is all right with the bandits. They will just stand there, will not even run. However, Chu didn't care. What did he care? They were all going to die anyway. The bandits began to beg him for mercy, but Chu did not want to and he had already made a promise that he would kill every one of their gang. The bandits had already fully realized that they couldn't get out of here on their own feet. One of them, very nervous, still decided to ask Chu to whom he promised to kill them. Chu swung for another blow, calmly said that he promised himself. He was not going to pity them, considering what they were doing, and he had a long personal relationship with them. The bandits couldn't take it anymore. Their instincts took over and they started running away from Chu at all possible speeds, except it wouldn't do them any good. Complaining to himself about the problem, Bandit's Chu prepared to make a strike that quickly end all this farce, after which he would be able to head toward Sosin. Making a wave from the weapon in the hands of Chu went wave that began to catch up with the bandits and literally in an instant reached their backs. One blow and five heads rolled across the frozen rocky ground. One movement and the bandits that could previously cause Chu problems were killed easily and simply. Having finished with them, he crouched down, preparing to make a dash. Chu would not wait. It is time to hunt, hunting beasts, because these bandits are not worthy to be called humans, and soon Chu will correct the mistake of nature. Moving quickly between the groups of bandits that were supposed to be looking for him, Chu himself was looking for them. They were supposed to be hunting him but he ended up hunting them.
When he finished with the last one, Chu noticed that he had blood on him, but he had just changed his clothes. His clothes were dirty again. Well, where would he find new ones? Chu pondered. There were no whole ones left nearby. He wasn't shy about attacking, so... Deciding to at least wash the blood off his face, Chu came closer to the mountain river, which formed a small dam in this place. The water was calm, unlike other areas. Leaning over, he could not immediately believe his eyes. A young man was looking at him in the reflection. Whose is that beautiful face? The question ran through Chu's mind. After thinking for a moment, Chu realized that he had recently eaten virgin Jin Sang. Now it became clear to him why he did not recognize the bandits. His skin became so firm. Washing himself, Chu continued to complain about the former owner of the body. How could he ruin such a beautiful face? Still, he was lucky. Now he has a very beautiful appearance. Yes, and with such a face, no one would think that he could be adopted, especially when comparing his past with his sister. Now, however, there were common features in them. Chu was distracted from his narcissism by shouts that sounded from the forest, which began not far from the river. Looking around, Chu could see how birds flew into the sky from the commotion that was happening on the ground. He now had a rough idea of the location of the screamers. The man was being beaten by one of the bandits, striking him on the back with a whip and inflicting severe wounds. His piercing scream echoed through the winter forest. At the back stood the two captives, already bound hand and foot by rope, while the black-haired bandit continued to beat the poor male guide with his whip. The bandits suspected the old man of conspiring with Chu because he had met a group of fugitives and tried to lead them out of the forest. The man was not guilty, but the bandit did not believe him, continuing to shower searing blows. As the bandit swung once more for another blow, the bandits noticed something. Even the bandit with the whip froze, staring in the direction of the unknown irritant. The bandits had confused Chu with the servants of Wu Te, the deputy bald headed gang leader. They wondered what he was doing here. They were supposed to be looking for the corpse of the attacker. As soon as Chu realized that he had been spotted, he squatted down and began to collect snow. The bandits did not understand what was happening. Why was he doing this? Did he come here to play? Why is he making snowballs? The bandits were lost in speculation, not understanding what this strange type was doing here. As soon as one of the bandits guessed to ask Chu what he was doing here, he managed to swing like a baseball player, preparing to throw. It didn't look like an attack. But then Chu threw a snowball as if it was shot from a cannon and the shell flew at high speed towards a group of bandits, or rather in one of them. The snowball hit exactly one of them. From the force of the snowball hit, the bandit flew back a few meters. If it didn't kill him, it knocked him out for a long time. The bandit with a whip could not realize the situation until the end, as in another of his subordinates flew the same shell, did the same thing with his body, that is, causing severe injuries. Chu was pleased with the resulting improvisation. After all, he knocked out 100 points out of 100 with his accurate and strong throws. Without waiting for further reaction from the remaining bandits, Chu rushed at them, lightning shortening the distance coming within striking distance with his weapon. But instead of knocking out a single person, Chu jumped high up in front of the group of bandits. When they smelled trouble, they scattered to different sides. But it was too late. Chu was already flying down with his glaive. The landing was hard. Those who did not have time to run away were thrown back by the shockwave. The weakly injured bandits were struggling to get up from the ground, looking warily at their new acquaintance. Chu stood among the lying bodies of the bandits with his head proudly raised and his glaive heel on the ground. He was ready to continue. Swinging once more, Chu prepared to perform one of the techniques. Slash the clouds and slash the moon. The instant attack mowed down almost all of the bandits ignoring the distance between them. There was only one bandit left alive, but he was lying on the ground before he could get up. So the blow had passed over him without damaging him. But that didn't change anything. The bandit suffered the same fate as his comrades. Chu approached the last survivor and asked if he was scared, because just now it was the Wudan clan's moon destruction technique. Bandit couldn't figure out who this guy even was. Chu was a little upset that he wasn't recognized again. Chu heard moans and turned towards the one who was making them, briefly distracting himself from the last bandit. On the snow lay Chu's familiar uncle guide that helped him find his way to the bandit's fortress. 
He remembered him, so he was able to recognize him. Behind the man lying in the snow were bound men. Furious, Chu cast an angry glare at the bandit. The only thing he was interested in right now was who did it. Bandit, realizing that the matter smells fried, began to justify himself and brazenly lie about something that he did not even touch him with a finger, and in general, he has no idea who did it. The ridiculous lie didn't convince Chu for a single second. He simply made a single swing of his weapon, launching a blade-like wave that flew into the bandit at high speed. The bandit did not even immediately realize what had happened, but in any case, it was too late. The bandit had nothing to think with, although he had not really used his head for its intended purpose when he was alive. Having finished with the bandits, Chu went to the uncle guide that was lying all in blood on the snow. The captives were afraid of him at first, but he hastened to assure that he would not touch them. Approaching the man, Chu inquired about his condition. The old man opened his eyes and first saw a guy with a straw hat and the lower part of his face covered, whose eyes glittered gold. But it was only an obsession from weakness. Chu was actually looming over the old man in an already new guise. He told the man that he had asked him to return to the ancients so that such a thing would not happen. The old man tried to reply, but he was too weak. Chu couldn't leave this man to die, so he tried to send some energy through the man's veins and heal him. Even though it wasn't a full treatment, the man should be on the mend. After giving the first aid and noticing that the man's breathing had evened out and his wounds had stopped bleeding, Chu turned his attention to the rest of the captives. He wanted someone to carry him to the village, where he could be properly treated, while he should finish his business here in the bandit camp. He instructed the men to walk from here without looking back, moving slowly and carefully towards the exit of the forest. The men, having listened to the advice, began to pack up and leave. Chu decided that it is worth a little to improve his weapon, to make it more familiar after all. He's more of a swordsman, and arrow weapons used not very often. So he broke off the shaft of the glaive closer to the blade. Chu was calm, because he knew that people would not be chased. He would take care of it. He was going to unleash the fury of the gods upon these beasts. Raising his sword to the heavens in it, struck lightning, as if confirming the seriousness of his intentions. At the same time, two guards were standing at the entrance of the bandit's fortress that they had seen the lightning near their lair. Strange. Where could lightning come from in the middle of winter? But he could not be surprised for long. Right in front of the entrance, a veil of airborne snow formed. The bandits prepared for battle. But before they could even blink, a man jumped out from behind the snow curtain and with his first blow he neutralized one of them for good. But the second bandit did not outlive his colleague for long. Their deaths were literally separated by a fraction of an instant. Here he had already taken out two of them. There were still many more left. With no intention of hiding, Chu decided to call all the fire on himself and deal with them all in one fell swoop so as not to chase them all over the lair. Standing behind the passageway, he shouted the name of the head of the local gang loudly. Spiritual energy filled TH from head to toe. It was like he was a different person now. Although if you asked any of the gangsters, they would definitely say it was a different person. Chu was not going to cause any more trouble. He decided to end it all in one fell swoop. The bandit who had attacked him was chopped in half without even paying attention. Chu's eyes blazed with determination, and something even more mystical and unknowable. He had clearly decided that he was going to kill all of these bandits tonight. No one would get away. Moving quickly between the bandits, Chu chopped those into cabbages without any resistance. Quickly moving forward, the back rows of bandits began to shake with fear. They did not expect such power from the enemy. Most ceased to be a threat to Chu as they shook with fear, but just in time, an arrow flew past him that could have hit his head, but instead hit the bandit behind Chu's back. Chu began to move from side to side gradually, shortening the distance between himself and the archer. No arrow could hit him. Standing in the company of the three archers was the bald-headed boss of the local attack cell. He was dissatisfied with his subordinates because they could not eliminate the intruder and lay down in packs. Chu found himself surrounded just like just a day earlier. But something had changed, namely, Chu himself had changed. Now such a situation was not dangerous for him. Finally, Chu found the one-eyed man, 
because he was wondering where he had gone while his subordinates were dying like flies. The situation had turned in Chu's favor since the last night. Chu continued to provoke the bald ringleader, saying that it looked like he had chickened out and brought in the regular hunters. Chu felt he had an undeniable advantage, despite the numerical advantage. But the fact that there were so many of them would only delay the inevitable, so he shouldn't have done it. Chu raised his sword and prepared to attack. The bandits were frightened. They clutched their weapons tighter and drew their bows more tightly, but they could not prevent their doom. Resistance was pointless. As soon as Chu swung and prepared to rush into the attack from the direction of the entrance to the fortress, voices were heard. Someone had arrived to raid the mountain hunters. Chu turned his head to the place of the entrance and was able to see how from there came a slender row of warriors that had already bared their weapons and rushed to attack. At the head of this group ran Huang. The warriors brought by Hang and the bandits faced off in battle. They all had only one order to kill all the bandits, which they successfully did. The warriors who came were clearly more skillful than the ordinary mountain bandits, so the battle was going in their favor. They were systematically clearing the bandit camp. Huang also participated in the battle, hitting one enemy after another. He was also able to recognize the skills of the young warrior who had arrived here before them and was already fighting the bandits. Chu only sighed heavily. He thought to figure it out on his own. The one-eyed leader was panicking and giving orders to stop the intruders at any cost. Chu noted the ringleader among the crowd of his bandits. So San was his main target, so there was no point in splitting the difference, especially now that the allied forces had arrived. Baldi, sensing that they couldn't win this battle without being seen, decided to run away, only to be seen by Chu. He wasn't going to let him go, so he followed him. The leader was running, but he didn't stand a chance from the start. He was expectedly a coward. Still, he had never once engaged in combat. But the bald man didn't manage to escape far, having only managed to reach the fort's leaning fence where Chu caught up with him. The bandit had no reason to run. He already had one foot in the grave. He just doesn't know it yet. He couldn't understand why the strange guy was following him. He didn't recognize Chu either. But Chu, in kindness, decided to help his buddy to remember himself. Smiling radiantly, he demonstrated between the people's gesture, the same when jumped into the abyss. The leader was as if scalded with boiling water, very frightened and disoriented. He could not understand how he survived and what happened to his face. Chu still decided to explain that everything is thanks to mystical plants. However, the ringleader will still not understand anything. It was time to finish. Chu began to slowly approach the leader. He was a coward, but his head was thinking. He quickly guessed that before him is a master of martial arts. He was to him a small piece of work. Realizing his position, Bald collapsed to his knees, realizing the futility of the battle, and began to beg Chu for mercy. Chu found the situation funny, but did the bald man realize his place? The ringleader began pelting Chu with promises, riches, women, anything he could possibly want, just to spare him gently. He was cut short by Chu's cold voice, demanding him to shut up. Did the bald man spare anyone who asked him to? No. He robbed the common people, kidnapped children and women, abused them. Was there anything that could have stopped his evil? There is no forgiveness. Baldi sat on his knees, realizing the situation he was in. He couldn't survive. There would be no mercy, and there was nothing he could do, just like his victims before him. Raising his sword upwards, Chu was passing judgment on behalf of the heavens for all the bald man's atrocities. All Tom had to do was accept it with honor though how could his kind have honor? The ringleader only had time for one last shriek before his head separated from his torso. Revenge was done. Justice was done. Chu felt a little sorry that the man who had caused so much grief had gotten off so lightly. But by then, Huang had already arrived. He obviously didn't recognize Chu, so he came closer and asked if he was okay. It seemed to Huang that the young warrior in front of him was very angry at the leader of this gang of bandits. So young and so ruthless, said Huang. Chu was about to greet Huang, but he interrupted him half a word. Without letting Chu say that he was him, Huang began to ask questions. Huang looked for a young lord about the same age as the unknown warrior in front of him. A lot of goofiness and stubbornness, arrogant and no manners at all. 
A smile descended from Chu's face with every word. Chu was already thinking about where to bury this impudent, while Huang continued to say that he eats like a cow, and rude that still... But when Huang realized who he was talking to, he abruptly changed the direction of the dialogue, saying that Chu has become a standard of beauty, and of course he recognized him at once. Chu boiled more and more words Huang did not make it better from the word at all. He could not believe his ears. That is what Huang says about him to the first person he meets. But their dialogue was interrupted by warriors that just came closer. They praised Chu's abilities, though his style was a bit rough. But there was no point in scolding him for it. Huang decided to do what he came here for, after all. And he also brought the head of the Heavenly Squad with him. Father Chu was worried about him and wanted him to come back. Huang was in a difficult position because of the head's character. It was bad timing. Chu had yet to kill the demon's servant. But it looked like Huang wasn't going to leave without him, deciding to remember the times when he was an inspector and caught criminals. Huang slowly walked towards Chu with a rope. Chu broke the distance when he sensed something wrong. He immediately warned Huang that he would not hold back in case of trouble. Huang was smiling radiantly, the kind of smile that made Chu feel creepy. Somehow, one didn't want to mess with someone who had such a smile. Quickly realizing the smell of the matter, Chu rushed to escape. He definitely did not need this. His business here is still unfinished, but Huang has already prepared to capture the target. Huang unwrapped the rope and threw it at the fleeing Chu. Huang did not eat his bread for nothing when he was an inspector. The rope like magic wrapped around the leg of the fleeing Chu, ensuring that he could not go any farther. But Chu's not as easy as he looks. Huang decided to remind Chu that in the past he was an inspector of the Central Intelligence, and there are not recruited by advertisement. Huang sharply pulled the rope that was wrapped around Chu's leg. He hoped to knock him down, and then pull him up like a fish on a fishing trip. But losing today was not in Chu's plans. Chu did not even think to resist. On the contrary, he accelerated towards Huang, wanting to use the gained inertia to strengthen the blow. He warned me he wouldn't hold back. His fist collided with Huang's open palm, successfully blocking the blow. The warriors who had come with Huang were amazed that the young master had reached such heights that he could fight on a par with the man who had once been nicknamed the Fighter. In fact, Chu even outclassed Huang by pouring an incredible amount of punches on him, slowly pushing through his defenses, bringing Huang's defeat closer with each strike. Suddenly, instead of another blow, Chu made a rapid dash approaching close to the undeceased Huang. A quick kick to Huang's body from Chu caused him to lose his balance and almost toppled him to the ground. Chu thought to follow up, but was prevented from doing so. Chu felt someone coming up from behind. He jumped away from Huang and prepared to attack the new opponent. But instead of attacking, he had to go on the defense. After all, these are no longer talentless bandits, but trained warriors, especially since there are more of them. It would be difficult for Chu to win this battle. One of the soldiers threw a shard of the board that was left after the bandit camp was ravaged. The warrior said he was sorry, and it was just an order, but you couldn't tell that from his face. Chu looked around at the situation, with Huang on one side and the three warriors that arrived with him on the other. A difficult situation for him, but Chu is ready to go all the way. This balance of power was clearly not in Chu's favor. He, taking advantage of the moment, decided to remove the rope from his leg, which could prevent further fighting. Huang took a stand and prepared to continue the battle. He was committed to his goal and was going to get the young master home one way or another. Spiritual power began to concentrate around him. Chu, having dealt with the rope, also began to prepare for a serious and difficult battle, concentrating the energy around him, ready to attack at any moment. One of the warriors who had previously thrown a stick at Chu also began to concentrate energy, preparing in turn to strike and disarm Chu. Still, no one was going to kill anyone here. Chu was in accordance with strong warriors around him, and he had not yet recovered his abilities enough to deal with them without straining. Just as suddenly, the tension of the battle was broken by an old man guide who was leaning on the shoulder of an unknown man walking towards Chu. The gazes of all present crossed on the newcomer. When he reached Chu, the old man bowed deeply to him, showing respect and gratitude. He was very concerned about this matter, and he would not forgive himself if he did not do so. Chu was embarrassed. 
for he had not done anything special. But the man who turned out to be the old man's son hastened to assure him that saving a life was not nothing. If it wasn't for Chu, this old man would have really died. His gratitude to Chu was genuine. He was completely embarrassed and couldn't find the right words to respond in any way. Satyricus said that he really wanted to thank him, so he mustered up the courage to follow the celestial squad. All the more, everyone who had been rescued from captivity by Chu was also very grateful to him. They had managed to escape successfully after all. And by defeating the gang of nine dragons, Chu saved the lives of hundreds of people, not only the hostages, but also their families. And those who might be caught by the bandits in the future. Having said all he wanted, the old man said goodbye and left with his son. While Chu stood pensive and reasoned that still he had spent too much spiritual energy, he did not notice how a rope was thrown over him, which began to entangle his body. A horse-drawn wagon and five horsemen were riding along the road, returning from a successful mission to find a young gentleman. The bound Chu was inside the wagon trying to shout to Huang. He has the peace and tranquility of Murim in his hands. How could Huang not realize this? Huang agreed with everything that was said, as if he were talking to a child or a mentally ill person. But he had orders to bring Chu home, and all assurances of seriousness from Chu he simply ignored. Chu's plan went awry. He was going to avoid Huang before the chaos servant showed up. But now he was caught right in his hands, and with each passing second, he was getting farther away from his goal. Huang only looked condescendingly at his young master, advising him to rest properly while he took care of the rest. Huang casually extended his hand towards Chu. The latter didn't even notice the catch, as Huang touched his head with the palm of his hand, plunging him into sleep with the help of the technique and cutting Chu off half a word. Chu continued to mumble something inarticulately began to fall on his back asleep with a special spiritual technique. And now the consciousness has completely left Chu. One of the accompanying warriors was surprised that a young gentleman with such a childish face had enough strength to defeat a gang of mountain bandits alone. Huang, on the other hand, asked that the report not mention that Chu played a key role in defeating the Nine Dragons. Fame in Mary May is hard to obtain, but the more fame, the more trouble on the head of the one who is famous. Huang indeed treasured his young master. He did not wish such a fate for him. Unfortunately, he did not know what actually awaited Chu in the future. Conditioned to say that the mountain bandits were dealt with by Jin, it was a false name that Chu used on his journey. This way the public attention would not be directed at him. Chu did not hear all this conversation. He was in the realm of sleep, lying in the measured swaying wagon that took him home. At the same time in the cave under the waterfall, where Chu dug up ginseng, there were several people. They were too late, and could only find a hole in the ground where the plant had recently been. The servant of chaos collapsed to his knees, looking at the blasted earth. His attendants were disturbed by this behavior of their master. They were already trying to approach him. The servants were interrupted by their master's voice. The virgin ginseng that was meant for their young master disappeared. A dark aura began to thicken around the white-haired man. A wave of anger washed over the man, and the dark aura grew denser and denser, disturbing the servants with a heavy atmosphere. Silence reigned in the cave. As a friend, the white-haired man completely stopped controlling his anger, and it began to seep out, pressurizing the people gathered there. The servants took a step back. They suddenly began to gasp, clutching at their throats, as if trying to remove the invisible grip that began to choke them with a steel vice. One by one, they began to collapse to the floor. With a great effort, one of the servants managed to call out the head of their organization. At this rate, he would just kill them. With each passing moment, the pressure grew, bringing the death of his subordinates closer. But suddenly, the head of the organization calmed down. The pressure disappeared, and there was no more reminder of what had happened here a second ago. The dark aura dissipated, returning the cave to its former appearance. The servant was able to breathe easy. Now that the pressure was off, the danger was over. Having collected his thoughts, the head called out to one of his subordinates, who immediately responded readily to his head. Slowly rising to his feet, the head said the obvious thing. A thief has been here. Ginseng was missing. He needed to return to the Golden Palace and help the young master. He assigned his servant to search for the unknown thief. He had to find him, 
return the ginseng at any cost, even if he had to cut his stomach open, and then to beat all his relatives' friends and relatives of friends. Chu sat in the cart and gave in to despondency. He had a chance to kill the servant of chaos right there at the place where the ginseng was growing, but now the moment was gone. He could have lived the rest of his life in prosperity and without worrying about anything, but the cursed Huang had ruined everything, and now he would have to suffer to achieve his goal. Huang informed Chu that they were almost there, and there was also a letter from his father that he couldn't wait any longer and went to meet them. All of Chu's complaints he simply ignored. In the end, the moment is gone, and there is no point in going back. At least Chu's plan worked halfway. He was able to lead the ginseng from under their noses. They were approaching the capital of the prefecture, Hefei City. The long journey by wagon was almost over. Chu had only seen training halls since the arrival of Chaos, so something like this was new to him. It was a large city with a water canal running through the entire city, right through the center of it. The city was beautiful and well-maintained. This was the first time Chu had seen such a thing. Peaceful streets where people were quietly trading. They went from counter to counter and bought things that they would like. Street actors gave performances for all comers. Having finally arrived at their destination, Huang decided to untie Chu on the condition that he would not run away. Chu's body was stiff, and it seemed that just a little more, and he would have died in that cramped carriage. Chu stood in front of the imperial gate looking at the architecture. All of this was clearly in line with the confidence level of the Namgung family. Already about to pass through the gate, Chu was stopped by the gatekeeper, who blocked his way with his sword. A familiar situation for Chu, but this time everything was bypassed in the courtyard appeared Chu's father that gave the order to let the arrivals inside. Seeing his father, he had a smile on his face. What a loving man all the worries about his son directly written on his face. Chu decided that, at least this time will portray himself as an exemplary son, spreading his arms wide. He wanted to hug his father, as he, with a red face of anger, passed Miam in the direction of Huang. Huang pounced on Huang and began to ask where he had taken Chu, as he had said in his letter that they were going together. Did Huang really think he was fooling him? Chu's father's anger did not subside but Huang still managed to squeeze out the words, pointing at Chu with his hand. Looking back at Chu, he did not recognize him and continued to shake Huang by the chest. How dare he mock him, because this puny and smarmy robber cannot be his son. Chu decided to correct the situation, turning to his father and denoting his kinship with him. Huang still spoke the truth. He looked at Chu with wide open eyes and couldn't believe if it was his son. Having shaken out their Huang's whole soul, he let him go after all. Chu smiled at him affably, and his father still could not believe that the man in front of him was his son. Could it really be his son? Coming closer, all Chu's father could say was to ask why. Oh, these people. His son comes back from a trip and he starts in on it. Deep night Namgung Manor. The full moon was shining in the sky, its silver disc illuminating the night beauty of the city, giving it some mystery. Inside the house, in one of the rooms, three people were dialoguing. One of those warriors was giving an account of the events that had taken place. He said that according to the original version, it was all the work of a man named Jin. But in reality, young Mr. Chu had dealt with all the bandits alone. One of the men with the distinct traits of the Namgung clan was surprised, coping alone with a horde of brigands. But the information was verifiable. The man still couldn't believe it. Perhaps the warriors were mistaken. But no, it was really so even more when they tried to detain him. Chu successfully resisted that they were barely given to capture him. The younger man tried to object, blaming it on the negligence of the head of the celestial squad and Huang's bodyguard, stating that he wouldn't believe such nonsense. But the head of the celestial squad disagreed. They had let all but lethal methods be used to capture the young master but the man still refused to believe. The elder Namgung began to press his son's shallowness, that he had missed such a talented young man, that he had grown all the more handsome since he had lost weight. How then can you call a man who believed some rumors and now denies the obvious facts? The man stood up from the table, determined to settle the question of marriage himself, and forbade his son to meddle in the matter in any way. The next day, three people were gathered around the table, Chu, his father, and the elder Nam Gung. 
The elders were talking over a bowl of hot drink. Chu sat and in his thoughts resented the situation, not only that these people drink early in the morning, but also for some reason strain him. But then his thoughts were interrupted by his father's offer to take the state exam. Chu did not have the slightest desire to take on unnecessary obligations. He still had a world to save. Suddenly, Nam Gung decided to make a proposal, drawing attention to himself. He began to say that military service will only ruin Chu's talent, where he can become at most a general. There is not the same training. Chu didn't know what this grandpa was getting at, but he was already liking it. Chu's father listened attentively to his speech. In the end, he offered to find Chu an outstanding teacher, which would allow him to develop his skills to unprecedented heights and go down in history as the savior of the state. The last words impressed Chu's father very much. He always wanted the best for his son, perhaps even too much. However, Father Chu could not understand where they could find such a teacher, but as it turned out to look for no one and no need, because such a teacher is just in front of them. Nam Gung Chan, the King of Swords, and past head of the Nam Gung Kalan. Such a person would definitely be able to cut down Chu's talent according to his own beliefs. At least Chan believed that. Chu sat and listened with a satisfied look. Surely a martial arts genius that could single-handedly defeat mountain brigands would be an enviable apprentice for any master. Chu thought about his possible apprenticeship, still unlike the nine schools they make a good impression. The Nam Gung family, one of the most illustrious families. Chu thought about the fact that with the name Nam Gung Kalan, he will be able to achieve a lot in the world of Murima, and there will be an opportunity to distance himself from the Yu family. Chu only has to convince his father of this. But as it turned out, he was glad that Chan was ready to become a teacher for his son. He literally radiated happiness and gratitude. The two agreed without any trouble. They had even managed to share the kinship over Chu. Yes, so much so that Chan recognized Chu as his son. Chu's father said that he was worried when he became aware of the worries on the emperor's soul. But now that Chang agreed to look after Chu, he was much happier and relieved. Chang reasoned that the emperor's anxiety must be related to what he thought about the future of the throne. In that case, the emperor wishes Wang to be near his heir, for the latter is a scholar and can teach the future emperor much. Still, the emperor has great confidence in him. It is time for Chu's father to go back. He is already sitting in the carriage, admonished his son to obey his uncle and try to train. Chu's father kept on and on, admonishing him. The whole situation was turning into a kind of farce. But now the carriage moved and Chu's torment seemed to be over. As out of the map looked out, his father and Huang continued to wave to him as the carriage moved away. Chu was already anxious for them to leave. He was very embarrassed. But still, it was nice for Chu to feel such love and attention for himself. It was something he had been deprived of in his first life. Uncle Chu suddenly turned to him and told him to follow him, walking forward, showing him the way. Chu couldn't understand if the training would start like this right away. Only he had time to say goodbye to his father. They moved through the clan territory together. All the people they met bowed and smiled at Mr. Chan. They were obviously happy to see him. Chu was interested in seeing his former head in this way. After a while, they began to approach a staircase that led somewhere upwards. The stairs were guarded by two guards who stood on the edges. But when they saw Mr. Chan, they did not even think to stop them. They climbed the wall, which encloses the city from the outside world. The wall was quite high, and from it they had a fine view of the picturesque surroundings. Upon reaching the roof above one section of the wall, Chan simply walked on air, which was expected of a current sword king, a walk of great emptiness. Not even his past teacher possessed a walk of this level. Standing on the roof, Chan stared at Chu, urging him to climb up after him. Chu thought about it. He couldn't use some techniques right now as there would be a lot of unnecessary questions. So Chu just decided to jump onto the roof. Crouching down and storing energy in his legs, he prepared to jump. It was quite easy, and there would be no unnecessary questions. Chu was able to jump onto the roof without any problems, standing next to his Uncle Chan. All that remained was to understand why they had come here. Chan, on the other hand, didn't skimp on complimenting his ability to handle his body. 
As they approached the edge of the roof that was facing the opposite direction to the city, they both froze, and Chan started a dialogue. He asked how many places Chan had visited, according to Chu. Chu tensed up. Was this really a vigilance test? He was too relaxed, but Chang continued. He said he had visited only 64 places, and they all belonged to the Nam Gung family. The words Nam Gung family caught Chu's attention, but he couldn't understand. At the same time, Chang continued, asking him to look in the direction indicated. His finger pointed to a building in the distance. It was a gazebo on a hillside. Then Chan drew his finger from place to place, as if drawing a boundary invisible to the eye, delineating the territory that he wanted to show. Everything Chu saw appeared to be the property of the Nam Gung family. It turned out to be quite a lot. His family covered a large area of territory. The city that was below them was very beautiful in the rays of the setting sun. Chu couldn't understand what Chan was getting at. He continued to marvel at the vastness of his family's domain, as if implying something. Chu had a false sense of anxiety. Chan asked Chu what he thought of what he saw in front of him. Chu didn't understand at all what this old man was getting at. Was this some kind of test or something else? Chu wondered, does Chang really want him to run back and forth? Some sort of demonstration of his skills at moving, a demonstration of speed, Chu tried to guess. What a troublesome old man, thought Chu, already preparing for the dash, to drop out just to prove the strength of his abilities. Crouching down for a low start, Chu began to infuse his legs with spiritual energy. But he was interrupted by Chan's voice, which spoke of the beauty and wealth of these places. From this, Chu stumbled, his foot slipped, throwing off his balance, and he fell shamefully, hitting his head. Chu decided to recognize the inadequacy of his mental abilities and turned to Chan for clarification. He had completely lost the meaning of this conversation. Chan smiled kindly and looked at Chu and told him that he was leading to the fact that some of this land could be his. Chu was very surprised at such words. This land could belong to him. He thought they had come here for training, not for a geography lesson on Kalan Namgung. Chang continued smiling, said that there is nothing to be surprised about, because once Chu marries high, he will give some of it all as a dowry. A very tempting offer, Chan thought. Chu was shocked to hear this. Did he really come here just for this conversation? Chan only confirmed that they were only here for that. Chu was speechless. After all, what did he expect from a man who was trying his best to seduce him and marry him off to his granddaughter? Chan thought that Chu's hesitation was due to the fact that Hai herself wouldn't want to marry him, going on to say that he could convince her, and Chu shouldn't worry. Not wanting to listen to him anymore, Chu walked to the edge of the roof and jumped down. What nonsense. He thought not intending to have a family anytime soon. Chu managed to land softly on the ground using spiritual power to dampen the speed of the fall and not break something. And Chu rushed to run away from Chan and this conversation. He didn't need all of this. What he needed was to become stronger, and family life wouldn't give him that. But Chan wasn't going to let him go so easily and rushed after him. Chu was fast, but Chan was still faster. Convinced that he had offered too little, he began to persuade Chu on the run, promising him a great deal. Realizing there was no point in running, Chu stopped, determined to clear up any loose ends. Chu was not going to get married, despite all the riches promised to him. Chu began to make arguments for the misunderstanding. Chan, he is the son of the Yu family, who already owns a lot of territory, and they are favored by the emperor himself, and the merchants are willing to do almost anything for them. Thus, there was no point in Chu marrying for the sake of property. Finished with the conversation, Chu made it clear that Chan should forget about the wedding. He generally expected the latter to teach him martial arts, not to propose a wedding. But Chan did not give up. Who not he, who has achieved everything with his sword, can overcome any obstacles? He did not take into account that Chu was already born with a golden spoon in his mouth, so to offer him silver makes no sense. Chan did a set of blows from one technique trying to impress Chu. His movements were smooth, but at the same time and sharp. Chu wasn't happy that he was doing something he didn't understand early in the morning. Do all old people really get up so early, Chu pondered. Finished with the demonstration, Chan asked Chu how he liked what he saw. It was the art of the royal sword something that would have impressed anyone but not Chu. Seeing Chu's unimpressed face, Chang decided to show him something else. He threw his sword. 
It was a sword technique of curbing energy. The sword obeyed its master's will and began to chop the trees that were in the department's training ground. Chu only cared that such trees are probably expensive. Breathing heavily, Chang tried to regain his breath and asked if Chu was impressed this time. These battle drills are only betrayed to direct descendants. Chan promised Chu if he married Hai, he could have all his knowledge. While he was talking, Chu was gone. He wasn't going to hear about the wedding again. Chan was already desperate. He was offering knowledge that only direct descendants possess. It was impossible to learn even for money. But Chu was deaf to his entreaties. Chan decided to offer Chu to learn something of the Namgung family's martial arts. But to Chu's eyes, there was nothing of the sort in them. Hearing this, Chan laughed loudly. Chang thought that although Chu was talented, he had only recently begun to learn martial arts, and that he was simply not seeing the whole picture of what was going on, not realizing the true power of his art. Chu offered to demonstrate that he would have no trouble demonstrating what he had seen today. If Chu showed he didn't want it, maybe then Chan would let him go. He picked up a stick from the floor, intending to use it as a sword. Chu had learned enough of the art of Nam Gung that he was beaten with it. Chu began to swing the twig as if trying to remember how Chan did it, only to be puzzled by it. But then Chu became more serious and began to repeat one by one what he showed Chan without making a single mistake. He was able to perform the art of the royal sword, causing Chan's amazement. But then Chan abruptly stopped Chu. He was angry because Chu could not learn this style. Then how does he know it? It bothered him a lot. But Chu, with an innocent face, assured that it was Chan himself who taught him. It was as if he was struck by lightning. He was actually showing Chu this technique. Chan was amazed. Chu had only had to take one look to learn the art of the royal sword. He had clearly underestimated Chu, that heaven-sent genius. Chan hovered immersed in his thoughts, thinking that Chu was a genius like no other. Chu tried to call out to Chan, but he continued to stand there without even blinking. Chu was fed up with just standing there and decided to leave. Throwing the stick away, he went on with his business. Now he won't have to marry anyone. Chang's got the idea to marry him off to Hai, after all. This guy is clearly worth the effort. Chang should get him by any means necessary. At the same time, three men in wide straw hats arrived in the city. They were the servants of Chaos who had lost the ginseng and were now looking for the thief. Going closer to the center of town, they decided to split up and continue their search one by one to expand their reach. They followed Chu's path by bribing the tavern owner where he was staying. They were able to find out that the thief's name was Jin, but didn't realize that it was a fake name that Chu had used. The boy stood in front of the manor looking for his uncle Chu. He still hadn't shown up at the training ground for some reason. Chu walked out of the building and turned his attention to his nephew. He was calling out to him for a training session he was supposed to do. But Chu wasn't interested, so he decided to send the guy to study on his own. But the kid was persistent. Before, Chu would have been frightened by that look, but now his teacher was in a way even nice. The guy was starting to boil over. He didn't like Chu at all, even though he had heard from his uncle that he was incredibly talented. So what if Chu was able to replicate a technique he had only seen once? Looking at the yawning Chu, he kept thinking that a true master was not only outstanding physical data, but also diligent training of inner strength. The guy couldn't feel Chu's windy energy. And Chu himself had enough of standing there and went back to the house. He wanted to continue his rest. The guy was totally pissed off. He had spoken nicely so far, so his esteemed uncle should go after him. Chu's past teacher dug his own grave with his own hands. Chu will be able to get even on him. And then Chu had a great idea. Maybe they could switch places and he could educate a student. An evil smile crept onto Chu's lips. Chu decided to explain that he couldn't teach him anything new, so he was the one who was going to teach him. The guy is completely pissed off now. He calls Chu uncle and has manners. But where does Chu get so much arrogance from? Chu was amused by the situation. Guy decided to beat Chu and drag him to practice by force, in which he could only wish him luck, which Chu did by calling him nephew. The guy was totally pissed off by the way Chu addressed him. Although Chu didn't show it, he just called his nephew a prisoner. So what's the big deal? The guy went off the roof. He began to shout at Chu, accusing him of unprecedented impudence shamelessness, which is so huge that can pierce the heavens. Chu was in a daze. After he actively provoked him, all he heard was the words about impudence. 
For something like that, a stronger word could have been called. Looking at the bent face of the guy, Chu thought that he just swallowed his provocation, although he could barely hold back. Perhaps he should have continued and finally pissed him off. Chu decided to push on. His nephew had already switched to non-formal communication. Chu noticed this and spit under his feet, causing another tirade about insolence. The guy was shaking with anger, but did not know what to do. No one had ever insulted him, and he had never swore. So what to do in such a situation, he had no idea. Chu remembered how Song swore every day when he was teaching him, coming up with more and more insults towards Chu. So Chu thought he was used to scolding since he was still in diapers. No one could defeat Song on swords, so he still got the nickname of the Sword King of the Seven Senses. There are seven senses, seven emotions in every human being. Sun was the man who brought them together and formed a martial art. Perhaps that was the reason why he used to beat Chu in the mornings when he was in a bad mood. And after a good lunch, Chu would receive a beating from a laughing Sung because of his good mood. When it rained and Sung was sad, he was Chu because he was sad. It was very difficult for Chu because try to adjust to the character of a person whose mood changes 12 times a day. And what now? Now Chu saw in front of him a cultured gentleman that with all his might restrains his emotions. And after all, he rose to the top by elevating his emotions to the absolute. Chu didn't want one of Marima's characters to disappear, but he couldn't just fix the situation. Now he would have to change Sun's character. Chu had a hard job ahead of him, but he was not saddened by it. On the contrary, a frightening smile and a creepy expression on his face was his answer to the difficulties. Sleep did not understand what Chu was burning about, but Chu decided not to explain everything unnecessarily. Now he would beat him, and he would have to understand everything himself. Chu jerked closer to the guy. Song recognized this movement, the footsteps of the heavenly wind. How dare a pathetic wannabe be so insolent? Song decided to show what was authentic and what was fake. Sun threw a whole bunch of punches at Chu, attacking without respite. But Chu had no problem dodging all of his blows. It was time for Chu to strike. Pirouetting in the air, Chu attacked him with his foot so that Sung was thrown off. But Sung managed to block Chu's lancer, avoiding serious damage. At the same time, Chu continued to taunt him, criticizing his defense. Chu continued his assault on Sung. He reduced the distance in one dash and prepared to attack again. Sung concentrated, infusing his puka with spiritual energy and prepared to counterattack and force Chu to retreat. As Song suddenly sensed something wrong, Chu decided to strike with spiritual energy as well, gathering it in his fist. He rushed towards Sung and was already ready to strike. The distance between them was rapidly decreasing. Chu had a wide smile on his face. Sung recognized that punch. It was the way he had once attacked Chu. The block and the punch collided. The clash of spiritual power had begun. Sung held on with all his might, but Chu's pressure was too strong. He wouldn't be able to hold back this punch. After a moment, Chu's fist pushed back Sung's defense and went straight for his face. Sung was amazed at the way Chu played the fight, took advantage of his mistake, and immediately launched a devastating attack. Chu's fist reached Sung's face. The essence of the technique was that there was a burst of energy as it reached the target, increasing the strength of the strike, just like Nam Gung's fist technique. Thunderous explosion! A powerful explosion of energy swept through Sona's theme like the blast wave from a real explosion. A rumbling sound like thunder rumbled in all directions. Sun's body steamed off in a rapid flight, stopping only when he reached one of the walls that he actually crashed into. Shards of the structure flew in all directions. Sleep lay behind the broken wall, surrounded by shards and parts of the wall. He was exhausted, but still conscious. All Sun had the strength to do was mutter insults at Chu. After gathering his strength, he still managed to get up on his elbow. Song had heard that Chu was talented, but did he really only need one look to memorize how to control the chi in the body? Was this really a heaven-sent talent? When Song had already lifted himself off the ground, Chu came over to him, saying that this wasn't the end, and he had more to teach him. Chu started beating Song with tears in his eyes. Song couldn't even imagine how long Chu had waited for this moment. Thinking back to the time when the now adult Sung had beaten Chu himself, he felt like he was restoring justice. Chu was glowing from the significance of this moment, 
as he continued beating Song, who was lying on the ground. Sung, unable to bear the pain of the beating, began to call Chu, son of a bitch. Bastard, it seemed to him that he was about to die from the pain. As Chu suddenly stopped for a second, he was happy, for his student had finally realized how to vent anger. What Sung was feeling right now was anger. Chu was now in his teacher's place, and his teacher was in his place. Tears of joy flowed from Chu's eyes. After his words, Chu continued to be a screaming Sung, that he was no longer holding back in his expressions and was screaming profanity, not realizing what was wrong with this crazy bastard. Finished with the training, Chu decided to end the lesson with a strong uppercut that docked poor Sun in the air. Sung passed out. Weak, Chu thought. Maybe I should have fed him the remaining precious spiritual plants. But to find the second spiritual treasure, Chu had to find one guy. The one who knew the whereabouts of the second spiritual treasure was Doxum, who should soon be in the Chanmu Union prison. And his meeting with the Servant of Chaos should happen in six months. It would be then that the Servant of Chaos would have to search for the spiritual treasure. And then, when he comes to Doxum, Chu will appear at the right moment and blow his head off his shoulders, preventing the arrival of chaos in its very beginnings. In that case, Chu's suffering will be over and he will be able to live a normal life, but there is no guarantee that some unforeseen variable will not appear. Finished thinking, Chu lifted the unconscious Sung up. He still had work to do. Chu slung him on his shoulder, continuing his thoughts to be ready for all sorts of surprises he would have to bring up his damn teachers, just in case. Sleep regained consciousness and immediately screamed. He thought he was having a terrible nightmare where he was being beaten unconscious, but it wasn't a nightmare. He kept thinking how evil a person had to be to beat a person so badly. But nothing Sun can still get back at him. He will go to any lengths to exact vengeance. While Sung was saying all his thoughts, Chu entered the room. He was interested in Sung's words about revenge. He tried to refuse, but Chu clearly heard everything. Meanwhile, Chu came closer to Sung's bed and complained to him that he was too flimsy. Only a couple of blows and he'd been lying uncreated for half a day. Chu pleased Zheng by explaining to the elders that their bout was sparring. Seon was strongly disagreeing with the definition of sparring for that torture, but voiced his decision to wisely say nothing. Chan appreciated Chu's potential and that he could help his nephew become stronger. Chu told about another happy news now they will train together, as Chu is better than him and can teach him a lot. So now Sung and Chu are together alone. From that moment on, their training began. Chu systematically beat Sung over and over again for ten days. For ten days, Sung endured the beatings without being able to somehow put up a decent resistance to Chu. But finally, Sung began to show progress, getting more invested in his punches when he was enraged. Sung was finally putting enough spiritual energy into his strikes. In just a few days, he had learned how to put anger into his sword. Still, only by pushing a person to the limit could one achieve rapid development. At this point, Chu decided to end his anger infusion training, dodging Sun's next, but already more successful attack, Chu thought. It was time to move on to the anger retrieval training. With that, Chu delivered a kick to Sung's chin. Chu Song flew into the air from the blow. The impact was strong enough, but not strong enough to knock Song out or cause serious damage. But to consolidate the effect of the training, Chu decided to make a couple more blows with his fists as punishment for the missed blow. But then Sun's eyes flashed fire, and Chu felt that he clearly made a breakthrough in understanding what he taught Chu. Sun twisted around and tried to throw a powerful punch at Chu, but Chu had no problem dodging it. But he was still surprised. Sun was frustrated. He was full of hope that at least this time he would be able to punish his tormentor. However, Chu did not let him get upset for long. He was already standing behind his back with his fist raised to strike. Here he was afraid. Sun already imagined the pain from the blow. But suddenly Chu did not beat him, suggesting instead to go for a walk outside the gate. Sung wondered where Chu was going, but hesitated as he realized he had interrupted his favorite uncle. Chu thought to teach him a lesson for his insolence, but Sung quickly oriented himself, courteously giving way in front so that he could escort Chu wherever he wished. On the street, a beggar in shabby clothes was sitting among the market stalls, collecting alms from people who cared about him. On his head was a straw hat that covered his face. Suddenly, someone approached him and threw a silver coin into the alms bowl, thus drawing the beggar's attention to himself. 
The beggar thanked the benefactor, and the man asked only to speak to him a little as a thank you. The man said that it was his first time in this city, and he had no friends here yet. At the same time, with the help of a special technique that hides words, he reported to his commander, who was hiding under the guise of a beggar, that there was no one with the name Jin in Nam Gung Manor. Pretending to continue the friendly dialogue, the commander under the guise of a beggar interjected, Strangely, the man named Jin is not there and was not there. The subordinate continued his report, although there was no person named Jin in the manor, there was one person who appeared there, just right for the time of appearance. He continued speaking, saying that it was Yu Chu, Yu Wan's only son, who was currently still in the manor. Spoiled was interested in further instructions. How should they proceed? Should they call for reinforcements? Chu and Song walked out of the Nam Gung Manor and headed deeper into the city, heading in a direction only known to Chu alone. In a strange coincidence, they just passed by two chaos servants talking, which was just what Chu was discussing. In the end, the chaos intelligence commander decided to deal with everything with the forces he had now. He did not want to anger his master. No one wanted to take up their chapter's time, and so Chu was put under surveillance in order to clarify information about the thief. After finishing their conversation, the two men also decided to end their concert, which they had arranged to separate the attention. It was time to move out, and immediately. The subordinate left, and the commander himself also began to pack. He still had a lot of things to do, especially since he should have personally supervised everything. The beggar was watched by two men. They kept the neighborhood, but this ragamuffin did not pay them anything, even though he received a huge alms. They had no way of knowing that he was not a simple, homeless man. Chu had bought a large number of books containing sad and touching stories that Sung was now carrying. As long as Sung was born into a rich family, he couldn't taste the poverty and pain of his relatives. And for training, he needs to know this feeling. After finishing his explanation to Song, Chu decided it was time for them to go see a Beijing opera, something freakishly funny. That Song realized what they would be doing next, his mood visibly rose. A dreamy smile appeared on his face. Joy gives calmness to the soul and prevents anger and sadness from overwhelming a person, Chu admonished. Sona wondered whether it was possible to see using such simple methods. Chu went on to explain that only one who possesses calmness can expand his horizons. Thus, it is possible to improve the understanding of the enemy and his movements. A beggar sneaked into the theater that he had been following Chu. Now that he could get a better look at him, he realized that Chu was most likely the one who had stolen the ginseng. A group of people concealed by cloaks and wide hats were making their way through a field where crops were sprouting. This group should attack Chu and Song. Their task was to secretly infiltrate the city, eliminate the target in the person of the Namgung heir, and Chu was to be their commander. The main thing they had to do was to do it secretly. But the commander was caught by the local bandits who were covering for the local beggars. At the noise drew the attention of Chu and Song. Looking around, they could see a group of people gangster appearance. This group was heading towards the beggar, planning to show him what happens to those who don't pay for the space they occupy. The commander had to cancel the operation. The group of warriors stopped, hiding in a field of tall vegetation. The commander was very unhappy. What a bad time to be picked on by the local bandits. The problem was that he couldn't reveal himself. The bandits, however, kept accusing him and were about to muzzle him. They surrounded the commander, taking him in a ring. He couldn't reveal himself, so he was going to have to give himself a beating if he didn't want to fail the mission. The bandits rushed towards the beggar with their fists, intending to explain the rules of the world in this simple way. A beggar was knocked to the ground and beaten up. Sung noticed this and suggested to Chu to break up the fighting, because it is mean to attack a crowd on one. But Chu was not going to interfere, because justice does not always prevail in the world, as in the books. This city is controlled by Namgung, but such small gangs are almost never dealt with, so they will still share this alley. These were very low-level gangsters, not related to the world of Murim in any way, so there was definitely no point in them getting involved. Simply put, it's just another squabble between bandits over territory, Chu finished intoxicating what was happening. And as soon as Chu and Sleep left, the bandits were covered in an ominous aura, they lay to beat the beggar stopped. As suddenly one of their bandits flew out of the crowd from a hard hit. Now hiding the commander of the chaos forces was gone. 
and it dawned on the bandits that they were in trouble. From the beaten beggar commander began to actively emanate evil power. The bandits began to pivot back, but they were already surrounded by people in dark cloaks. Ordering no one to interfere, the commander was going to deal with these lowlifes, beatings which he had to endure, and the leader of the bandits in fright ordered to attack the unknown beggar. The commander leans threateningly in front of the bandit leader. The man immediately looks at the man in bewilderment, unsure if he has just been seriously injured, as the energy in him still resounds strongly. The commander uttered in a frightening voice that this was a one-in-a-million chance and that there shouldn't be a single, even minor slip-up in their grand plan. The bandit leader immediately bowed to the man on his knees and begged to be spared. The commander says menacingly that the only way to be held accountable for his actions is death. His eyes immediately glowed red and his face darkened. The commander immediately places his hand on the gang leader's head, and immediately afterward, a horrible sound is heard. The people around watch in horror and fear at what is happening. The commander told his subordinates to deal with the gang in front of them and that they should leave no trace behind them. They immediately responded with a brief assent to the order given to them. Immediately, sprays of blood flew to the sides. At the same time, a man ran through a field of wheat. A strong wind was blowing across the field, causing the spikelets to dance in the wind. The man immediately turned to the leader, Wang Tiol, with the words that these people were not vagabonds at all. He immediately shouted with all his might that he needed to report this information to the Caban branch. The man immediately rushed forward, cleaving the air and breaking the plants around him. As soon as father finished reading the letter, he cried out in anger that why would they not come to them? He clutched the letter he had received with force. The father is immediately answered about what the girl said about not being able to marry against her will. To this, the man only shouted in a frenzy to his companion to send the Celestial, and also to send them to the Chonmu Union and order them to bring them now. To this, the man only sighed tiredly and replied to father that Hai had already gone to the site of the faction battle. Here the man continues, saying that the girl made sure that the letter arrived after she had arrived father was simply furious at these words. He immediately began to shiver. The father immediately throws the table aside with all his might and yells at the man about how he could ever raise his children like that. But then the man remembers that father himself told him that he would raise the girl to be a warrior woman who would represent the Namgung family. Father replies with a calm tone in his voice that there's nothing to be done and that since Hai won't come, it means they need to send Hyun to the Jeonmu Alliance. And so a man with a satisfied expression on his face galloped down the road to the palace with his hands folded behind his back. He was in an elevated mood. He was whistling some obscure tune. But immediately, he hears someone's loud shout with a bellowing. Immediately, father thought it was an intrusion. He deftly jumps over the high fence. The man's gaze drifts off into the distance noticing familiar and slightly blurred silhouettes. He is immediately surprised to find himself still raised in the air. Once he was down on the ground, he continued to watch the two guys that appeared to be fighting. Just then, the familiar screams of the guys came out. Chu immediately shouted to Sun about putting more than just anger into his sword strike, and that he should try sadness this time. Immediately, Chu shouted for Sun to remember the recent affair, and how he felt the moment the protagonist died. Father himself was surprised from the fact that his nephew Sung was being beaten up. Immediately after Chu's request, Sung remembered and cried bitterly. The boy immediately started sniffling loudly, and tears flowed from his eyes. He immediately swung his sword. To the surprise of everyone present, the sword that was in Sun's hands immediately shimmered and began to glow with a bright yellow light. Sun was immediately surprised because the energy emanating from the sword was like the energy filled with curbed anger. The old father was watching all this, and Chu noticed it immediately. He immediately wondered in his mind, asking himself rhetorically what the old man was doing here. Chu immediately yelled for Sung to stop. The guy immediately dodges the punch and raises his left arm. To all of this, 
Sung only looked at the guy standing in front of him with some resentment and anger in his eyes. He lightly bit his lower lip. Sun immediately swore loudly and exclaimed that everything was fine just now and that he could also hit his opponent on the head. The guy immediately started waving his sword in all directions with a displeased expression on his face. The father immediately wondered if his grandson Song was swearing. The man immediately covered his mouth with his hand because he was a little surprised by this. But father immediately switches from those thoughts because Chu asked him a question about what the man was doing here. To this, father only laughed awkwardly. The man then replies that he found Chu and Sung's training so fascinating that he just kept watching from afar and not disturbing them. To this, Chu only replied that father could have just walked into the courtyard and watched normally. To this, the man only awkwardly replied that that was it, and walked into the courtyard. The man immediately remembered that it was also his house, and that it was strange to tell him that he didn't want to go in. The father immediately turned to his nephew Chu with a question because it was revealed to him that he had just trained his grandson's son in the sword. To this, Chu calmly replied that this was impossible because according to him, they were just sparring. At this weighty statement, Sung himself was already surprised because Uncle Chu had indeed trained him, and the guy didn't understand at all why he was saying such things. At these words of his nephews, father replied to Chu that just now, Song's style was different from the familiar basics of the Nam Gung family, and if the guy was not taught this new technique by anyone, then how did he learn about it and was able to apply it? But then Chu, still in a calm voice, says that this method was suggested by Sung himself, to which Sung himself with these words falls into the astral. He was very shocked because he had no idea what his Uncle Chu was saying. Father himself was no less surprised, but he was still able to control his emotions. At such a strong reaction of the guy, Chu told Sun to just keep quiet because he was starting to piss him off with his antics. Immediately, Chu holds out a wooden sword in front of him and explains that it was the seven senses technique. To this, father only asks in amazement what the seven sense technique was. Chu continued, saying that one day, Song told him that he had a big breakthrough and the guy had some sort of way of putting his feelings into his sword. At this point, Sung no longer understood at all what he was talking about. Father thought for a moment because putting feelings into a sword is a huge breakthrough. The man immediately chuckled happily and realization came to him, namely the realization that the sword of the Namgung family who rejected joy and any other change began to change as soon as it met the new century. But immediately, Chu pulls the man out of his thoughts again and asks him a question, namely what brought him here. But just as the man started to already answer the question the guy asked, he was immediately interrupted. The servant immediately says tiredly that the past head is also here. He immediately apologizes for having just interrupted their important conversation, but there was an urgent matter, namely that a man from the cabin branch had just arrived. Immediately father asks what business the man from Caban has come for. The servant immediately informs him that Caban had an accident during the night. Father immediately tells his nephew Chu that they will talk a little later because he just had some urgent business to attend to. After the man's words, immediately Sung tells Chu that he also has to go. At all of this, when everyone has already left, Chu thought in his mind, how can they be so similar even when they are looking, turning around? The thought crosses Chu's mind that he should take a walk down the street because he doesn't have much to do. Chu decided to do so. As he walked past the people, all the eyes of the surrounding people were fixed on him. He was clearly being followed. Just then, one of the men asked the commander how they should proceed. The commander immediately thought that there was no telling when they would get the chance again, so he orders his men to follow Chu. His men immediately responded by agreeing to the order given to them and started following. Immediately, the commander instructs his men to wait until Chu reaches a deserted place, and as soon as he is there, the guy should be surrounded and immediately dragged outside of Hefei. Immediately from all sides, began to shout people that their goods are sold cheaply and for nothing. Chu himself is thinking about how nice it is to stroll leisurely like this. The guy mentions that in Anping it was difficult for the reason that everyone recognized him, and yet despite that, the guy misses them just a little bit. 
The guy wondered if everyone was doing well there. And then Chu remembers that before he returns to Anping County so that everyone can continue to live peacefully as they do now, and before chaos ensues, he needs to do something. But immediately, Chu is thrown from his thoughts and notices something very strange. Chu notices a familiar face in the man who had just passed him. He was definitely sure that he had seen this man. But immediately, the guy discards these thoughts because he could have just bumped into him on the way. And only Chu wanted to look into the bookstore as he immediately noticed something wrong around him. Immediately walking towards Chu was a strange vendor with free cookies. He immediately told the guy to taste his baked goods, to which Chu happily agrees, but then immediately changes his face. But at this point, Chu is already well aware of what is going on around him because it was easy to notice a bunch of people who were watching him while he supposedly does not see anything. Chu immediately walking a little further notices a vagrant who was beaten to a pulp by Vera. The guy wondered if the man really thought he wouldn't be able to recognize him if he was wearing neat clothes. Immediately, the lad thinks of those words of the servant who spoke of Kaban's misfortune during the night. Chu immediately realizes that this so-called misfortune of these guys is the work of these guys. Unexpectedly for the man standing next to him, Chu starts to run towards him at high speed with a happy expression on his face. He immediately exclaims to him that what an unexpected encounter. At this point, all the people around that were following the commander's orders were a little surprised and shocked by the fact that the guy started acting suspiciously. Chu immediately rushed somewhere to the side in an attempt to hide from the people who were following him. People immediately ran after the guy in a crowd, trying to keep him in their sights. Someone alone immediately yelled for everyone to run that way. But what was their surprise when the place they ran to was just an ordinary dead end in a nook? One of the people said that Chu had definitely run around that corner. Everyone immediately started looking around for the guy, but suddenly they heard someone's voice behind them asking them who they were. Everyone immediately started turning around at the voice. Chu continued with a smile on his face, saying that he was very curious to know the reason why he was being chased by a huge crowd of men. Everyone immediately started looking at Chu, who was sitting on the roof of a nearby building. The guy immediately decided to make a joke about what is he really their type. He immediately smiled slyly, but the others didn't appreciate his joke and only became much more serious about their enemy. Chu immediately descended from the roof of the building and continued, saying that if he was not their type, then why were they all following him like rats? Chu asks them if he was the target last night, but they didn't answer his question. Immediately, Chu says with a grin on his face that he was right, judging by the faces of those weirdos. But then he asks them why they needed him. Chu also remarks that the remnants of the Nine Dragon Gang, or those who were looking for Jin Seng, are standing in front of him, and he wonders if they're a long way off. Immediately, the gang starts talking to each other, asking the others what they should do. The main one tells them that killing him would be much easier, but he is the son of the previous heir so they may have to deal with the government itself. But first, they need to make sure of something, namely whether the guy in front of them is the Jin Wigan that took the virgin Jin Seng. But Chu immediately makes an incomprehensible face and asks who else this Jin Wigan is and says that they obviously got the wrong house number. The man Nahumrisia and wondered if the guy really had nothing to do with it, but on the other hand, to get the virgin Jin Seng, then you need to reach at least the level of key release and above but the man felt absolutely nothing from this guy. In reality, Chu's body was trained by the strongest master of Kabang, and did this gang of men think that the guy would let him be so easy to figure out? Besides, this gang wouldn't be able to sense the spiritual energy, Chu. But if these guys had come all the way here in pursuit of Jinseng, then they must have something to do with the chaos servant. Chu immediately thought that then there was no point in bothering at all, and it would be easier to catch them and shake them all out. Immediately, the chief among this gang apologized to Chu, and that apparently they had some sort of misunderstanding. Chu laughingly sighs and says that they can't just take off. Namely for that reason, because Chu has become very curious about who these men are. But at this guy's words, the man only ordered his men to fell Chu. Immediately after this order, two men rushed towards Chu. Chu thought that in order to fell Chu, so to speak, he didn't launch any assassins, the guy smiled slyly. But with just one of his leg kicks, 
Chu was able to throw the two men immediately to the sides. They immediately fell to the floor with a loud sound. Chu smilingly asks them if he looks so weak in their eyes. Just then, the head man in the gang thinks about how it's even possible that a guy without a single grain of inner strength was able to do something like that. At this, Chu, as if reading his opponent's mind, asks him if he's really that surprised. At the same time, Chu slightly kicks the man who was lying on the ground at the time, and says that since these two got them, his business here is definitely over. The guy immediately turns his head to the man and asks him what he's going to do, if he's just going to take off. The man was furious. He called the guy a bastard. Chu was thinking that he would be really uncomfortable if all these men attacked him all at once. But then he thinks that on the other hand, what's the big deal? And that he should just change the course of the situation. Just then, Chu turns to face them and gives them a sly smile. He turns to these uncles, asking them if they want to hang out with him. With a deft move, Chu was able to pick up one of the men lying on the floor and quickly ran in the opposite direction from them. The men who were standing nearby immediately rushed to run after the guy. The man in charge immediately ordered them to run after him. And so one of the chief's servants began to catch up with Chu, who still continued to run with the man on his shoulder. And so the man behind swings at Chu for a blow with his sharp sword. The guy calmly notices it, but immediately Chu Loco dodges the blow, making a kind of sprint and lunge forward, thus dodging. Chu immediately began to look around and noticed the building that stood next to a huge horn. The guy thought that it would be just right for him, because he had already thought of something. Chu strained his arms hard and immediately threw the man's body somewhere in the air. When the man landed, he fell onto the roof of the building with a huge noise, thus breaking through the tiles. A wave of air immediately came from there, indicating the tremendous strength of the thrower. Concerned people immediately started running out of the building. There was fear on their faces and a complete lack of understanding of what was happening. Everyone immediately started shouting that the building had begun to collapse and that everyone in the building should run away. Chu himself had already managed to jump into the air and swung with all his might at the very horn of the building. Huge pieces of the building immediately scattered around the neighborhood. Where the building had stood before, there was nothing left. Chu had left no stone unturned. And only the chief and his subordinate managed to run to the place where Chu ran away, then immediately saw this terrible picture. Immediately Chu told them that this is not the end, and that these people were much faster than he thought. Chu continued by talking about whether the ringleader knew about one thing. The guy immediately fell silent, and there was silence all around him. Just then, a terrifying thought comes into the head of the leader. He immediately exclaims, If the guy in front of him is not an ordinary guy, as he thought, but exactly the one they were looking for. Immediately, Chu grinningly tells him that this man is in fact a naive fool and that he followed the guy all the way to Hefe. Immediately, his tone changes to a more mocking one, and Chu asks the uncle if he still wants to have fun with him, because the man's confidence is high because soon they will face not only Chu, but also Namgung and Kabang. The main man's gaze immediately becomes menacing and sinister. He was simply furious. The man pelted Chu with meanness, but the guy only calculated those words as a compliment to himself. And as Chu had already said, having contacted Namgung and Kabang, it would be difficult to just take off and run away, so they had to hurry up and leave Hefe. Only then would they be able to fulfill their duty. The chief immediately ordered his subordinates to attack Chu, displaying his sword in front of him. Everyone immediately rushed at high speed towards Chu. Chu himself mockingly thought that they had decided to kill him in order to shut him up. Chu deftly and quickly lifted his foot and struck the ground with great force. All the stones immediately flew into the air from his blow. The people who were attacking him immediately began to cover their faces with their hands, and in general could not expect such a thing from their opponent. But then one of Chu's opponents exclaimed that the guy really thinks that he can hide from them, but Chu clearly had his own fighting technique, and the stones from the destroyed building were useful to him in another way. The guy immediately started picking up small-sized rocks. Having gained strength, Chu was ready for his next attack. He thought about the fact that when they say to run, you have to run. 
In the same second, the very stones that were in Chu's hands a moment ago flew at Chu's opponents. The guy shouted that these were the twelve chain sections of the Tang family. But suddenly, Chu heard a voice behind him yelling for the guy to come to his senses because he had just exposed his back to his enemy. His enemy immediately shouted for him to die and brought the blade of his sharp sword over Chu. But Chu immediately noticed this and praised his enemy for his good teamwork. But immediately the guy objected that he would be a martial artist if he could so easily allow himself to be pierced by his opponent's sword. After only a few seconds, his enemy was rendered unconscious. At this, Chu only said with surprise whether he had already died at his hands, because it was very easy. The guy even somehow could not believe that he died so easily. But suddenly the chief brought his sword blade over his comrade, hoping to kill him. In the same second, a spray of blood flew into the face of the head uncle. He looked at his opponent with a heavy gaze. A thought flashed through Chu's mind about what a bastard this uncle was. Chu watched a very strange and slightly frightening scene, namely the chief ordering the killing of all his subordinates to cover all traces after him. Suddenly behind him, Chu heard the voice of the head uncle shouting that they should retreat. The guy continued to stand like that in incomprehension and held the man's body by the throat with his right hand. The gang immediately started running away as soon as they slit the throats of each of their partners. Chu immediately lets the man go and tells them that, if they act like this, then he too will no longer be restrained. Chu immediately rushes after them at breakneck speed. The gang continued to run away from Chu, who successfully caught up with them. But suddenly, Chu stopped, because another man appeared in front of him, with a sword that emanated some purple magic. Chu froze for a couple of seconds and began to examine his new opponent. The enemy immediately began to strike Chu different blows, from which the guy was quite quickly and cleverly shortened. In Chu's head, immediately appeared thoughts of whether his opponent really thinks that he can stop Chu with his lousy sword. Chu immediately throws the man into a deflection. The guy is thinking about how he doesn't care at all if they die or not. The guy is only interested in one person. The man immediately flies to the floor with a loud thud. Out of the corner of his eye, the chief notices that Chu is following them. Immediately, the head and his assistant separate and start running in different directions. The same Chu thought that if he now misses this man, it will only cause the guy to loka much more trouble. Just then, this aide yells out to his commanding officer that there is someone ahead of him. They were immediately yelled at not to move a muscle, and immediately proceeded to tell all the guards to stand by. Everyone immediately started pulling out their weapons, swords from their sheaths, bats and the like. Chu happily thinks about the fact that they could have come much earlier. Afterward, he called them turtles, as they were very slow. And it was at this point that Chu decided that now he could focus on catching just one person. At the same time, the commander was running away from Chu and the other guards. Just then, the commander is thinking about the fact that if he lets the guy capture himself, their grand scheme will be in great danger. But then immediately the commander thinks about the fact that he definitely can't give up at this point, because he and his gang have been through too much, and they can't lose everything right now. The commander throws a strange black-colored object with red stripes. Black smoke begins to emanate from this strange ball, as if from glowing lava. The commander turns towards Chu and throws this object with great force in the direction where the guy is standing. But the commander was immediately surprised that the guy who was standing near him had mysteriously disappeared somewhere. He didn't understand at all how this could have happened, as it was only a moment ago, and he couldn't have gotten away from him so quickly. Immediately after that red ball-shaped object flew away from the commander, it immediately exploded. The explosion was so strong that it was able to break everything around it and also cause a blast of air from the explosion. Just then, unexpectedly for the commander, Chu's fist flew to his cheek, which told him about the fact that this uncle needed to look at him now. The man himself was confused, and he couldn't dodge the blow. Chu quickly summoned a spell, and moving his hand behind his back prepared for his future attack. Immediately from Chu's strike, the commander immediately slammed into the ground, kicking up a huge amount of dust and dirt into the air. Stones immediately flew into the air and dust flew into the air. Chu immediately relaxed, stretched, and immediately turned to the commander with the words that it is not time for him to accept this coincidence because, apparently, his subordinates also already had a great blow.
At these words, the commander only asked the guy what kind of creature he was. There were bloodstains and spatters all around the man now and then. The next question that immediately flew at Chu was that, had he really been hiding his strength from Seven Yu all this time? But Chu immediately shook his head sideways disapprovingly, saying that he wasn't really happy that this uncle was the first to ask him a question. Telling him that they are following the wrong sequence, he adds that the winner of the battle is the first to ask the question. The guy immediately asks the commander about whose side he will be from, but the man only continues to remain silent and is on the floor. Chu only spreads his hands, saying that since this man does not want to answer the question, there is nothing to be done. The guy immediately tells the man that it's just the two of them, so they can slowly get to know each other. Just then, the commander begins to slowly, leisurely, get up from the cold and bloody floor. One way or another, realizing that the situation has reached an impasse and can now be called hopeless, all the subordinates end their miserable lives. And also, the commander himself realizes that the same fate will befall him. But the man realized that even though he was destined to die, but this insolent guy he will definitely take with him to the other world. The commander immediately put his sharp sword in the direction of Chu, standing there and prepared to attack. Chu replies to him that he knows that look very well, and that the uncle has something in mind before he passes away. He also adds that uncle has it all written on his face. The commander immediately replies in a furious tone of voice that, to this guy, this whole thing is just some kind of joke. At these words, Chu's head is filled with the thought that Kabang and the Nam Gung family's men haven't found them yet. And since he still has some time left, Chu tells the man that since he wants it so badly, he'll end it with just a single blow. The commander himself was just furious and furious with those words, because they were very selfish and hypocritical. Did his opponent really have that much confidence in his own strength? The uncle immediately laughed to himself because it is impossible to kill with just one blow, and that for such words, he should cut the guy's throat for the reason that this insolent kid's mouth should finally shut up. The commander immediately thinks about the fact that Chu will cover a huge distance between them at once and give him a cherished blow. That's when he'll get his one and only chance. The old man was already cheering inside himself, urging his enemy to act and attack him as soon as possible, already imagining how he would put this sharp sword into the guy's throat. Just then, Chu himself prepares to attack his enemy. There's one martial art that should definitely show someone like that uncle what another level means. A serene force touches the surface of the ground, thus causing it to shake finely. To the foot that has taken the first step, one feels a stony hardness that can support the very heavens. Chu immediately set his foot to the side and put out a tense fist in front of him. Around the guy himself, particles of blue and blue-colored energy were swirling in the air. And so, he struck his fist in front of him, thus splitting the air. And only the commander thought to ask what he was up to, and whether the guy wanted to scare him. But unexpectedly for the man himself, he flew at the same second from a strong blow to the stomach. Although during all this time, Chu did not make a single step towards his opponent. It turned out that it was the shock wave of the man's own fist hitting the air that pushed the man. The commander immediately flew at high speed into the nearest nearby wall. At this, Chu only smirked contentedly, for his attack had succeeded. A bright blue glow appeared near the uncle's chest, immediately in the next instant. An explosion of bright blue glow erupted in front of Chu. This was Chu's technique. The guy immediately said to the already well shabby and crippled commander in front of him that it was not a bad technique and that it was a forgotten Shailen teaching, namely the fist art of steps. The old man himself was by then lying on the floor in a blood-spattered mess. Chu went on to tell him that he had to get in his face hundreds of thousands of times just to master it finally. Immediately after his words, Chu approaches the commander, that crouched in pain continued to grunt painfully and lay on the bloody concrete. Chu asked him a question about what to do with him now, because it will be impossible to torture this uncle here. So he decides to first take him to the family Namgun. Suddenly, behind the two of them, someone's loud shout is heard, asking Chu to stop. The man in front of them introduces himself as Beksung, 
and that he is also the head of the Caban branch in Hawaii. Behind him, there were also two guys walking behind him. To this, Chu only replies to them with surprise that since they so wish, then let them have it. The two guys who were previously quietly walking behind Bak Sung immediately ran up to the ragged body and started trying to take him in their arms together. This whole scene was watched by Chu and Bak Sung. Just then, one of the men turns to Bak Sung and tells him that he looks a lot like the villain Bomb described to them. Just then, Bak Sung tells Chu about the young warrior handing this guy over to Kabang. But then Chu thinks that they're just a bunch of crooks because they came straight to the hot stuff. Immediately, his disciple Song came running over to Chu. He immediately shouted out while addressing his uncle. When Song came a little closer to Chu, he was horrified to see that his uncle Chu's clothes were very ragged and covered in someone's blood. Song immediately shouted in rage. Who was the daredevil who was so tired of living that he dared to raise his hand against his uncle Chu? Song himself had only mastered the module of the most loyal dog in ten days. But at the same second, Chu gives Sun a slap on the wrist, telling him that he's a bastard. Immediately after the punch, Sung raises his voice and asks his uncle Chu in surprise why he just hit him. The guy starts rubbing the bruised area with his hand. But immediately Chu, with a slightly funny but angry look, exclaimed to the guy that it was not enough for him. At the same, Sun replied with a denial and downloaded that he did not mean it at all. Baek Seong himself was watching from a distance. He immediately looked at the commander, who was lying unconscious on the floor with blood and abrasions. He noted to himself that he didn't look weak at all, and that even all of his companions had already managed to reach the level of releasing Chi and shooting Chi. Bak Sung is very surprised at the fact that Chu was able to single-handedly slay such a strong master. Just then, Chu turns to the man and asks him why he's the one drilling him with his gaze. Bak Sung immediately responds with an apology, and also clarifies that he behaved very rudely towards Chu with this action of his. But ignoring this apology, Chu immediately gets down to business, saying that since Bak Sung also recognized this commander, doesn't that mean that Kaban was looking for him too? Immediately, the guy rushes in with the reason why they were doing this. Bak Sung immediately replies to Mr. Chu that the Gyuwa gang that used to have some relation to them was slaughtered cleanly by someone. And then he says that this terrible atrocity was done by the hands of this gang. At this point, Bak Sung already turns to young Lord Yu to ask why he decided to engage in such a battle with them. Chu is silent at first, but at the same time he is thinking in his head that Bak Seong himself recently tried to probe the guy with his qi, and now he has decided to extract information from him. But then Chu replies to Bak Sung that it seems that they were following someone, but by some coincidence, they confused the person with him. Bayek Sung then asks Chu who they confused him with. Chu just waves his hands and replies that he doesn't know this information for sure anymore. Chu immediately thinks that if Bek Sung really thinks that he is a disciple of the great Chui Bul, who ruled over Kabang himself, he will let himself be ruled so easily. Chu immediately recalls his teacher, and he also thinks that the teacher looked like a real ragamuffin. Although why would he look like one? He was one in the guy's opinion. Chu sighs heavily. Bak Sung guesses that Mr. Chu was definitely hiding something from them, but unfortunately he can't, so he leaves those thoughts inside. Still, there's one good thing about Bak Sung showing up right now, because if Chu brings that uncle commander to the Namgung family and tries to dig up who's behind all this, then with the guy's current strength, it's still not enough. And that's the reason why he still can't do anything. Oh, and on top of that, all these bastards are hiding and operating solely from the shadows. So there's no telling what they'll do when they find out that they're being pursued by someone like Chu himself. But if the fact that the tracking party has been defeated by the enemy is revealed, they might start to push back even harder, which means that the Yu family will also. But Chu immediately clenched his fist and thought, well, no way. That was the reason why he should have diverted their attention. And even more so now that Chu had learned that the servant was more than just a single person, and that they had power. A great idea immediately popped into Chu's head about shifting his attention to another object. His gaze fell on Baek Sung and his cronies, who were standing quietly in silence. Chu thought that these guys would be perfect for switching the enemy's attention, 
and that if those Caban lunatics were determined to dig up someone's secret, they would surely face the servant and his loyal army in the future. That's the only way Chu can buy himself some free time. Right now, Chu's task was to send out only a small impulse, and the reaction would take care of itself. Chu told them that it seemed like someone was behind them, and it seemed like from the words the guy heard, there was something about the overturned sky. Immediately, Baek Sung shone brighter than the scorching sun in the fierce heat. He reacted very violently to those two words. Baek Sung immediately shouted out that let the young master pass it on to them. Chu immediately tells Baek Sung that this isn't the case at all, adding that it's not that he doesn't understand their position, but after all, he almost died too. Chu immediately asked to look at the wound on his arm. In reality, it was just an ordinary scratch of small size. Chu immediately turns around menacingly and starts looking at Sung, who was just standing next to them before and hovering in his thoughts. Chu immediately thought in his mind that Sung immediately began to help him, because if the guy did not know what pull push. But Song himself did not understand what his Uncle Chu wanted from him as he continued to nag him with a frightening look. Song had already thought that he had done something wrong or that something was hurting him very badly. Sung tried to concentrate because as after all, he is Namgung Sung and also the heir of the Namgung family. He was brilliantly trained not only in martial arts, but also in public affairs and arithmetic. This was where he finished summarizing his conclusion. Seong immediately shouted to Baek Seong for them to stop, because by doing so they were putting Uncle Chu in a very difficult and embarrassing position. Chu thought that they had trained Sung, but who told him that he had succeeded? Chu thought angrily that Sung was nothing but a dumbass and was also the heir. But immediately Baek Sung made another request to the heir, the young lord, because Kabang's most honorable name was at stake. But Sung immediately shouted that they had already been told that they couldn't. Immediately from Xian's face comes Chu's hand, who still responds to Baek Sung's agreement, saying that it can't be helped since the head is asking him so heartily. Baek Sung himself is a bit surprised with such a variable response. But immediately, Chu gets serious in his face, telling them not to spread the word that Mr. Chu is also involved, and that once they find out any information about their identities, they should definitely tell it all to Chu. Chu continued saying that if they all gave him those two promises, then he would gladly hand over the item to them. Baek Sung immediately replies to Mr. Chu with a smile and a twinkle in his eyes that he will take full responsibility, so he swears on his name. Chu immediately turned his back to the guys and a sly and satisfied smirk stretched across his face. Baek Sung himself was a little tense and kept his guard up. One of the men asks Beck Sung why it felt like he was being played, because young Mr. Yu didn't even pay for them to give him information, and why they should investigate for nothing. Beck Sung then angrily lashes out at him, saying that he didn't hear him talk about the coup at all, because apparently this fool didn't understand what tipping the sky meant. Beck Sung started yelling at him that it meant that there were people who wanted to take over Murim. The men only looked at Beck Sung in surprise. Baek Xiong continued saying that if they could get the truth out of the commander's uncle that someone was trying to take over Morim, they would be on their way to the elder's seat in the main residence. Baek Xiong told his henchmen to follow him and take the body of the commander that was still unconscious. And so by then, night had already fallen when Chu was able to be alone with his thoughts. Chu sat on his bed and thought about the fact that the original servant in six months should have been at least a tip and about the second treasure from Huang Doksam that sits in the prison of the Union Chonmu. But then Chu remembers that he was the one who was able to get hold of the virgin Jinseng, and by doing so, he changed the course of history. And what was most important was that he had the power, so Chu should have been much more careful than he was now. It would be correct to hypothesize that since he couldn't get his hands on the virgin Jinseng, he would act twice as fast for the reason of obtaining the second treasure as well. But then, Chu should have gotten ahead of him and found Han Daksim much earlier than him. That's right, Chu should have acted even more carefully and even faster to stop the impending chaos. Father immediately jumps up in joy and can't believe the words Chu just said. Because according to him, he's going to the Chanmu Union.
Father just in case interjects to see if Chu was accidentally making a joke, but even so it would come out as a terrible joke. Chu then replies that everything he said earlier and that he wants to meet a lot more people and gain more valuable experience. Father then tells him that of course Chu should gain experience and that he will now give him a letter of recommendation. Father also says that he will also send a message to Hai and have her help Chu. Oh, and plus, just have them see each other a lot more often and talk, and then they'll also get along better and bond better. At these words, Chu only sighs heavily, realizing that Father still hasn't given up on his idea. But immediately, Chu's face changes and tells Father that he also wants Sung to go there with him. Sung himself went into a real stupor and shock at these words. He was so surprised that he was ready to go bald on the spot. Father intervened, and he replied to Chu that it would be much more difficult with this request, because Song fulfills his duties as the heir of the country. Immediately, Chu thinks about it and remembers that he is. Chu says that the heir has a lot of responsibility on his shoulders to inherit the family in the future, and Sung doesn't even have any leeway. But Chu gets up from his seat immediately after his words and says that he still has to pack all his things, so he should leave early. Sung himself was confused for the reason that this man would not give up as easily as he did now. Father himself replied to him that he would talk to the head then and take care of Lord Chu's preparations. Chu rushed towards the exit of the room, while Father continued to glare at him with his surprised look. Just then, Chu quietly whispered to himself, that if one thought of it like that, there were others from the five hills left in the Marim Alliance besides he. This was immediately overheard by father. The hills are called the women who are the rising stars of the Marim, who represent the righteous sects. Just then, Chu turns to father and talks about what he heard that they're all real beauties, so the guy can't wait to meet them. The father himself was very frightened by these words, for this was not at all in his plans. He immediately made a surprised expression on his face and put his hand in front of his rum. As they leave the building, Chu says that fate is a completely unpredictable thing and that suddenly they will get close and then it will not be long before they get married and also adds that it will not be long before they have a child and then immediately turns to another topic, saying that it is spring and that the weather at this time of year is very warm and pleasant. The father gave a very loud shout of urgency to call a family council now. The hairs on his head stood up. Chu himself was counting on this reaction, so he went on with a smile on his face and then jumped up and splashed his heels against his shoes. Still, he knew how to manipulate perfectly, and there he was getting his way. The action unfolds in the Yangtze. A man orders someone to keep a closer eye on someone. At the same time, a guy pulls out of his cape a paper rolled up in three folds. Immediately, the one who had ordered it before turns to this guy and says that he could have done without all this. But he only replies that he does it out of his heart, and they are no longer strangers to each other. Then the man turns to the porters and asks them why they are taking so long with all these things. Just then he tells them to spread it all out quickly, and they go safely to breakfast. After a while, they've managed all the things on board, and the guy who gave the man the envelope wishes them all a happy journey. But as soon as the men go on board, the guy's expression changes to one of resentment and a little aggression. He's muttering to himself about how those bastard officials can only flaunt their money around, and so the ship set sail. Guy immediately descended from some sort of elevation into the hold of the ship. Guy saw some shadow that stood behind a huge pile of boxes in a corner. He said that the man might, was not worried about anything, for he had ordered his sailors not to go down into the hold until they arrived at Wuhan. Just then, the man who had been hiding in the shadows came out and told his companion that he would be sure to pay the lad the rest of the money as soon as they docked on land. The man told him that it could not be otherwise. The fellow climbed out of the hold and said that since this was so, the only thing left now was to survive the encounter with the black whale pirates. The guy said that with the pass fee, they would have no problem with them. But immediately one hears someone shouting something very vigorously denied. On board immediately came Chu and Sun, in the dialogue of which especially revealed it was Sun. Chu himself just listened to what the guy told him. By then the sails had already been put on. Chu asks Sung why he's so shaky in front of some pirates, to which Sung replies that you can't do that, and plus, 
He's explained it to his uncle many times before. Then Sung went on to say that catching the pirates would be good, but what about all the losses they would suffer in the process of fighting? Chu himself thought about how the local environment was a dark wilderness to him, but it wasn't such a big deal. To this look on his uncle Sung's face, he replies that Chu even has it written on his face that he knows absolutely nothing about such things. Then the guy continues by saying that if you touch the Yangtze pirates, there might be much bigger problems in the aftermath than Chu himself might think. Sung asks his uncle about what will happen if he hooks up with these pirates and provokes a fight with the Yangtze River group. Is Chu going to single-handedly deal with all the pirate mobs again? To this, Chu only asks the guy with a bored look in his eyes if he always talked so much. Sung says more so, but they also have a monster that his grandfather is fighting implacably. Just then, Chu wonders what kind of monster that is. Sung explains that the king is the taming king of the waters of Gusaji, which is the name of the man who is the monster of the seas. In response, Chu only slams his fist on the table where he and Song were sitting. He exclaims that there is so much talk because of what kind of man that he thinks he is a monster of waters. But immediately, Song answers him that if his uncle boldly rushes into battle and starts a war, then all the crossings of the Yangtze River will be burned, and this therefore will lead to huge losses. So the lad asks Chu to sit still and not to do any bad things. For all the guy's words, Chu only gives him a huge slap on the back. Immediately afterward, Sung grabs his newly bruised head and exclaims to his uncle why he always starts fights and that it's also a bad habit. Chu himself pretended that he didn't hear anything at all. He immediately wondered whether there was such a monster as the water tamer king. Chu tisked to himself and thought that there was nothing to be done and that this time he would have to sit quietly and keep his head down. One of the men on board was looking around, and just when he turned his head sideways and took a closer look, he saw a black whale pirate ship sailing straight ahead. He immediately shouted, thus alerting everyone around him on the ship. The man pointed his finger in the direction of the ship. All the people on the ship only watched in horror as the black whale pirate ship approached them. Their facial expressions were frightened and full of misunderstanding. Immediately, one of the pirates cast a shifter between the two ships to get to the ship where Song and Chu were. Immediately, one of the chief pirates is run up to by the kid, who was still in the hold before. He immediately wonders what kind of people have decided to welcome them to the ship. He also says that it is the owner of the wharf, Mr. Ku Doc. He asks if the man is doing well. Mr. Ku Doc happily tells him that it has been a long time since they have seen each other and how he is doing. He tells him that he is doing well and immediately asks him to bring him the same thing. Just then, the black whale pirates are brought a huge box of gold coins, saying that it is their payment for passage through their waters. Ku Doc tells them that he likes this approach because he doesn't even have to tell the guy anything. He does everything himself. Sung, who has been watching from afar, sees that apparently the deal with Kudok was a success. Sung immediately thinks about the fact that since they got everything they needed, it would be time for them to get off their ship, but what's the reason they still aren't leaving? To all the hubbub, Chu says that why worry so much about little things when there is such a beautiful sea all around? But then, Kudok says that with the pass, they have just solved the issue, but there is one more thing because of which they still cannot leave their ship, namely that they have received an order to find a man. The people around them were immediately surprised at these words. Kudok asks the kid right now if everyone is here right now, who has boarded the ship, and if there is no one else on it. The kid immediately became anxious and a sweat appeared on his forehead. He immediately laughed at Kudok's words, but immediately, Kudok tells him that he knows him like the back of his hand, and he also knows that sometimes the guy gives rides to all sorts of trespassers on his ship. The man immediately puts his hand on the guy's shoulder. To these words, the guy couldn't say anything useful. In order not to frighten the boy so much, Kudok told him that if the person he was transporting was not the one he was looking for, he would quietly turn a blind eye. So let the boy talk for the two of them had no intention of making each other angry. 
Just then, the fellow says he also has one in the hold. Kudok shouts out to everyone, warning them that the person they're looking for has committed a terrible crime and escaped, and if people agree to cooperate with the PRs, nothing bad will happen. That's why the man asked everyone to line up in one line. All the people around immediately got in line, but suddenly one of the pirates spotted Chu, who was standing far away from the others and just looking at the sea. Chu's head immediately flew into the back of his head, which was smacked by the same pirate. The pirate immediately shouted at Chu, calling him a boy. That didn't he mustache that. They were all told to get in line. Sleep immediately became worried, because even though this ignorant pirate suddenly took a swing at Mr. Chu, Song tried his best to pray that his Uncle Chu would have a little patience and not start a fight like this, because it could have serious consequences. Suddenly strange sounds came from the hold, which appeared to be coming from the person who was being carried by that guy in the hold. Everyone immediately turned toward the exit of the hold and waited for the man to show himself. Ku Doc watched a man wearing black clothes and white ornaments in some places emerge from the hold. Ku Doc addressed the guy first, saying that coming out first was not something he agreed to do, but instead he dared to touch his guys. But immediately the outlaw replies to him that did the cabin dig up under him because if so, they are riddled with tension. But how could they entrust the matter of his capture to some lowly pirate? Kudok immediately became enraged and lunged at the guy, sheathing his sharp sword while drawing it from its sheath. He shouted at him that he would just cut off his wretched head alive. And so Kudok fully bared his weapon, already preparing to attack his enemy that had so foully insulted all pirates, not just himself. Just then, the thought comes into Chu's head that the pirate is pretty good. But the criminal decided to do something different and instead of immediately starting a fight, decided to break the mast of their ship. All the people around them looked at this with astonishment. Chu angrily and quickly grabbed his sword and shouted that he would still definitely show those damned bastards. But immediately, Song stopped his Uncle Chu. Kudok began to attack the criminal, but he skillfully defended himself with his fists from all the blows, well or dodged. Chu was watching carefully, and suddenly he was able to notice something very interesting. Namely, that this lawbreaker had a tattoo of a red snake on his arm. Chu remembered that there was one such person with a red snake tattoo in Chanmu Union Prison. His name was Huang Doksam, and it is this man who knows the location of the second treasure, the very one that Chu himself was also targeting. It flashed through Chu's mind that it seems but in this life, the heavens themselves are following him on his heels. Just then, Song shouted to his uncle to stay out of this fight, because he had promised him that he would stay out of the way. To this, Chu only shouted to Sun to guard the people on board and warned that if even one person was hurt, he would thoroughly train the Sword of Wrath for two days. Sun immediately exposed the sharp blade of his sword, realizing that he would not be able to intercept all the blows aimed in their direction. Fear and determination to fight mingled in his thoughts, and he prepared to engage his opponents. The only way for Song to increase the speed of his sword was to use the Sword of Sadness, which gave the sword much more lightness and mobility. This sword was their last hope for success in this fight. Sleep immediately began to repel the strikes that flew at the peaceful people on board. Immediately, some man thanked the guy for protecting them, sacrificing his life as well. Sung himself was thinking about what his uncle Chu was going to do. Ku Doc swings at his opponent with force, shouting at him to die soon. But the enemy deftly dodges the blow of the huge sword. The man notices that Ku Doc is putting too much force into his strike. And it was at this point that the outlaw realized that this was his perfect chance to snatch this victory lightly. He immediately decided to strike the pirate in the face with his fist, as if trying to squeeze everything he could out of the situation. But what was the surprise of these two when Chu also joined them in the fight? Preventing the outlaw from doing any damage to Kudok was like adding water to the whirlwind that descended upon them. Chu was immediately able to knock his large and heavy weapon out of Kudok's hands with a deft movement. The two men were all in shock, and they clearly did not understand what was even happening right now. Chu tensed his fist and drew it aside, thus building up his strength for a future strike. He immediately makes an apt punch right into the side of Kudok's stomach, who immediately flies off somewhere to the side from such a strong blow from Chu's fist. 
The man cries out painfully from the damage he received. The criminal immediately asks Chu why he did it. But Chu was only interested in asking him one thing, and that is if he is the Huan Doksam he mentioned earlier. At that name, the criminal immediately flinches a bit, and drops of sweat drip down his face. He was obviously worried. Chu tells him that judging from the expression on his face, one can realize that the guy was right in his hunch after all. That was his reasoning for choosing to save this lawbreaker, because Chu had another question for him. Just then, Chu approaches the other pirates and says that he needs this man immediately, so they should do something about it. Chu says, does he need to interrupt them all? Or will they just leave quietly without too much fighting or casualties? The pirates only look at the guy in surprise at this statement, but it turns out they were just looking at the outlaw. As soon as Chu turned around to the one he called Huang Doksam, but there was already a trace of him. Apparently, he had already managed to run off somewhere. Chu immediately rushed to the edge of the board and leaning on the railing looked into the water. And strangely enough, Chu there saw his recent buddy that decided to just run somewhere and throw him without even saying thanks for the fact that the tone saved him. That's when Chu reprimanded him for saving him with such hard work. And he did just like that. Ku Doc immediately started yelling for all the pirates around him to start catching the bastard and that no one should just let him run away from them. All the pirates immediately began to jump into the water and swim after the criminal, who ran away like a rat by jumping overboard. This whole circus was watched by a somewhat tired Chu, who clearly did not like the whole situation around him. Chu shouted, thus calling Sun. The guy immediately responded to the call of his uncle. Chu ordered Sun to split up with Ku Doc as quickly as possible. The pirate, who was still sitting on the floor, was in a bit of shock because he did not understand who it was about, someone else or him. Chu also says that if Sung can't handle the order he's given, he'll know exactly what punishment awaits him. A herd of goosebumps immediately ran through Sung's body. He was terrified because he remembered that he would have to train the Sword of Anger for two whole days. And Chu also clarified that if he suddenly missed Kudok, he would only have to train the Wrath Sword for a whole week. Song shouted loudly, stating that he was willing to go to the ends of the earth to avoid missing the culprit. Chu, in turn, turned around, a smirk adorning his face. He walked to the edge of the ship, gathering his strength and preparing for action. Chu immediately jumped off the boat with determination, the water exploding around him, creating a small bomb of water. What was the surprise of people when Chu was able to take the form of a shark? and thus without spending a huge amount of energy to swim in a human body. Chu immediately rushed quickly to that criminal without losing sight of him. Kudok himself was shocked at what he had just seen, but immediately behind him he hears a voice. Sung still decided to question the pirate about who the man was and what purpose they were chasing him for. Sung also says that his uncle Chu is unbelievable because he didn't even realize when he was able to learn this water art. He also says that he heard from the head of the Yu family that Chu used to splash around in the water a lot in order to lose weight. And the guy assumed that it was around that time that he was able to learn it. Ku Doc decides to get back on his feet, and at the same time he asks Sung who he is. The guy immediately starts walking over to him and pulls his sword out of its sheath. Sung said in a calm voice that he remembered that Uncle Chu had ordered him to deal with the pirate a while ago. Kudok himself shouted with all his might that this guy was crazy and he didn't know who he was. Sung replies to Kudok that he is a very evil pirate who almost sent all the people who are on board right now to the other side of the world. Kudok himself cries out in surprise. The guy immediately puts his palm on Kudok's head and says that there's no need to rant because Sung was just told to beat up the pirate, so that's what he's going to do. As the pirates in front continued to swim, Chu swam up to one of them and addressed him. He felled Mr. Huang, to which he shouted that this guy was a lousy guy. Huang immediately drew his sword and struck at the place where Chu had been before. But what was his surprise when now there was no one in that place? And only Huang wanted to check where Chu had gone, the guy flies to him from above and steps on his face with his foot, thus landing successfully. Chu pushed off of Huang and jumped on. Huang himself began to rapidly go down. It was then that Chu had what he thought was a great idea. He was confident in his actions and determined. 
Immediately, Chu began to jump on the heads of the pirates that swam towards Huang Doksum. Chu himself began to say a very clever thought in his opinion, namely that if Bodhidharma on a single sheet of reeds was able to cross the vast Huanghe River, then it also meant that without much effort, Chu would be able to cross the Yangtze River right over the heads of pirates. Just then, Chu shouted to Mr. Doksam that he should have stopped right now and finally stopped running away from him. Wang Doksam himself was surprised that Chu was able to overcome this pitiful crowd of pirates in an instant without any difficulty. And that did this guy turned out to be a great master who could use flight over water. In fact, Chu is only ideally skilled in martial arts. But even so, Huang Doksam couldn't just grab himself or lose to his enemy. He immediately jumped to meet Chu, thus preparing to strike. Chu himself tells Huang Doksam that there's no point in him wasting all his strength and that he won't even bother to fight him. As soon as Huang Doksam struck the first blow to his enemy Chu, the guy had no trouble dodging his attack without any great difficulty. But immediately Chu strikes back at Huang Doksam so that he doesn't get too relaxed or rather, he just grabs the man by his collar. Chu immediately throws Huang Doksam to the nearest land with all his might, still keeping his opponent's guard up. The man himself screamed loudly during the flight, because he could not have expected such a move from his opponent. Chu tells him that this is the reason why he didn't need to spend his strength, because the guy immediately told him that he wouldn't kill him, but instead wanted to save him in exchange for the information he was interested in. Huang Doksum immediately cried out, saying that why should he even believe a lousy guy like Chu? Chu only replies that he hasn't even had a chance to introduce himself, and Huang Doksam is already insulting him, and that the man doesn't think that the rules of the martial world really apply everywhere. Chu takes a shot right to Huang Doksam's ribcage. After this blow from his enemy, Huang Doksam notices that he is completely unable to move even his left toe. Immediately, Chu tells him not to even try to escape, because right now, Chu will deal with anyone who tries to stop them, and they will sit down and chat with each other. And only wanted to ask Chu a question about who he was, as immediately received two apt and deft blows in the approximate location of his collarbones. What was the surprise and the very real shock when he, opening his mouth, could not utter a sound? At this, Chu reassured him a little, but still reassured him that when his will was suppressed, he would not be able to die, and told Huang Doksum not to hold a grudge against him much, but just a guy afraid of the fact that the man could again run away from him somewhere. Just then, Chu turns to face the other pirates that were actively coming out of the water with various weapons. The guy asks Huang Doksum about how he should deal with them all. Chu realizes that by now, there is already a good crowd of pirates and that it will be a bit problematic for him to fight them all alone. But then, the guy notices that the Seven Tang's hidden weapon is all around them, and it was exactly what he needed right now. A huge pile of pirates immediately ran at Chu, shouting aggressively that they needed to urgently capture Chu and also that lawbreaker. At the same time, Chu himself leisurely collected all the weapons he needed which was scattered around them. At first, Chu had a very calm and patient character, but as his very cruel teacher and Chong Su said, that everything that exists can become a hidden weapon against your enemy. When one rises to a certain level, then one could then use not only rubble as a weapon, but also sand when needed. But right now, Chu is enough with all that he has. In the Nine Dragons Fortress, Chu calmly used snow as a weapon, which was abundant there. And right now, he's using rocks they immediately flew at great speed into the pirates. Immediately, half of the pirate gang was defeated by this guy's easy trick. They lay with huge bumps on their foreheads and abrasions all over their bodies. The remaining pirates were very scared because they didn't know what to expect from their so strong and powerful opponent, Mr. Chu. Chu said that such a fight with the pirates could definitely start a war between them, just like his younger nephew Song said. In the process of their fighting, people might also get hurt and the act would not work. But immediately, Chu picks up the sword that the pirate must have dropped earlier. The guy says that, in that case, he should cover all traces behind him and remove the witnesses. The pirates immediately start running away in the opposite direction of Chu because they were very scared of what he might even do to them. But immediately, the guy took a step back, 
and having gained more strength made a couple of sharp swings of his newly acquired sword. His blows were accurate and precise. Chu throws away the sword he borrowed from the pirate and throws it with force, sending its sharp blade into the ground. The guy tells Huan Doxam that they successfully dealt with the pirates just now. And now Chu was completely focused on Huan Doxam, and taking him by the chin, he told him that it wasn't time for us to have a little chat. Chu does give his voice back to the man, and the man immediately squeals about who the hell he is. To which Chu replies that he is Gene Wigan. It was unknown. Suddenly Huang Doxam was connected to the servant. That was the reason why Chu couldn't afford to reveal his real identity to this man. And now the guy had to think hard about how he could get good information out of this man. Chu tells Huang Doxam that he's going to ask him one thing, so he better take his answer seriously. Namely, where the thousand-year-old shell is located. Huang Doxam's facial expression immediately changed. He was very surprised that the guy knew about such information. Chu immediately exclaimed happily that Huang Doxam really did know about the location of the thousand-year-old shell. The guy immediately asked where it was. Huang Doxam tried to pretend that he had no idea about the sink, so he only replied that he didn't know. Just then, Chu rises up and tells Huang Doxam that right now he's going to check out how the man really doesn't know anything about the sink and where to find it. Chu immediately starts beating the man with his legs, telling him that the man may sleep soundly. But if he does confess before they bury him, he won't need to sleep. Chu began to tell Huang Doxam that this would definitely not happen in the front yard or in the mountains behind the Ohm. The man himself was thinking about Chu being the ultimate nutcase. From afar, however, Sung was watching the whole scene. He immediately thought about why Chu would go that far, and also noted that his uncle was beating up Huang Doxam much harder than when he beat him up. But Sung gets distracted and turns to Kudok, addressing him. Sung tells him that he can take his time and tells Kudok to swim as slowly as possible. The man himself didn't understand the guy's logic, because not long ago he had been pushing him. And now he was telling him to slow down, calling the guy a fickle asshole. Kudok thought that he could certainly be patient for a little longer, but when the chapters came up, they would definitely immediately go to hell together. Chu leaned over Huang Dok Sam, telling him that he was finally awake because it had been four hours since he knocked him out. And Chu immediately, with a menacing look, suggested to Huang Dok Sam that he go back to his old ways, namely that the guy kick him with his feet, thus beating the truth out of him. At that moment, Sun looked away in surprise. Chu also noticed this and asked him what it was about. They continued floating like that until someone's laughter was heard from somewhere. Kudok laughed and said that did these lousy people now realize that right now the main ship of the Black Whale Pirates was in front of them, and that now they would all go to the bottom of the sea to feed the fish. But Chu immediately, Yu Hyun gives him a divide and conquer Kadok punch, and later tells Song that it looks like they have company. The nephew broaches the subject with frustration in his voice, saying that the guy has been pressing Chu for a favor to be much more careful and to sit tight but his uncle calmly tells him that there's nothing he can do about it now, and tells the guy that now all he can do is just enjoy the consequences. Chum Chu suggested to his nephew to quickly deal with those who stood in their way and return to the ship. The boys immediately rushed into action, and Chu shouted that they would now welcome their new guests. Soon, after some time from the Black Whale pirate's ship, there were only scraps left, with the bodies of the pirates floating on them. Some still managed to make it out, and even survive. The pirate grudgingly looked to the side and noticed that a lone ship with only two people was floating there. Kudok was paddling this vessel, while Chu was pushing him to make the man sail much faster. The pirate himself was furious because Kudok was just a crazy worm at the moment, and plus, why is the man sitting on the oars of these strange guys? Another survivor comes to the same pirate and asked him if they had any flares that hadn't gotten wet yet, namely, the red one. The first pirate himself immediately started rummaging through his clothes, looking for the red shell. He pronounced to his companion that then the master would know that they had taken this errand arbitrarily, but the other answered him to cease his chattering, and rather was already firing the signal rocket. He also told him that he would listen to a couple of swear words from the Lord, but was it really that important when a whole pride of black whales was at stake? The pirate immediately pointed the signal shell upward 
and thought that when the shell soared upward, this man would surely arrive here. The pirate said to himself mentally that even the very warriors of the martial world were afraid of the tamer king of the waters, who had swept all the other pirates under him. While the official was sitting quietly, the reports that a red shell had flown over the Yangtze River immediately came to him. He immediately became conspicuous, and rising from his seat, loudly at that, striking his hands on the table, called out questioningly. This was Chagal Subom, who was the great counselor of the Chanmu Union. A man immediately rushes in to see Chagal, and informs him that exactly two hours ago, a red shell was fired in the vicinity of the Yangtze arm. A great number of pirates also flock from the mouth of the river, urgently demanding the opening of a crossing point to the Yangtze. Chagall Subom was immediately surprised at such words, because isn't the red shell a pirate signal that pirates only launch at times when the threat level is the greatest? Chagall Subom immediately asks the man what the reason was for the pirates issuing the red signal, to which the man replies in confusion that they have no information about it at the moment. Chagall Subom shouted to these fools that a full two hours had passed and they still hadn't deigned to find and determine the cause of the red shell being launched. The head was simply furious with so frivolous of his men. Chegal Subom thought that even if this one was so important that the pirates even launched that red signal shell, they should certainly get it, because the enemy of his enemy is his ally. Chegal Subom slammed the table hard and told the man to relay his orders to the head of the green dragons that let them go immediately to the western checkpoint of Wuhan and suppress the numerical protests. The man shouted to him that it was impossible to lead the pirates to another waterway that included the Chunmu alliance. Chagal Subom asked where exactly the projectile was launched from, to which he was told that it was a waterway from Anhui to Hubei. The man immediately realized that it was about black whales. Without wasting a second, he asks where the king of water tamer is now, to which he receives the answer that according to the intelligence report, he is in the vicinity of Ejo County. Chegal Subom asks which of the Kaban visiting the Alliance has the highest position, to which he is told that the youngest wandering dragon was arrived here to take the entrance exam for the lurking dragon squad. At the same time, there was a disapproving cry from someone about why he was being yanked at this very moment, plus in the middle of the dark night. But immediately he is answered that a red shell was fired on the Yangtze River. The boy said that even such nonsense must have a limit, namely, Kadushin, who was the younger and also wandering dragon of Kaban. Kei Dushin immediately told the guy who was lying on the table beside him at that moment, with his face into the table to get up. But he couldn't get up even for a while, at the man that was sleeping flung Dushin's arm away from him. Kei Dushin complained to himself that it was too hot, and also what was the good of getting so drunk at night because it was very bad for a man's health. Kedushin shouted again for the man to get up as soon as possible. He got an answer, though. The guy asked him why the fuck Dushin would be his, and in the middle of the night. Kedushin told him that his majestic uncle had sent him on a mission. The man asked him what was the big deal. Kedushin replied with an irritated wail that he had to go to Shaanxi tomorrow as a matter of urgency, and that was where the war with the factions had broken out, which meant that they wouldn't be able to see each other for a long time. The guy stretched out in incomprehension. So what? Then what was the whole point of what the guy told him? K. Dushin sighed heavily because it was his friend, and he had to say goodbye to him somehow. The guy just bowed his head disapprovingly and said that there was no way he could say goodbye if he was drinking right now. K. A. Dushin only said that he couldn't expect any affection from his friend. Just then, the guy pulled out a rope from somewhere and started making knots on it. K. Dushin held out this rope to one of the men beside him, telling him to take this knot and go to the crossing and find a group of vagabonds, let them scour Wuhan's waterway to the north. The boy tiredly wiped his eyes and said that now he could live in peace, and it was possible that the king of the water, Tamer himself, would soon intervene. The lad said that he did not really want that generous vagabond to suffer for nothing. Two men in a boat were heading across the sea at night, splitting the water with their oars. On the boat itself stood a man of interesting appearance, and on his clothes was a dragon. The fragments of the ship were floating on the cold night sea. The crowd of people were very worried and afraid for their lives because they were left without any help on a broken ship with no hope of rescue. 
They also watch the boys massacre the enemy pirates. Sun immediately knocks over one of his opponents, to which the latter only exclaims painfully and falls to the ground while letting his sword out of his hands. Sun turns towards his uncle and immediately looks at him with interest to see what he is doing. It turns out that Chu has also just defeated his opponent. The pirate's body immediately falls to the ground with a thud. After Chu was able to defeat his opponent, he turned to the side, looking at a slightly horrifying scene. Because as soon as they returned with Doxum in hand, a huge number of sent pirates immediately headed towards them. Chu thought about the fact that even though it is not broken, pirates still keep coming from the sea. Chu shouted to Kudoku, addressing him. The pirate immediately responded. Mr. Yu was well aware that he could not allow himself to be bound hand and foot. Chu asked Kudok where the nearest wharf was in the neighborhood and for them to land at that particular spot. Kudok shouted assent to him, and his men immediately began rowing oars across the water. A strong wind suddenly arose around Chu and the boat in which he was crossing with the others. The boy immediately lifted his head up to see what it was. In fact, that wind appeared because of some guy that was about to land on their boat right now. Chu said to himself about what the hell it was. This same guy immediately landed on their boat, leaving a light streak behind him, showing that he was traveling at a great speed. The fellow immediately landed on the ship and shouted loudly, addressing the pirates of the Yangtze River to listen to his words. He said that he was the junior wandering dragon of Keban, K.A. Dushin, and henceforth this ship was under the protection of the Chanmu Alliance. Chu did not understand at all who this man K. Dushin was. K. Dushin himself tells everyone that now the people on board can be calm because the Chanmu Union will protect them all. But suddenly, Chu remembers that he knows a very similar person because he met him earlier. He shouts out to K. Dushin that if he's the same bastard, the guy only looked at Chu in surprise because he didn't understand who he was talking about. On their ships, the pirates immediately started yelling for them to stop immediately. Chu was surprised from the fact that the pirates obeyed Choi Bull, who was one of Chu's teachers in the past. The pirates shouted that they, the sons of the Yangtze River, were saluting their head. The pirate ships immediately stopped. Chu abruptly turned around and looked somewhere in the distance. The guy noticed that some man with a cape with a dragon painted on it was swimming towards them. K. Dushin and Chu immediately started to get a little worried because right in front of them, the water tamer king himself appeared. Also, Chu noticed that this boat came too close to them. Chu shouted to Ku Doku that he and his men to turn as soon as possible. He thought about the fact that the leader of the bandit group was in front of them and that they should never run into him. Ku Dok and his men immediately began as soon as possible to try to give the right of helm and not run into the leader of the brigand group. And so the brigand group leadership, and the one that Chu, Ku Dok, and Kei Dushin were on, were about to collide together. Chu was well aware that if things continued like this, their ships would collide inevitably. The leader of the bandit group put his hand out in front of him. A powerful blow immediately stopped the ship that Chu, Ku Dok, and Kei Dushin were on. Chu completely failed to realize what had just happened. Immediately, Chu realized that the leader of the bandit group had stopped the huge ship with energy alone. The guy wondered just how strong their opponent was. A man climbed aboard them, and near him also stood a huge, bulky man with a threatening look at the people around him. K.E. Dushin immediately folded his hands in a respectful gesture and told the leader of the bandit group that the Kibang ambassador was welcoming the ruler of the Yangtze River. Just then, Song repeats after K.E. Dushin and tells the man that the son of the Namgung family is greeting the water tamer king. K.E. Dushin wanted to say something to him as well but he didn't have time. Suddenly, the man who was behind the leader of the bandit group rushed forward with great speed towards his master. Chu realized that the situation around him was getting hotter and more dangerous because that man ran past him and the guy even had to dodge. Suddenly, the henchman of the leader of the bandit group grabbed K.E. Dushin by the neck and lifted him high into the air, thus choking him. The bandit group leader sighed and looked at Chu with interest. The leader thought, how was it possible that some youngster of 20 years old had caught the movement of Jun San, who had perfectly mastered the level of radiant ki? Jun San himself, by then, was starting to clutch Kei Dushan's throat with force. The guy started to make wheezing sounds. Suddenly, Chu immediately turned to the elder, turning to face him, 
While the man looked questioningly at the guy, Chu made a placid appearance, and with all seriousness in his words told the leader that he was a very famous man. So why would he need to bully some snot-nosed kid? Chu also said that he was worried about the fact that it would hurt the elder's reputation, because everything has its own consequences. The leader immediately replied to him that the kid was right, and that also his reputation could not be allowed to be ruined. He made some sort of hand gesture, withdrawing his man from Kei Dushin. The leader's henchman immediately noticed the command from his commander and relaxed his hand. Kei Dushin immediately fell to the floor with a thud. The leader of the bandit group was intimidating with the energy that came from him. He immediately turned to Chu, telling him that maybe the guy could explain to him what was going on here. Chu thought that how could they hold out a little longer, because it wouldn't be long before the Chanmu alliance would arrive. Chu was not happy that out of nowhere this monster had popped up, and if the guy touched him in any way, he would send him straight to Yamaraja, the supreme judge of the netherworld in Buddhism. Chu told the elder that they sailed quietly on the ship to Wuhan, but then suddenly pirates appeared and began to intimidate the common people. The elder replied to him that did he decide to be magnanimous and save all the innocent people. The lad answered in the affirmative and that it could be said so. The leader stood menacingly, unleashing his powerful energy. Chu was well aware that his opponent did not believe the lie he had told. Chu's mind immediately became empty. He had absolutely no idea what to do. But then he remembered something. Chu turned to the elder again, telling him that the guy comes from the Yu family located in Anping County, which is in Henan province. The guy continues, talking about how the leader may not even know, but their family has no connection to Murim. However, Chu talks about how their family has strong support from the government. Guy also talks about how his father was previously the crown prince, and that even now he is in Yintian Fu looking after His Highness the heir, at the request of His Majesty the Emperor. Ying Tian Fu is the capital of the Ming Empire. Of As the divine strategist teacher said, if you want to overwhelm your opponent with words, you must show him that you have strong support on your side, and if you do not have it, then boldly lie. But immediately the leader told him that he did not care to whom this boy was a son. Chu realized the man wasn't buying it, and in his head he cursed his teacher. The elder talks about being a pirate has been a pirate since birth, and will remain a pirate for the rest of his life, so he's going to be hunted down by the Pathans until the day he dies. It didn't make any difference to him if it was already the government or some fighting clans. Chu had absolutely no idea what to do, and after all, the guy still had to somehow save the passengers, Namgung Seon, Kei Dushin, and Huang Doksam to question him and get useful information. But then the leader is already thinking that how he can do it, because there is not just one monster in his way, but two monsters. With the current level of the guy, he not only the king of the tamers of the waters will not be able to touch, but even his guards cannot even touch a finger. Chu recalls that the divine strategist taught him another thing as well. There were two truths in the agreement, namely to either press the fears of the enemy or to lure him with something good to arouse his genuine interest. Chu turned to the elder, telling him not to misunderstand his words and also asking him to listen. Chu told the elder that he was merely informing him of his current status, and that would a guy dare to be so impertinent to an elder. The leader asked what he was getting at then. Chu told him that he wished the elder would have mercy and spare them, but he had sunk dozens of ships, so it was unlikely that the elder could turn a blind eye to that fact. The boy went on, talking about what he wanted to say with all this. What about the guy paying a huge amount in compensation that would satisfy the leader of the bandit group himself? Chu thought that the elder was a pirate. He had said so himself recently. So it couldn't be that he wouldn't like money. The leader interrogates the guy. Did he really just offer to compensate him for the whole problem they had with money? Chu confirmed what he said and demanded to tell the leader the amount he would like to receive. The elder only smirked contentedly at these words. Not even a couple of seconds later, when the leader began to laugh, he tilted his head and began to look at the sky. Chu himself thought that if the old man's mind is completely gone at the thought of farting gold bars, Chu did not understand what was going on with this grandfather. But immediately, the elder quickly appeared in front of him and said that he liked that bastard. Chu couldn't see the moment when the old man was able to approach him so quickly, so he jumped back, 
thinking about how scared he was by this old man. The elder turned to Chu and asked him to look up, toward the mountains that were nearby. The boy raised his head and looked where the leader asked him to look. The elder told him that all those men with swords on the mountain were standing at the ready from the Chanmu Alliance. The leader asked the lad if he knew the reason why they were just standing there doing nothing. To this, Chu asked the elder what he meant by his words, but mentally realized that the position of the Chanmu Union was obvious. The old man replies that they are trying on the side of their adversary. On the face of it, they are righteous, shouting their alliance from everywhere, but they themselves mentally decide what will be more beneficial to them. And if they dare to start a war with the leader of a bandit group for the sake of saving a bunch of people, the damage to them will be incommensurable. Chu was shocked at his interlocutor's words, if this old monster alone could stand up to the Chanmu alliance. The leader replied that after all, they also represent righteous sex, so why exactly is Chu offering him a deal to save everyone? Chu wondered if the elder would believe him if he told him that he needed all these lousy people to kill the servant and save the world. While the lad was actively pondering his answer, the elder, on the other hand, was analyzing his opponent. He guessed what kind of character the boy had. There was no way the leader could see his abilities, but there was no way that some dumb ass would be able to follow Jun San's movements. Since he couldn't even figure it out up to this point, all he had to do was check it out for himself. The elder addresses him, saying that there are many things in the world that cannot be solved with money. The elder immediately ordered his guard to strike at K.E. Dushan. He immediately rushed to attack. K.E. Dushan himself remained on the floor, completely open to the blows. Dushan didn't have time to react to his opponent's punch because it was too fast even for him. Chu immediately rushed to K.E. Dushan's aid as soon as he noticed this. He shouted angrily to the leader that here was the crazy old man. And so, the bandit group leader's guardian makes a deft and quick strike at K.E. Dushin, accurately and without regret. But immediately, this blow was repelled with a deft move by Chu, who had time to run to K.E. Dushin and Jun Sanu. The guy shouted to K.E. Dushin that why did he spread out because he had to dodge this attack. Dushin immediately reacted to this, and it was as if he came out of a trance. K.E. Dushin immediately jumped overboard of the ship they were on. Chu himself faced a huge problem that was standing right now in front of him. The fear of the leader of the bandit group was already forcefully bringing his heavy mace over the guy. The blow immediately struck Chu right in the area of his chest. The boy screamed, bellowing out as he did so. After such a strong attack from his opponent, Chu came to the only reasonable decision in his opinion. Namely, that with just one punch, he would take his victory from this bulky guy. The reasoning behind this was that his opponent was a master who had reached the initial stage of Radiant Qi, so if the fight with him was prolonged, Chu would definitely lose, so Chu decided to put all his strength into a single attack. The guy thought that the power closest to the origin, filled with purest natural Qi, in terms of strength and quality, it's a level higher compared to the inner Qi accumulated in Dantian. Chu was well aware that Jun San would not be able to dodge or stop his strike. Jun San only smirked widely at this fighting style. Chu himself was very surprised and dumbfounded by this reaction from his enemy. But suddenly, from the back, Chu received another blow from the leader of the bandit group. Chu immediately fell to the floor with no strength because the punch was precise and deft enough to knock the guy out and leave him without strength. Chu thought about the fact that the man was the head of the attacking clan and he had so meanly won the fight. The guy called the Tamer King the ultimate bastard. After saying that, Chu immediately passed out, banging his head on the floor of the ship. Sun, who had been standing nearby all this time, exclaimed his uncle's name and immediately grabbed the hilt of his sharp sword. The leader of the bandit group had already turned to Sun, telling the lad that it was better not to do any rash deeds. Sun, on the other hand, was shocked and horrified from the fact that the Water Tamer King was able to suppress him with just one look. The boy realized that his uncle Chu had fought at the cost of his own life in order to save his skin. Sun was disgusted with himself because what was he doing now? But exactly nothing. He was afraid to even move. But the guy gathers all his strength into a fist and confidently declares to himself that he will definitely save his uncle Chu. The guy, still keeping his hand on the hilt of the sword, began to pull it out of its sheath. At this action, the old man only sighed and began to watch the guy's actions. Song was determined and serious because he was determined to save his uncle Chu no matter what it took. 
even if he had to part with his own life. The elder was very surprised to see that the guy possessed the will of the sword. As he could tell, judging from the pale color of the sword, the guy couldn't have mastered the technique perfectly yet, but it was definitely sword will. The man wondered where these nuggets came from. One fights back against his servant Jun Sun, while the other tears apart his key restraining art. But as the elder observes, Song is not in the best condition for the reason that due to the overburgeoning power, cruelty has entered his brain. The old man smirked, completely while analyzing the situation around him and how he should proceed. So the elder tells Sung that as he sees it, the fellow is a relative of that lousy Shansong. Son immediately began to attack, completely bare the blade of his sword. The bandit leader himself said that he couldn't kill the guy and thus prevent him from seeing what the sprout would grow into. The man raised his foot to strike. The instant the elder's foot hit the floor of the ship, everything around him shook slightly. But in fact, with a single kick of his foot, the old man was able to stir the waves so that they enveloped the ship like two strong walls. And so some time passed. There was a delicious smell coming from somewhere in the forest. This very odor reached Chu, who was still lying tired and exhausted. But now the guy opens his eyes and looks around, wondering where he is. But the first thing he sees is only fried chicken in a dish in front of him that smelled so good. Jun San, on the other hand, was sitting across from Chu and was also chewing the same piece of chicken. Apparently, he was ordered to keep an eye on the guy while he gained strength and rested. Chu himself was very surprised by this, because he thought he was already facing death. But immediately, the guy was approached by an elder with a request that Chu satisfy his hunger, and also specifies that Jun San personally caught and fried food for them. Just then, the king of the water tamers tells Ku Dok that the bonfire is going out. And then he turns to Chu, telling the lad that they have some undercooked meat lying there. Then they will be the ones to roast a piece for each person. The old man tells Chu again that the lad's stomach must be empty, so he should eat some meat and drink something. Chu immediately started looking around for his buddies. He started asking the others where Song and that bastard Kadushin were. The guy dared to assume that they had done something bad to the other guys. He was simply furious at even the very thought of what had happened. The guy's eyes glowed red, and the very aura around him became tense. But immediately, the King of Tamer Waters replies to the guy not to worry about his comrades because he spared them and handed them over to the Chanmu Alliance. Chu questions the leader about whether he really decided to spare them, to which he received an affirmative answer, and also that the Namgung family's child was a little hurt, but he would be much better once he woke up. To this Chu decided not to answer, and only looked at his interlocutor with excitement in his eyes. Here the elder tells the lousy man not to worry about his nephew, and that although he and Changson are deeply bound by evil doom, he will not trample their sprout into the ground for that reason alone. At these words, Chu only exhaled with relief, getting some sort of relief from the fact that his nephew was still alive. But immediately his stomach rumbled loudly, and the guy covered his stomach with his hand. At this, the old man told Chu that he knew he would be hungry. And just when Chu decided to suggest that the food from this old man might be poisoned, the leader told him, as if reading his mind, that the more the fellow thought, the more he poisoned himself. Chu took a bite of the meat and said it was delicious. But still, he was a little worried that there might be something wrong with the food. The old man enjoyed watching Chu devour the piece of meat and told him to eat more. And then... One hears someone's voice saying that there was only one last needle left to be injected into the body. The healer tiredly rubbed his forehead to wipe away the drops of sweat from the hard work he had done. He exhaled tiredly and said it was done. Here, the old man speaks of the fact that the king of the water tamers had, for some reason or other, suddenly shown mercy to his rival. K.I. Dushin himself was surprised because beating a man half to death was an act of mercy for the king of the water tamers. The old man immediately continued, saying that how could the clan... Head's apprentice be so stupid. The old man said that if it wasn't for the water tamer king, he would have fallen into madness soon and would have become an invalid by now. He also didn't know what the water tamer king thought of this child, but he not only forcibly subdued the demonic key, but also severed the circulation as a whole. So why the king needed to do this, only he knew. The old man tells K. Duchin to look after the boy and he still has to go send a letter to the Namgung family. 
He also says to temper the Sword King's anger before he goes into a frenzy as soon as he hears the news. K. Dushin recalls what happened in that only brief moment. When Song was attacking with all his fury at the King of the Tamer Waters, the man was able to interrupt his strike by kicking the floor of the ship with his foot. Immediately, Song began to stare wildly at the Water Tamer King. His eyes were full of rage and anger that possessed him at that moment. The Elder himself, with a menacing look, told the people of the Chonmu Alliance to get out of here as quickly as possible. The people stood aghast and watched the terrifying fight of two strong rivals. But immediately after the old man's words, they began to retreat. The tamer king of the waters himself and his servant jumped off the ship. The man's servant continued to hold Chu on his shoulder. They jumped onto some small-sized raft and sailed in their own direction. K. Dushin himself quickly rushed to Sun, who tiredly collapsed to the floor, dropping his sharp sword from his hand. K. E. Dushin could barely remember what had happened, and he also wondered why the king of the water tamers needed young Mr. Yu. At the same time, Chu was sitting with the water tamer king, Jun San and Ku Dok around the fire, and they were still roasting meat for a hearty meal together. The guy is suddenly handed another piece of meat, ostensibly asking him if he's hungry. To this, the boy only looks questioningly. Jun San, with a nice and friendly smile, held out another piece of meat he roasted to Chu. The guy himself was surprised, because when he fought with him, he pounced on him like a wild tiger. Chu turned his head to the side to reassess the situation around him. Chu thought to himself, look at this, it looks just like a regular local old man. The guy didn't understand how a person could change so much. He also speculated that maybe this old man had a split personality. So the water tamer king offers Chu to have a drink with him. The water tamer king asks Chu how old the guy is while pouring alcohol into a pitcher. Chu drank some alcohol while gathering his thoughts to answer the elder. Chu drank his fill and replied to the water tamer king that he was currently 17 years old. To this, the old man said that the lad was not even 20 and that he already possessed such powers. The lad was asked if he had any teacher who taught him such techniques. Chu himself wondered why the old man was asking him all these things, if he was just curious. At this time, somewhere, Teacher Chu's ears itched. The elder, however, again asked Chu to split up already and tell him who was teaching him. Chu still answers to the King of Tamers of Waters that he was trained by his son-in-law and that he is from the family Tam from Hubei. The Tam family itself is a family that belongs to military circles instead of the Murim, and they were focused on the practical martial arts of warfare. Chu realized that his main concern was not to go into all the details. The elder had told him that even if this area of the martial clans, did the fellow thought of being unfamiliar with the Tam family's martial arts. The Water Tamer King tells the guy that the Tam family's martial arts are bold and powerful, not at all as soft and flexible as Chu's. In addition, the palm technique that Chu Jun-san attacked with was very different from ordinary internal Qigong. Internal Qigong is a technique that accumulates qi inside the body. The elder tells the guy that there's something much more fundamental here. With those words, Chu is starting to get a little worried already. Chu was surprised that even the Sword King didn't realize this. The elder, on the other hand, noticed that for a youngster, his gaze is already very speaking for himself. The boy looks at the water tamer king again and asks him if he is interested in anything else. The elder answers Chu in the affirmative, saying that of course he is interested because this is the first time he has seen such a thing to have energy applied in this way. The old man continues, saying that since Chu says he learned from his son-in-law, that means the fellow has no teacher in Murim. To this Chu replies in the affirmative and at that moment thinks that he cannot tell the names of the six saints. The king of water tamers only sighs, and a satisfied smirk appears on his face. He says that since he has no teacher at the moment, then why doesn't the boy become his apprentice? At these words, Chu's eyes widen in surprise and wonders what kind of nonsense this old man is talking about. The water tamer king asks the guy if Chu himself didn't just say that about paying for all the trouble he caused. The elder says the guy will become his apprentice and he'll pretend nothing ever happened. In his head, Chu was panicking. After all, he is destined to become a hero who will save Murim in the future. What kind of student of a cursed pirate is he? And also, most importantly, his father is a respected figure in the government. The old man told him that since he was now his apprentice, 
he would forgive the old-fashioned three and ten bows and would rather have another cup of alcohol with him instead. At this, Chu began to backpedal, asking his grandfather what kind of disciple he was to him and who had time to make such a decision. The water tamer king said with a threatening look that he was the one who made that decision and said his hand was already sore from holding the cup. The elder started the countdown. Chu immediately started talking about how, as the boy had said earlier, his father was a deeply respected man, and that he was also a prince, and was still the teacher of his highness the heir, so he didn't understand why he would become a pirate. But the elder didn't care about that at all, and he asked the guy that if his father was already an official, then one couldn't become a pirate anymore. Immediately Chu cried out to the old man that let him make him a pirate, and his father would be greatly disappointed about his son, and asks if it is possible to be a more wicked son. On this account the king of the Tamer waters reflected. But suddenly the elder showed the lad his fist with a menacing and threatening look, and threatened him that he should beat him. At these words, Chu only fell backwards in surprise, because such aggression from the king of the tamers of the waters he certainly could not expect. Then the leader tells the guy that he also heard from Kudok that he swims perfectly, so with such a talent for swimming should be born, so that the fate itself prophesied Chu to become a pirate. To all this, the boy could not even answer a word. He was dumbfounded, for he could not object to anything. Moreover, to stand up to Jun San at such a young age, such a talent, according to the old man, is born once in a thousand years. Also, the water timer king said that did Chu really think that he would be able to let go of such a nugget so easily when it was right in front of him? Chu realized that it would be impossible for him to turn away from this old man so easily. The elder began to roll up his sleeves and told the guy that he could see a lot of doubt in his new apprentice's eyes. But the king of water tamers again raised his foot to strike and said that there was nothing to be done and that he would have to reduce the guy's time to think. Just then, it was as if Chu had a sense of deja vu, for he definitely remembered that he had seen this somewhere before. Immediately, Chu's screams began to echo throughout the forest as he cried out in pain. By that time, the fire had already gone out, on which Jun San was roasting pieces of meat for the others. Chu sat on his knees in front of the water tamer king, badly exhausted and beaten. The king was already finishing the last drops of alcohol from his jug. The elder asked the boy if he had already decided whether he would be his apprentice. To this, Chu asked the old man to give him some more time to decide on his answer. But just as the old man was about to get up and start beating the guy again, he immediately agreed to the leader's proposal. The water tamer king reprimanded himself, saying that he should have done that right away and agreed to the old man's proposal. But in his thoughts, Chu had sent his grandfather to hell because he would become his apprentice. But in truth, he had absolutely no time for that. But immediately, Chu put his condition to the king, saying, let the whole matter be temporary. At this, the elder repeated the lad's words with surprise. The lad understood that it was necessary to find Huang Doksam as early as possible and get to the Chanmu alliance. Chu realized that he still couldn't get the information he needed from Hua Doksam about the second treasure, so he needed to get close to him by any means necessary and find out the location of the treasure before the cursed servant did. The water tamer king thought about the kid's said words about it being temporary. Chu realized that for the sake of it, he should be in the Chanmu alliance as soon as possible. And so, Chu realizes that he needs to try a little pressure in order to defend his point of view. And suddenly, the old man agrees to this condition. Chu tells the elder that if the whole truth about Chu becoming the apprentice of the Water Tamer King comes out, he'll be wolfed down. As the guy noted in his mind, especially the Chanmu alliance would do that. Chu also tells him that he will then turn into a frog, who will only have to look at the Yangtze River. So Chu asks the old man to open the way before him. The king of the water tamers heard the words of a fellow who was telling him to gain experience, so that, in the future, he could expand the Yangtze pirates to such a scale that they would sweep the entire celestial empire under their feet. The leader was surprised that even he, who was the strongest leader of the entire group in history, couldn't encompass the entire celestial empire. But if the guy succeeded, Chu notices that the water tamer king is still buying his tricks. And so, the elder tells the guy that since he got such an apprentice, he will have to be a little patient, 
but notes that if he has just deceived him, he will not be afraid to gray off the face of the earth everything that has anything to do with the guy. To this, Chu grimly agreed, thus confirming that everything he had said earlier was true. The king of the water tamers immediately ordered Jun San to pass on the old man's order to all the pirates of the Yangtze right away. Namely that from this moment, Yu Hyun is the young master of their Yangtze, but not a word about him shall leak out. But here the king of the tamers of the waters said that if anyone should learn of it, he swore by his honorable name that he would certainly punish the culprit at that very moment. After a while, Chu was already sitting in the boat and rattling the oars on the water waves, gently breaking them. Chu thought about the fact that he obeyed the old man, not at all because he had been beaten a good beating before. And everything that is happening now is also a carefully thought out strategy by the guy. Later, Chu realized that he would still devour the hordes of Yangtze pirates who would fall into the servants' hands. And also, once Chu had consumed all the spiritual treasures and spiritual herbs, then the guy would be able to swat that miserable old man with his one left. At that time, the water tamer king was sitting quietly on a rock around a pile of long green grass. He was sipping sake and holding his leg with his other hand. The atmosphere was relaxed. But behold, father shouted to the elder that he was a water son of a bitch. The old man only opened his eyes tiredly and looked at the man, who looked very angry. The old man asked if the man was Shansong, to which he immediately shouted that yes, he was, and then again called the king a cursed, watery bastard. Zhang Ziyong shouted that he had earlier warned the king of the water tamers not to touch his children. To this, the old man only asked him why he was such a dunce. The water tamer king told Zhang Ziyan that the man had misunderstood and that he had found out later that his grandson had been on the ship just like him. To this, Zhang Ziyan says that he found out about Sonya on the way here. The man says that he heard the information that he had cleared his circulation. Just then, the old man replies back to him, which means the man was already aware of it. The water tamer king suddenly became inflamed with anger and began to shout at Chonson like a fire that was bursting out of control. His voice rang across the battlefield like a thunderclap. Because then why the hell is he shaving at him after all? The old man saved him from his own madness, so Chonson should be very grateful to him. At these words, Zhang Seong decided not to remain silent. He was undoubtedly excited that his dear friend Yu Yun might be in danger. Zhang Seong wailed so loudly that his voice pierced the air and carried through the battlefields like fatal thunder, and shouted that if a single hair fell from his head, he would turn his Yangtze into a bloody sea. His threat sounded terrifying and unrelenting. Zhang Xiong was ready to make any sacrifice to save his kinsmen and win this battle. But the water tamer king looked at Zhang Xian and asked if Chu was his disciple, to which he received a reply about what kind of nonsense this old man was talking about. But in the next instant, the water tamer king switched, as if jumping to another topic. He said that it might be possible to call him an apprentice, too. But the elder did not believe his words at all, and realized that it was not Zhang Seong who was his teacher. The old man thought, what a misfortune, now Chu is his disciple. He told Chanson that if he couldn't bring him back, then what was the man going to do? Chongson immediately shrieked, and calling the water tamer king a son of a bitch, quickly grabbed the handle of his sharp sword. Zhang Xiang was so fast and agile that his every movement seemed like some kind of graceful dance. With that incredible grace, he lunged at the elder with his sword. The man shouted that the waterman would be damned. The leader himself managed to dodge the blow that could have been his last moment. His reflexes were as sharp as a razor, and he reacted to danger instantly. At that moment, everyone around him froze, as if time had slowed down. The water tamer king was furious at such rudeness and insolence. He shouted loudly and angrily to Chongson that he was a bloody swordsman. The old man barely dodged the man's blow. The elder ran towards the water and jumped onto a piece of wooden board, which was just right for him. The old man shouted to the man that he had almost sent him to the other side of the world. The water tamer king also wailed that Chongson was really going to take his life just now. The blood inside the old man was boiling with anger, and his eyes glowed with blue flames. He was infuriated by this fact, 
Chong Siong immediately answered him, saying that the elder really thought that the man had come here to joke around with him. In reality, it was as serious as possible. The man immediately shouted in a commanding tone that the waterman should get out of his water, for he would chop his hair with his own hands. The king of the water tamers only looked at his opponent, gathering his strength and thoughts, because he did not want to lose in any case. The old man thereupon shouted to Jung Seon to attack him, so they would see who would win their duel. Jung Sang was watching the scene from afar and had already caught another big boar to roast and eat later. The old men themselves were shouting for their opponent to attack first, if he did not get cold feet. Jun San only sighed tiredly, because it seemed to be the first time he had seen similar fights, and these childish games were getting to him. That was why the man decided to go on with his business. The water timer king exhaled, thinking about what they were doing, because only children do such things. They are adults, so this is how they should solve their problems. The old man told Zhang Xian to stop, and that the boy had long since sailed away, so he must be in Wuhan by now. At this, Zhang Sheng was surprised to ask if he was telling the truth. The king of the water tamers jumped out of the water with a quick and nimble movement, leaping right next to Zhang Xiong. The elder immediately backs up his words, while calling Chu a lousy man. Zhang Xian himself thinks that although the old man is a criminal, but he would not lie so meanly. Zheng Xian hit his sword in its scabbard immediately after his words, showing the old man that he is now in a peaceful mood and will not attack him. It was only now that Zheng Xiong decided to thank the Water Tomer King for saving his nephew. The elder himself was offended that the man decided to thank him only now, after nearly killing him. And so the leader raises his hand in the air. From somewhere, all of a sudden, his shot glass and teapot of alcohol that he drank earlier with Chu suddenly arrives. Immediately, the water tamer king offers Zhang Xian to have at least a cup with him before he leaves in order to ease his soul. Zhang Xiang himself agrees, while he thinks about the fact that the main thing is that Hyung is fine, and right now he should already be arriving at Jun Mu's alliance. But lo and behold, two sharp blades of pirate swords are driven around Chu's neck. The guy himself was in shock and didn't realize what was happening. He was now and then surrounded by a huge number of ships filled with enemy pirates. Chu began to say that his name was Yu Hyun, and that there was a clear misunderstanding between them. Just then, one of the pirates tells Chu that the alliance will decide between themselves whether it was a simple misunderstanding or not, and Chu himself should let the pirates meekly let himself be tied up. Chu himself thinks he was going to the John Mu Alliance for the reason of meeting Huang Doksum anyway, so he'd better not make too much of a fuss for now. And so the wagon with the boy is brought into town. Chu is wondering and wondering what's next on their course. In front of them was built a beautiful and large city. There was also a small pond near some of the houses. The horse-drawn wagon continued to move along the empty street between the residential buildings. Chu himself felt the impression that it was as if he was in a forest made of pavilions. Chu continued to look at everything around him with incredible delight. He did not tire of exploring this marvelous place. The tall houses standing in the city seemed to him like heavenly towers meant to touch the clouds. Their architecture was wonderfully varied, and each house had its own unique story to tell. The cool ponds, decorated with lilies and lily pads, added charm to the whole picture. The water in them glistened like a magical mirror, reflecting the sky and the surrounding nature. Chu felt himself merging with this harmony of nature and the city. The boy standing next to him had heard that this warrior had single-handedly defeated all the mountain bandits and had been able to resist the Yangtze pirates. But now the man noted to himself that now this warrior looks like a simple boy, just like his age. At the same time, Chu himself was wondering in his head about how much people respect the head of Chan Mu. Chu thought, what if he became a hero who stopped the chaos? Could it be that in honor of this event, he would then be appointed as the new head of the Union? Immediately in the mind of the guy, began to draw a picture of where Chu was made head, and all the people around him begin to greet him and say that he is a hero of Murim and that he is also the strongest in the history of the head of the Union Chanmu. Chu thought that he is no more than a personal property in the Yu family, and by profession the head of the Chanmu Union respected in all of Murim. But is there any plan for old age that will be as perfect as this one? 
But to make it come true, Chu first had to take care of Huang Doxum, and so he has to find him. It is in this huge building, which seemed to represent wisdom and grandeur, that the great counselor diligently and faithfully performs his difficult work in the service of the Chon Mu Union. This place has become a kind of shrine for him, where every step, every decision, and every word carries importance and responsibility. The building is filled with silence and an atmosphere of concentration as he makes important decisions and warns the Union against possible dangers. And so this man and Chu, with hearts full of determination and hope, cautiously open the door and step into the room where the head of the Chan Mu Union is. At this moment, their footsteps seem like some solemn march, and their gazes are filled with expectation and excitement. And then, his eyes immediately go wide, and a drop of sweat runs like a river down his face. At that moment, he realized that he was in front of something that made his heart beat faster and the blood pound louder in his veins. And a drop of sweat ran down his face like a river, leaving a trail of moisture on his skin. The man immediately bowed as soon as he crossed the threshold of the room and shouted that he had the honor, saying that the deputy head of the Green Dragon Unit, Pach Sonchan, was greeting the head of the Chonmu Union. Chu himself continued to just stand by in bewilderment. It turns out that the man in green appeared to be the deputy head of the Chonmu Union head himself. The man was standing with his back to all the people in the room, looking somewhere out the window. So, the head of the Jeonmu Union tells Chu to come inside sooner, to which the guy calmly obeys and enters the room. The man continues, asking the guy if his name is Yu Hyun, asking if he's mistaken. The man himself was named Lee Haxon. He was by status the head of the Chunmu Union White Warrior. Lee Haxon's speech sounds soft and calm, but why is there so much weight in it? It's not a lust for killing. It's just the superiority of the strongest that makes people pale with terror at a glance. The teachers told Chu that if Lee Haxon had survived and led the fight, they might have been able to stop the Servant of Chaos. Chu approached Lee Haxon, saying that this was their first meeting, and it appears that his name is Yu Hyun. Lee Haxon noticed that Yu Hyun was barely 17 years old, but the guy's energy had already, at the very least, risen to the level of dissecting Qi. Lee Haxon had told Chu about him having a dragon's gaze completely, and also the head of the Chanmu Union had heard that the guy had met one-on-one -on -one with the Water Tamer King. So did that mean the information was true? Chu thought about the fact that one of them was his own teacher's teacher, Chegel Subum, and the other was the head of the Chonpu Union, the one that even my teachers bowed down to, Lee Haxon. Chu is just now starting to feel like he's like he's entered the lair of the tiger himself, so the guy just absolutely has to get his thoughts together. And so the man in green approaches Chu, asking him if he's the one responsible for the mess on the Yangtze River. Chu tells them that they already know all about the fact that he comes from the Yu family and that his father is an advisor to the emperor. Could Chu pretend that he doesn't notice how the people around him are suffering from pirate lawlessness? And the man replies to the guy about how that's exactly why Chu joined the fight in the name of justice. The man tells Chu that this is acceptable, but then who was that middle-aged man with him? To this, Chu asks who exactly they mean by middle-aged man. To this, the man replies that it is rather odd, because according to the passengers, Chu unexpectedly intervened in his fight with the pirates. Chu hesitated for a moment. The middle-aged man, Huang Daksam. Chu was sure they had already questioned him, but he hadn't said he'd asked him about the thousand-year-old shell. Then Chu would just have to come up with a convincing reason as to why the man had interfered in his fight with the pirates. Chu immediately took a swing at the girl who was standing next to him, pouring tea into a cup. This action was immediately noticed by Lee Haxon, though it was deft, precise, and quick, even almost elusive to the ordinary eye. Lee Haxon was immediately able to grab Chu and prevent the attack on the girl. The man immediately cried out for what it meant. To these words, Chu said that this action was his response. Lee Haxon, also like Chu then, had simply intervened in his fight. This was how it was possible to show as accurately, even vividly as possible, what then happened. Lee Haxon smirks rather smugly and says that he believes Chu's words, that the guy rushed in without even thinking for the sake of saving the civilians on the ship. 
The man lets go of the guy's hand and says that victory is his after all. At those words, Chu smiled slyly and contentedly. He wasn't even surprised that he was able to defeat the head and the others, because his proof was undeniable on all sides. Lee Haxon said that they would assume that the guy was just overwhelmed by a huge sense of justice at that moment. And so Chu asked what had become of the very man they were talking about. The man in green said that the guy had previously claimed that he had nothing to do with the man. But why was the first thing he was wondering about was his well-being? Because from what the man had heard, Chu had used violence. Abruptly, with a loud bang, the guy hits the table with his fist and yells that it's because he was really angry then, because he almost put the innocent people around him in great danger. Chu wondered if they would even fall for that, because part of what he said was true. The man immediately answered him that he was in a detention center because they locked him up to question him later about the cause of the incident. A man approaches Chu and asks him if he wants to meet him, and that the guy is very surprised because he had planned to question him well. The guy is surprised because they offer to interrogate him, and apparently it's some kind of bait because they offered to make it so easy for him. The man asks him if the guy really doesn't want to. Chu wonders if they're up to follow up on their interrogation and find out what the guy's intentions were in saving Huang Doxum. Chu thinks, okay, he'll take the bait after all, but only because he needs to find out where the thousand-year-old shell is. The guy replies to the man that how come he doesn't want to, on the contrary, he was just about to ask them for that favor. This same Huang Doxam has put so many people in danger for his own well-being. But still, Chu is determined to have it his way. The man tells the boy that he will notify the guard in advance, so Chu can come any time. The man himself thought about how long Chu could keep that sly expression on his face. Chu thanked the man for that. And lastly, Chu was asked why the water tamer king had spared the guy. This question made Chu a bit confused. The guy had been waiting for a long time for them to ask him about this question. Chu replied to the man that he had made a deal with him that he would pay for all his damages. Namely, the guy would pay for the sunken ships and injured pirates. And so, the deputy head of the Chanmu Union and Lee Haxon began to look at Chu incredulously. The head of the Chanmu Union asked the guy if the guy really thought they were all jerks and said that the water tamer king should have killed him but for some reason, spared him. But to these words, Chu only replied that then let them ask the king tamer of waters himself personally, because Chu told him that he would repay everything, and for this reason, he was released. Lee Huxon was just furious at the way Chu blatantly lied to their faces and did not even blush. The vein on his neck swelled up, and in his thoughts he was already cursing that cunning boy. Chu just realized that if he was caught in his lie, his hyper-caring daddy, named Yu Xiong Wan, would just make a huge fuss. Chu asked the man if such a response would come from him. The guy replied that yes, at first all of his answers would count. Chu himself thanked them and said that he needed to deflect. And now, the deputy head of Chan Mu asks Li Haxin how long they will have to believe in all these lies of this boy, to which he gets the witty reply that the man doesn't know, and that they will believe him as long as he breathes. The head of the Chan Mu family remarks that this was an amazing boy, and that he almost didn't feel his inner strength. And the deputy only shakes his head affirmatively at that and says that he was able to notice it as well. The head immediately looked out the window from the large building. The head says that this child's dantian is completely empty. At the EO, the deputy asks the head if the man wants to tell him that Chu isn't hiding his nigong, and it's simply not there but immediately the head responds by refuting what the deputy said, because the moment he stopped the guy's provocation, he was able to feel a little kickback. So it is obvious that he is using another place instead of Dantian for spiritual practice. The head of the Chanmu family reflected that the Sword King and the Water Tamer King would not show interest in such a child without a good reason. And then he asks his deputy, why don't they just keep this kid around? Because even though it's just his opinion, he feels like this kid would definitely help the deputy in that very case. At those words, the deputy head of the Chan Mu family began to open some sort of scroll in a red pouch. They had planned to gather hidden dragons from all over the world and also combine them into one battle group. 
but so far, the results look very discouraging. Those who can be called hidden dragons are usually dragons, usually also the heirs of their families or their driving fighting force, so they are not easily recruited under them. A hidden dragon is a human who has not yet been able to manifest his genius. Just then, the head of the Chanmu family replies to substitute that from what the healer says, Nam Gung Sung may soon break through to the next level. The substitute replies to him that yes, he had heard, and that he could have been helped by the Water Tomer King. But all of a sudden, the head tells the substitute that what if we consider it as Yu Hyun's merit? The chapter tells us that the young warrior who single-handedly confronted the pirates of the Black Whale to save the people survived even after a clash with the tamer king of the waters. He is also from a distinguished family, handsome, and also has everything on him. And there's also another rumor to add here. Nam Gung Siang had risen to the level of Radiant Chi because Yu Hyun had been there all this time. The deputy was amazed at what the head had just said because all these things made sense. They were all connected by Yu Hyun. The deputy laughed and said that the head didn't need to put his finger in his mouth. The head at these words only said that he was merely giving some food for thought and that the details of the plan lay entirely with the deputy head of the John Mu family. By this point, Chu has already managed to get to Nam Gung Sun's room to check on how he's feeling. He tisks a couple times and tells the guy that he doesn't look too good. Sleep immediately shouted happily only as soon as he could his uncle's name. The same stood beside the bed. Nam Gung Seong at the same time was completely wrapped in bandages all over his body. And then Kei Dushin enters the room with a message, namely a scroll in a red pouch. He tells Sun about whether he too is here to join the hidden dragon squad. And then Ki Souls tags young master Yu Hyun and tells him that he's here too and that he clearly didn't expect to see the guy here. Chu rolled his eyes tiredly to the side and he thought about how it was now Kei Dushin's turn to run his subordinate. Chu wondered what to do because he couldn't just beat him up like that. And besides, he wasn't the only one with a problem, but the other teachers too. Kei Dushin came up to the guy and told him that he knew that the guy was also interested in the Hidden Dragon Squad. Kei Dushin tells Sun about looking to see that his lousy friend Sa Dok is there, and that Murin too is there as well. At this point, Chu notices something, and it was very helpful to him. Chu immediately snatched the scroll, and Kei Dushin himself shouted that the young lord was not allowed to see this document because the squad only included young warriors who belonged to the righteous clans of Murim. But Chu didn't care about that at that moment. Because as soon as he saw that document, he realized that all of his damn teachers were in there. It was exactly what the guy needed at that moment. Suddenly, some man cried out, bailing out because a purple snake had bitten him on the arm. That man was Am Chong Su, who was in the Tang family. Also next was Un Hyun, who was an immortal sword of the Wudang clan. He was called Wudan because he could safely hold a plate of Wudan on just the blade of his sword. Then following him was Wan Gang, who was a Shaolin monk. He sat under a waterfall and talked about how today he was especially overcome by mental anguish. Next was Chegel Murin, who was a divine strategist that Kei Dushin knew. The man spoke of the stars being too disorderly today. It was not a good energy for them. Chu thought about how under the pretense of a hidden dragon squad, he would sweep up all of his damned teachers who bullied him. Chu was already by then imagining that he would soon meet them, and so his heart was thundering in his chest. Kei Dushin himself didn't understand, because it seemed to be summer outside. But then why was he feeling chilly? Nam Gung Song felt the same way. Chu immediately replied to have him and Nam Gung Song enlisted into the Hidden Dragon Squad. His gaze was confident and determined.